Hello everyone, Crydax here, and welcome to our review of all 60 Factorio Friday Facts. We are going to be going through number 373 all the way up through, uh, I forgot what it was, 432 I think adds up to 60. Um, and that is including everything up to today, which is October 12th. So there will be one more FFF prior to the actual release release of Space Age that will not be included in this video because it doesn't exist yet. But other than that, we're going to dive right in. I am going to fly through some of these because I don't want this to be a six hour video slash stream. It might end up being that long. I guess we'll see because we're going to get through it one way or another. <laughs> uh, my, my calendar's clear. So if it takes six hours, it takes six hours. But I'd, I'd like to keep it under four or even three is kind of my, my loose goal. But that means an average of three minutes per FFF. So that doesn't give me much time on the bigger, more interesting ones. So that means the more boring-ish ones, I might just fly through and skip a lot of the content. But we're going to start with the meat of it all, which is the original announcement. So this was, I'll probably not read the dates on most of them, but the original announcement of the DLC and with its name and everything, because they originally announced they were working on an expansion like a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. I mean, they mentioned... I think they even mentioned uh, they did expansion news back in 22. Um, they talked about future plans back in. Uh, I forget which one's the month whenever. It ha OK, the month is in the middle on this one. OK, so this is saying February. Um, so here's where they kind of mentioned they were working on an expansion pack. That was back in 21. But. Uh, yeah. So anyway, in 23 and uh, whatever month eight is that August, I, I never am good with turning the numbers into actual months. I'm good with most of them, but for some reason, the, the eight, nine throws me off. Everything else, I think I, I know, like six is June or May is five. But for whatever reason, eight and nine, I get those mixed up. OK, Factorio Space Age. Without any further ado, so they give us this awesome shot of the platform. They mention it continues the player's journey after rocking launch. Rocking launch it? Yeah, yeah, we're going to, we're going <laughs> to, uh, this is going to be a long stream, isn't it? We're going to launch some rockets into space. <laughs> rocking launch it. That's, that's a new one. Wow. So anyway. I remember when they announced this, I was so hyped. It just looking at this part right here, seeing like these planets in the tech tree made me so freaking excited. And you can also see how the icons have grown over the years. Um, I can't easily pull up the, the new ones uh, right next to this, but like, you know, compared to the Aqualo icon that they just showed us, like they really worked on the, the planet icons. What's up, B Jonas? How goes it? How goes it? Yeah, the the old name of Buhuo for for Gleba. Um that was when people we'll get to that, but they de uh pixelized some some of the old names. But basically here they just talk about it's coming, it's going to take a while. We will be publishing Friday facts every week. So that was the beginning of their Friday facts stuff. They kind of talk about what Space Age is aimed towards, or who Space Age is aimed towards, you know, target audience is targeted at a small set of challenge seekers. It's not for everyone by design. Um, oh, okay, that didn't make any sense. Talking about space exploration versus Space Age, because because Arendelle obviously made space exploration as a huge mod, and you know, Space Age kind of to a lot of people was like, that's kind of just copying space exploration. How are these actually different? So I, I was really happy to see that they had Arendelle write a section here to like address that concern that players were going to have. Also, I need to move the chat. I'm sorry. You guys can't see chat on chat. I don't really know where to put it. Um, the bottom might be a little better, but even then it's just going to be text on text. So Maybe, okay, here's what I'll do. I'll change chat to be black for now, but then I'm gonna, of course, forget about it by the next stream, probably. Um, of course, you can't do a dark background on Google Sheets because F you, says Google. Um, so 
Twitch chat, text style, text color, black. Let's test that. Okay, that actually shows up. And then I need to do the same for YouTube chat, text style, text color, black. And then I need to move the YouTube chat box over here. And it's going to overlap a bit. But that's fine. Uh, this isn't Google Sheets, Dave. Otherwise, that would work. OK. And then I guess I'll just have this scrolled down most of the time so we can see stuff. OK, that's a little better. Now people can actually see the, the chat. Because, I mean, there's going to be words on the left side of the screen pretty much the whole stream. I guess I could have done three. Se I don't know. It's hard to figure out what to put where. Anyway, um, they talked about space age challenges are more streamlined and self-contained for a faster pace of 60 to 100 hours. So that was their estimate from the beginning. And I actually feel like they've kept with that pretty well. Um, so lots of exciting stuff in the original announcement, but nothing too concrete. So let's get into the concrete stuff that we're actually going to start seeing in the game in two days. Um, Smarter robots. So flying robot behavior improvements was their first kind of quality of life content drop. And I also like that they had a focus on quality of life from the beginning. I've never seen a DLC, y'all, that has completely. Wait, why didn't YouTube chat show up? Hold on. YouTube chat is broken. Oh, boy. Oh, nope, there it is. Sorry, Aylor. It's just slow. OK, there it is. Um, anyway, um, OK, where where was I at? I was saying I have not seen a game that has put this much effort into DLC quality of life improvements. I, I've never seen it. I mean, I've seen a lot of small quality of life improvements. But this uh, this expansion has dwarfed any other game I've seen by at least triple in terms of like not only are they just doing little quality of life stuff, almost stuff that could be added by a mod, but they're actually, you know, rewriting the core engine to be higher quality. And so it's just it's nuts. Um, it's nuts. I love it. I love it. We're going to see so much of the QOL stuff as we go through this today. So the first one they talked about was smarter robot tasks. And this is a big one. I mean, I, as I was playing the death world recently, I was getting frustrated already at like my bots, you know, were, were only doing a few tasks because maybe I only had 30 bots or enough control uh, personal robo ports for 30 bots. And then they would go do 30 things in a, if I paste it down a blueprint next to me, but then the rest of the tasks get assigned to the bases construction bots, even though my bots are right here and they could finish it in two seconds after they did their first thing, they just have to sit there and wait while bots fly from like 13 miles across town. And I hated that. So it's going to be so nice because what they did here is they basically gave robots a cue and uh, let's see, where did they kind of say it? The new way. So. Basically, robots can have multiple tasks assigned and it kind of tracks their arrival time. And it's basically just doing the math <clears throat> on like their arrival or their speed versus distance and then figuring out how long that's going to take. What I don't know is if it if it factors in charging time. Oh, we simplify the effects of the recharging time. So they do put in some sort of recharging factor to the time delay. Um, so that's nice to know. So if it's far enough that it would be like three robot uh, rechargings away, it's not going to just ignore all of that recharge time. But it does sound like it simplifies it. It probably just adds like a flat multiplier or something. Um, yeah, Alor, I, I loved nanobots for that reason, too, because they would just keep doing their thing and actually take the job of a current bot that was flying to build something. And then it would strand that bot with that item, which was an annoyance. But I still preferred that because at the end of the day, it didn't matter too much. So things like this, deconstructing a bunch of trees will be really nice because like your bots are working in tandem with the bases bots to get it all done as fast as possible. Um, super nice. Uh, performance here, it says, can become a UPS drain when there's a lot of bots busy. Um, 
Storing busy robots on chunks and searching in a spiral improved performance. Roboport requests got smarter. I'm still not exactly like I've never been in a situation where I've had to pay super close attention to the I don't know what you call this, just the robot behavior. So basically all of this is like good changes that some players will actively note. But the biggest one you're going to feel is just the fight between your personal robots and the bases robots. I think that's the biggest place where you're going to feel the change. The other places where the change will affect things are probably going to be less like, oh my God, that's so much better. And it'll more just make everything more efficient. It'll it'll save you energy like in your base. It'll be less charging bots, um, stuff like that. So here you can see bots working together to do stuff better. Um, you can use the robo port request to remove certain robots from the network. So you can you can uh, basically do a bot recall. So here we go. QOL mod graveyard number one bot recall. Um, that's that's already here because we're not going to need um i'm going to have to put this somewhere else now this is this is going to be tricky with chat maybe maybe i put it over my face hold on maybe sorry i'm i'm uh we're evolving as we go here i'm thinking maybe maybe chat goes back to being white and we just have it go over the void here and then I put, because this is going to fill up pretty fast, uh, this list of stuff. And so I don't, I don't think chat's going to look very good over the top of that either. So yeah, the robo ports being able to request robots is really cool. Um, so now I have to change text back to white for YouTube chat and for Twitch chat. Okay. And then I also need to trim this thing to there. OK, so now chat has a little home. And I think I'll just pull this up over, over the top of uh, whatever we're looking at. And we'll make it a little bigger that way. Okay, sorry. Uh, back to actually answering chat. Some people ask me questions. Uh, Logan, how long does it take to get to new Space Age content? Do you have to completely beat the game by launching a rocket to get to the new content? Yes-ish. From what I know, we actually can establish space stuff in the chemical science world as soon as the chemical science world. I don't think we have to go as far as like what it took to beat the game in vanilla. On top of that, rockets themselves are cheaper because we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit, but they don't require um, the super advanced uh, circuit stuff or the blue chip stuff. So, so there's a couple things there. Uh, okay, so I need to be able to hide this really easy because I'm going to be turning that on and off. So anyway, robots are smarter at charging. This is a big one too. Robots were really dumb at how they would charge before, and now they're gonna be much smarter at using multiple robo ports. This also works really well with mods, um, you know, because, oh, this is the old version. Oh, here I was like, ah, oh, that, that's so much smarter than it used to be. <laughs> but no, this is the smart version. They're actually using the final robo port here rather than ignoring it. Like in this old version, they were basically ignoring the sixth robo port, even though they were all waiting here. So that's so much smarter. <laughs> no, Logan, you didn't mess it up. I just didn't take enough time to uh, figure it out beforehand. Also, it's funny. Um, apparently, the emojis don't show up on the YouTube chat. Another reason to use Twitch there if you're if you're on the fence. Oh, and this one. Robot pathing over lakes. So this was an old problem when you had convex RoboPort networks. Um, I think I'm using the right word. I always get convex and concave mixed up despite my math background. Um, but now they're way smarter where like they'll charge at a RoboPort that's closer to where they need to go rather than just turning around. So anyway, great FFF. Robot improvements is a big deal. I have heard 
I have heard rumors that there could be some UPS issues with ultra dense bot networks now, partially because of that. So it'll be interesting to see if they need to do another optimization pass or not. Now, I know we said we're going to try to be like less than three minutes average per, but this one's going to be a big chat. So we're going to we're going to blow past our. Oh, let me get some music going too. Um, we're going to we're going to blow past our three minute average. That's for sure because quality. Quality is such an interesting topic. So what is quality? Quality is everywhere. It's all around us. Even now in this very room, you can see it when you look out your window, when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a noob, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into normal quality, into a prison that you cannot taste or see or touch. Prison for your factory. You take the blue module, the story ends. You wake up in your factory and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the white module, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. So yeah, quality is base. Can you spoil to it? No, no, you can't. This is this is not a. Are you are you from the beta? Is that is that what you're? uh getting at if it's if it's something that's in uh, sorry let me rephrase this is an fff spoiler friendly stream in that anything that has been spoiled in fffs is fair game to talk about because we're literally going to read through all of them in the stream but if if you're someone who's been able to play the beta and you have some additional thoughts i think we're gonna we're gonna not allow those um if that answers your question so so if it if it is a spoiler that you've heard from unofficial sources who people who have been digging in the locale files on the discord and stuff like that, we're going to avoid those things. Let's not talk about those spoilers. Uh, we don't want to spoil any of those things. If it hasn't been directly mentioned in an FFF officially, we're going to avoid those pieces of info um, just because that can get a little iffy. Some things I think got spoiled that weren't necessarily supposed to some things got ratted out anyway let's talk about quality so quality is arguably the biggest mechanic um in space age i don't know is that true maybe it's true it's close to true if it's not directly true they're adding a lot of mechanics but this one changes everything right literally every item with any are there exceptions i don't even know if there are exceptions Literally every item can can be of five qualities now. And the way that you get qualities is you use and again, I'm just I'm going to skim through a lot of these. So this isn't like I'm covering it for the first time. If you want to go back and read the whole thing, go do that. Um, but basically you get these quality modules and then you put them in buildings and then whenever they do a craft, they have a chance to upgrade to the next quality. And I think they have um, yeah, you can you can skip steps, but it's going to be 10 times lower. Is that only because it has a 1% chance or is it just 10 times lower by default? I would have assumed it would have squared the chance, but maybe it's not that bad. I don't know exactly how the math works, but basically you're mostly going to get one level of upgrade for quality, but if you have like all the maxed out legendary quality modules, you might get the upgrading from normal quality all the way up to rare more often. But anyway, as you're making stuff, you can see like these gears are getting upgraded to this uncommon quality, and then you can combine uncommon quality stuff together to make uncommon items. So if you wanted to make uncommon inserters, which will insert faster, then you can just use fully uncommon ingredients. The other way you could do it is you could make your inserter assembler have the quality modules in it, and then you can use whatever ingredients you want and you have a chance to upgrade to an uncommon inserter. And then there's the recyclers, which then you can shove everything back into a recycler and then recycle it down into its base components because you didn't get the quality of inserter that you wanted. Then you can, you know, just keep basically having a loop where you can only keep the, the qualities that you want. So now splitters will have a quality filter so you can filter all things of, you know, purple is epic quality. Um, 
So this is making epic quality circuits. Basically, this is a build that will build whatever quality, it, the best quality it can from those quality of ingredients. So you're not taking any gambles on what quality you're getting. There is a gamble, because they have these modules in here though, of upgrading it. But you will get at least the purple circuits here because it's only giving it purple ingredients. So it's pretty crazy. The reason there are the chests here is because there needs to be a buffer, right? You might get a lot more iron uncommon plates than copper uncommon wires, even though on average, the law of large numbers says it will equal out. It won't literally be equal. You might get 50 more plates than you need over a given period of half an hour. And technically, the numbers will never equal. So I know it sounds really weird, but like having two chests might not be enough. Now, someone could do the math, like what what would be the likelihood of filling up one chest before it starts to, to even out? And like, it's gotta be an absurd amount of time, but variance technically says like, these chests could fill up, uh, but they're not going to like realistically. So anyway, uh, biggest change to vanilla. You guys are saying the planet stuff might be bigger. Yeah, you're, I think, I think you're probably right, Alor, um, in the sense that if you combine all the planets together, there's more content there, but the, but it actually isn't too much new mechanics on the planets. Like it's not changing, it's still the fundamental, like you land on the planet, you build factory stuff, you collect resources, You it almost feels like modded Factorio, whereas quality to me almost feels like a new angle of the game. Uh, whereas the, um, The, uh, sorry, I'm gonna resize chat here a little bit. The quality mechanic feels like a new angle to the factory game, whereas the planets feel like new content. And yeah, the space platforms also have new mechanics. That's a good point. If a recipe has multiple outputs, all recipes produced on a given tick have the same quality. So, okay. So anyway, strategic implications here. Let's let's talk about this real quick and then we're gonna move on from quality because we'll keep talking about quality. Um, basically, one interesting thing is they talk about it being a trap to try to get too high quality too early because the cost is actually really high and I love that. I love that like players are gonna be incentivized to actually have to like say no to their desires for a minute. And if they don't, they're gonna be bogged down in like spending 20 times more resources for hours. I just think it's such a cool mechanic because everybody's gonna want all their stuff to be really high quality, but like you just, you don't have enough resources to do that early on. And so it's gonna be a really fun dynamic to see like do people just derail themselves completely for hours and hours and hours to just get higher quality stuff to get to uncommon and rare even? Because at the beginning, your quality modules are only tier one, right? And so they're not gonna have a huge chance to upgrade stuff. Here's the, the list. So this is, this is tier three quality modules. Four of them still only give you a 10% chance to upgrade to uncommon. So, you know, your quality modules are gonna be low, low tier, and you you might not even have tier three assembly. I don't know, it's just really fun. It's really fun. Um, as far as we know, Vatamouse, there are no quality fluids. We've never seen them talk about it, or we've never seen them show up. So I don't think quality fluids are a thing. Um, so quality is just on the, on the items themselves. But, <laughs> Just say no to loot boxes, Dr. Katz. Uh, fluid is not found on the page, nor is liquid, nor is gas. What about pipe? Pipes do not have a bonus. <laughs> They're one of the few things that don't get a quality bonus other than health. Um, but yeah, I'm super excited. I'm super excited for quality. I don't know if... If I had to pick, do you get all the space age stuff and no quality, or do you get quality and none of the space age stuff, like none of the planets? What would I pick? <sighs> the fact that that's even something I have to think about for a minute tells you how big of a mechanic quality is. 
I think I'd still choose Space Age because there's just so much content there, but like quality is sweet. And I, I, with how much I've been anticipating it, I can't imagine playing without it now. That would feel so empty. So. All right, moving on. We got to keep plowing through these FFFs. So research and technology. So this one, uh, they, oh yeah, a bunch of people like freaked out about quality, right? Cause it's such a huge mechanic. So everyone was throwing all sorts of fits about things, it, particularly the name. Um, the name of the different tiers is very much World of Warcraft RPG, and it is very much not factory type names, right? Because it's just like an epic, an epic iron gear whoa uh that just doesn't sound right so i'm actually with the the part of the community that doesn't love the names i've gotten used to them because it's just they kind of said this is what it's going to be and so i've just gotten used to hearing it gotten used to saying it but i also don't really love it it doesn't sound right to me um i i've seen a lot of ideas some of them sound decent um uh, whether it's just changing the name to like um, I, I mean, I had a couple that I had even conjectured that sounded reasonably good. The thing you wouldn't want is to not know where something is on the hierarchy just from hearing the word. Like when you hear legendary, you know, it's at the top. When you hear uncommon because of your gaming experience, you know, it's just right above the normal, right? Cause we, we already have that in our head. Whereas if you start using, a lot of people wanted something like uh, Dwarf Fortress. Um, yeah, they shouldn't be tiers. I do agree with that because we already have tiering of buildings like assemblers and such and belts. Um, so anyway, some people were like, oh, they should be masterwork and quality and exceptional. And it's like, wait, what is a quality iron gear? Not to mention that quality is the name of the mechanic. So it'd be weird to have the name of one of the qualities to be quality. Um, but yeah, like masterwork, is that the best? I don't know. It depends on if legendary is still there or not. So I think my I think I had like good, great. What was the top one? I don't know, uh, but it, whatever it was. It, it wasn't perfect, but it was at least clear which one was the top one, which one was the second one, which one was above, like, yeah. I don't think Mythic or Legendary make much sense any more than Epic. Epic and Legendary are the same type of word. Like, legends are told about this Iron Gear, right? Like, Legendary doesn't make sense. Mythic is the same as Legendary. So Mythic versus Legendary is actually a really bad, uh, Thing to put together because they kind of mean the same thing grammatically like in in english a mythical thing a legendary thing those are like the same word um and epic is actually very similar to we just know that legendary is above epic because of rpgs anyway <laughs> yeah dr katz uh the legendary used uranium fuel cell is very much a thing for sure so anyway, um, I'm going to skip over their quality clarifications here and we're going to go to what this one is actually all about, which is trigger technologies. So trigger technologies is a whole new mechanic in the tech tree that I literally forgot about until this minute. Basically, it's not just researching things that will unlock techs, but actually doing things. So the first time you mine crude oil, you will unlock your oil refinery, you can plant the petroleum and solid fuel from petroleum. And so that's actually really cool um, because now you're kind of getting some things just as you progress through the game. It is gonna confuse some players who didn't read the FFFs. They're gonna be like, wait, why can't I build an oil refinery? Where's the tech for oil refineries? I assume when you search the tech tree for oil refinery, it will show this one though. So I think it'll be okay. Um, and yeah, con, con blim, I agree. I think it's gonna be really good for mods. The Nullius mod actually was doing this before Space Age did it. Uh, so if you, I don't, that doesn't mean they copied, right? It's a common idea in video games to have trigger technologies. So it's not like it's trademarked or anything, but Nolius did do it first in the factorial context. 
Um, and there might have been some mods that even did it before Nolius. That's just where I, I saw it first. Um, but yeah, it's a really cool idea. You know, as soon as you mine uranium ore, boom, now you've got your centrifuges unlocked. The downside is it kind of prevents you preparing. Like if you wanted to prepare your whole uranium stuff before you went out and built your uranium mining outpost, well, now that kind of sucks to be you. You're going to have to go and at least carry a, a little barrel of sulfuric acid and go place a miner with a solar panel to go get one uranium ore. So now you can get your centrifuges all built up and build your whole uranium factory because because now you kind of have to do the mining before you do the building. So there are some sort of little downsides like that, but more or less, I think it's a great plan. Um, I'm sure these numbers will change or the things will change. But yeah, just the idea of like, oh, now rather than researching electronics, which felt it always felt like a weird research to me. Now you just craft some copper plates and now you've got this stuff. So I really like that. Um, exotic Industries has a set of texts that are unlocked differently. Oh, I'm so excited to play Exotic Industries someday. I really am. So yeah, uh, Research Queue is always on. That's actually a change they made to the base game. That's already in Factorio, thankfully. And then this one's a big one. Productivity Researches. Now everything has productivity. Well, not okay. Not everything, but everything can have productivity researches. Before it was just mining ore, but now you can literally get certain items. I think they mentioned steel. Here's rocket control units. Where did they mention? Such as steel processing units, rocket control units, etc. So and that will stack with productivity modules, right? And so that will allow you to use maybe more speed modules and less productivity modules, or it'll help your beacons go further, things like that. Um, so yeah, pretty sweet FFF overall, uh, number 376, research and technology. I think the trigger techs and the productivity researches are gonna be a big one. Um, so you guys need to, need to help me keep track, those of you who are kind of trickling in now, Here's what we're keeping track of in this stream slash video. What we want to do is we want to keep a list of things to try out when we get into the game that we don't want to forget to try out. There's so many new features that I actually have a fear that there will be some things I forget even exist while I'm playing. A lot of them like trigger texts, we don't need to put on the list because they'll just happen as we play. Quality is going to happen as we play. So obviously some of these things we don't need a list, but there might be some things I could forget about. Then I want to keep a list of stuff that I'm just presuming viewers would like to see or appreciate a seeing, you know, the kind of thing of the average Factorio player who maybe knows a little bit less than some of us more like 2000 hours plus Factorio players. Um, like what what would they like to see? Like things like train signal guide or recycling guide, you know, uh, that sort of thing. So like a recycle loop blueprint video is like a good example of what we're talking about. And then um, I'm also just for fun keeping a quality of life mod graveyard because they've they've killed so many quality of life mods with the things that they've added in. I kind of want to keep track. So if you guys notice another mod that bites the dust because of features they've added, uh, make sure to list them in the chat. So just, uh, just so you guys know what we're keeping track of so you can let me know in chat because I'm going to need your help. All right, new, new rails. This one, we won't need a list to try. We will certainly do rails either way. Um, so there are certain areas in Factorio we haven't had the courage to change for a long time. One of them has been the rail system. A lot of us have already read about this by now, but basically... Um, uh, what's the easiest way to summarize this? Rails go in 16 directions now. I mean, that that's the easiest instead of eight. And they have better squiggles. And I will use the word squiggles and you can't stop me. Uh, now you can do little baby, uh, little baby. I know they're called S-bends, but I like calling them squiggles. So now you can do little squiggles and you can do big squiggles. And they've got these half diagonals. So it's pretty great. They had to move like where 
the control points are for the rails, which means now a circle of a railway is bigger by four tiles. If you're talking about a full circle, the diameter is four tiles bigger because the radius went from 11 to 13. So there you go. Now, now you know what the new rails are if you didn't before. Uh, it doesn't change too much and they added more spots where you can put signals along especially curved rails. So you will basically be allowed to put signals in places you couldn't before and they said that that kind of helps compensate for the bigger turning radius making signaling harder. So signaling gets harder in some ways because the rails are bigger now, the turns are bigger, but it's easier in some ways because you can place signals in more places. So overall, it should be still fairly easy to signal your interchanges. And here are all the pieces kind of laid out together. Put no black lines in radar to the mod graveyard. Um, I don't want to put leader. I, I've never even heard of that mod. Um, what? No black lines in radar. I don't even know what that means. And what? When did they mention having that quality now? That quality of life thing now in the game. Uh, Braver new world mod. Um, okay, so yeah, so the rails are in 16 directions. We got half diagonals. You can now kind of do whatever you want for rails, which is awesome. I am curious how the rail uh, positioning will go. Um, like the rail planner, because before with only eight directions, it was sort of easy to get it to do what you wanted to do. Now I'm guessing it's going to be a little bit trickier to get it to do what you want it to do. Um, they talked about the graphics. It's pretty sweet. Um, okay, the next one, still about rails, pretty huge. Trains on another level, oh yeah baby, elevated rails. This one's very exciting, again I don't need to put it on the list of stuff to try because I'm, I'm obviously going to try rails. Um, I, I don't think this is going to change as much as people think it will but it will help. It is nice. It is now very easy to make interchanges that have no left turns, right? No crossings. It only has merges. Um, and the other big thing is that these are necessary on Fulgora. They, do they talk about that in this FFF? But basically you need to use these pylon things to get across the like oil ocean of oil sand ocean in Fulgora. So, so that's another thing. Um, another special person has redeemed their name in game with Twitch points. So there you go. You can build bridgeheads in only four directions and they take up way too much space. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think the elevated rails are certainly gonna be useful for a lot of scenarios. I'm also curious which buildings can and can't go underneath them because you do get a little bit more base real estate if all of your rails are elevated, right? Like if, if all, um, like in this screenshot here, if you just imagine all of your rails are up above, now you can build stuff underneath it. The question is what all can you build underneath it? So that, that'll be up for uh, discovery. Maybe that can be on the stuff we wanna try list. What goes under elevated rails? I don't think that's worth putting on the list. I'll tr I'll be trying that either way. I don't think I need to remind myself of that. As a proud left-hand driver, no, no, right-hand drive all the way. Right-hand drive all the way. Also, Dr. Katz, you were you were mentioning the new uh, carpet blueprints. Yeah, like where the it's just constant rails. That will be very interesting. Sorry, I need to move my chats so I can see both easily. There we go. Elevated rails will be helpful with spaghetti factories for sure. Oh, the FFF was clear about what goes under. Yeah, it will mess with visibility to put stuff under rails. You're, you're not wrong about that. So I think they basically improved like what happens with ghost connections of wire, like when you're building a, a ghost uh, power pole. Um, 
They made everything simpler, which is great. This one's cool. When dragging an electric pole that already has wire connections, it keeps connecting those colors of wire. Um, was that a quality of life mod? I'm not sure. It, it could have been. Uh, the wires are sagging properly now before they did like a weird improper sag, I guess. Um, and the shadows were wrong. If you look at the shadows there. So there you go. So that's going to be great. Abstract items like blueprints, wires, discharge defense remote, artillery remote, and Spidertron remote are all now not items. You don't have to craft them. Um, so wires are free now, which is kind of a big deal, especially for certain mods. There were some mods where actually getting the resources to make wires was not always easy. Now you just have the wiring capability as like a tool in that little menu in the bottom of your screen. So that'll be nice. Um, yeah, Conblim, you're probably right. Um, but let's let's keep the the list to when we actually see that FFF. I, this one wasn't the one that mentioned whole belt readers, was it? I don't think so. Because otherwise, we'll get too confused if we just start throwing them out willy nilly. So let's uh, let's keep the quality of life mod graveyard to when we're reading that particular FFF. So like in this FFF, did any quality of life mods die? I'm not sure. Not any that I used, but I didn't use all the quality of life mods. So I did use a lot, <laughs> but I didn't use all of them. Uh, remote view certainly will kill some, I think. Um, yeah, wires were free if you use blueprints. That was a weird thing for sure. Um, okay, so wire wire shortcut mods. Okay, I'll put I'll put that in there. We don't have to. So okay, uh, let me let me clarify. I don't need literally every single mod from the mod portal. Have you done a search for any mod that could potentially exist that does something similar? I'm thinking more ones that have lots of downloads that a lot of people use. So uh, on the more popular end of mods, I'm guessing this one was, so that's why I'm putting it. I just didn't use it myself. Um, Cause I'm guessing there are a lot of quality of life mods that got killed that weren't that popular. And I don't want to add 500 things to this list, but yeah, exactly. I, that's what I said, guys. I said, I said I added it to the list cause probably a lot of people used it. It sounds like a mod that a lot of people used. Um, but yes, anyway, so. 380, remote view. How are we doing on time? We're 40 minutes in already? Damn, we're not doing good. Um, so remote opening assembling machine. I mean, this, does this kill long reach? I'm not sure if this counts, but this kind of counts as killing long reach. Eh, I'm a little, I'm a little iffy on this, um, but there were certainly, I'll just put, kind of in general, I'll put like remote view mods because remote view has so many improvements. Any any mods that made remote view better, basically this has done away with them. Uh, there might be certain features that it didn't, but, but now you can rotate stuff from remote view. You can access, you know, building selections from there. You can do ghost items. Wait, what is this? You can click a ghost cursor in an invent. Oh, yeah, you can like remove modules. Um, I B. Jonas, I don't know what you mean. No black lines in. You're going to have to explain what that is. I don't I don't know what black lines in map view means. Uh, you can open ghost buildings. That's new. That's just a new functionality altogether. So that's cool. Blueprinting Spider-Trons with equipment. Um, ghost entities on ghost tiles. This one's so nice. 
Super Force Build. Uh, is that where they talk about Super Force Build? Tenting Ghosts. They made ghosts a little more ghosty, which is very helpful. Um, so what do you, do we do? We think that counts as killing. Um, what's it called? Uh, blue. What it, like the bluer blueprints one? Blueprint colors. I forget what the mod is called, but the blueprint colors mod blue ghosts. Yeah, that's what it was. We might again, is it totally dead? No, because that allowed you to change it to whatever color you want. You could have red blueprints. So like the mod might still live on for some people that really want the customization. But more or less, it existed because it was really hard to parse blueprints before. And now they've undo undone that. In Factorio 1, if you zoom in on the map view, you see some annoying black shading close to... Oh, you mean the like the the shadow around the border? They un now that is amazing. I am very happy about that. If that's what you're talking about, because I do know what you mean in map view, and that was really annoying. It made doing remote view stuff kind of annoying. It made taking screenshots from remote view kind of annoying because it wouldn't look as good as if you just screenshotted um, while you were standing there because it had that little shadow around the edge. So for sure. Uh, what's this? Ghost change tent when there's a robot assigned to it, so that's cool. Yeah, basically the CRT effect. No opt. All right, we're moving on. I, again, I'm skipping so much stuff in these because we got to keep moving. Um, oops, sorry. Got to keep that turned off. Maybe I should move this over here. I have a plethora of windows open, I'm trying to figure out where to put them all. Sorry, B. Jonas, it doesn't let you do links in uh, in stuff. Okay, so space platforms. This is another. This is kind of another big content one. They hadn't done a ton of big content stuff um, up until now. So talking about space platforms, this was a really exciting FFF. So what are space platforms? You start by launching a space platform starter pack. It's inserted into the rocket silo like a satellite is, and voila, you get a little space platform hub. And then you can build a space platform, which they they now have talked about. It has an animation uh, now. I don't know if it did back then, but that's really cool. You get items to space platforms by launching them in rockets. So that's pretty neat. Um, where did my... Sorry, I lost a chat window. There it is. Uh, ethical code? Yeah, you can ask a question about Satisfactory. Uh, ghost on landfill was also a quality of life, Dr. Katz is saying. Let me add that to the list here. I didn't actually know that existed. But we will certainly add that. Yeah, it is funny they're calling it a starter pack. <laughs> the animation came up in a later FFF. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, ethical, if you're having trouble finding Sam, uh, it's hard to it's hard to describe where you look, but they tend to be in, in fancy places, like places that look kind of epic or fancy. They're not just randomly scattered. There are quite a few of them, though, so if you keep looking, you'll find one. So anyway, space platforms use asteroids as a resource, and I want to talk about that a little bit because it's different. It's different because you are not going anywhere to get resources and they are renewable resources, both of which are not yet a standard thing in Factorio, right? Like y the resources are coming to you kind of like Biter Science did back when Biter's dropped science or some of the mods that made Biter's drop science. So like now these asteroids are floating towards you and mm, resources so you're collecting things as you hurtle through space and there's different kinds of asteroids that get you different kinds of things and you basically you get space science um out there 
by doing space science-y things. You need to collect asteroids for that, I guess. I don't know exactly how that all will work. But then the other thing you need to do is you need to fuel your thrusters. And that's a really big one. Um, so I'm excited. When did they say no chests? Some entities can't be constructed on platforms at all. Robots, chests to prevent excessive buffering. That is so interesting. Yeah, that's going to be a big change. Um, but yeah, the, the thrusters are going to be a cool puzzle because those require you to make the fuel and oxidizer on the platform. So there's a lot of interesting stuff. <laughs> You're a pack rat. Where do you put all your stuff? Uh, I guess just lots of belts. Lots and lots of belts. Power on space platforms. Here they're using some high pressure turbines. Um, we will be able to... Actually, this might have been buffed a little bit. Just recently in an FFF, they made it so that water makes 10 times more steam. So I wonder if they made those ice asteroids give less water. But yeah, the thruster animation is top notch. It is really great. Gosh, all that smoke. Oh, it's going to be so cool. I'm so excited. Okay, uh, we can't spend too much time lollygagging here. On to 382. Logistics groups. Ooh, this one's exciting. Um, does this kill any quality of life mods? Oh, here they show the animation for building more platforms. This is really cool. So that's neat. Um... Oh, and I didn't mention with asteroids, some of them will crash into you. So you have to uh, put like gun turrets on and rocket turrets and stuff on the front to kill stuff. So that's really neat. Um, they do have a rocket carry capacity, so things are weight based. I, I still don't know. They haven't actually given us details apart from what they talk about here of the weight system, and they might have changed it since then on exactly how this works. But items have different weight and that will fill up your rocket capacity differently based on different items. So like 10 belts is not gonna take the same capacity as 10 inserters, etc. cetera. Um, so in automatic mode, the rocket silo will request just one item based on requests from orbiting platforms. It always waits until it has a full rocket before launching. That way you're not wasting potential weight that you could carry to space. The overall logistics is that rocket delivers items to platform in orbit, the platform travels to another planet, and then that drops stuff to the landing pad. So these are trains, trains in space, but not actually trains in space. You can't build trains in space, but these are trains in space. Um, but yeah, so logistics groups, basically I can say, hey, group one, is going to have these items in it and group two is going to have these items in it and you can change the requests of a spidertron or of your space platform or of your personal self by turning on or off those groups and all the groups share when you make a change you know in this group it'll make that change in all of the things that are requesting that so what's awesome like this example of rail building i'm not working on rails all the time so I don't need to have a thousand rails in my inventory most of the time, but some of the time I do want all of that stuff requested and I don't want to have to make six requests every time I want to deal with rails. So now you can just turn on or off, you know, this rail building check mark for your own logistics. That's an example of the usage. It's going to be great. Um, trash unrequested. Um, now you can trash things that aren't specifically on the request list. I think that's the one you were saying uh, is killed. Quality of life, B. Jonas, you said something about auto trash mod. I think that's the one we're talking about. So let's put that on the list here. And I'm sure we're missing some of these too. But yeah, trashing unrequested is super handy for, for stuff like trains or vehicles or whatnot. Um, it's easy to make like a, a combat base resupply train or resupply request chest. I don't know. There's, lot, there's lots of new uh, great ways to do this. 
So constant combinators use the exact same system. Different combinators can be synced up automatically. <coughs> so now you can have your constant combinators hooked up to a request chest and you can easily have those all update at the same time. And that can work great with like changing the quality of something you're requesting. You know, like maybe you're making quality ammo now for your gun turrets, and now you can just change what's in that logistic logistics request, and now you're requesting that uncommon uranium ammo instead of regular uranium ammo, and that'll do more damage to the asteroids for your turrets or whatever. I don't know. Hey, Lodro, thanks so much for the sub. Very much appreciated. <laughs> that horse is whack. Oh my gosh, it's such a good Adventure Time moment. Such a good gif. All right, moving on. Three... Oh, we're on to page five now. Nice. Super Force Building. This is an exciting one. So Super Force Building. Oh, God, can we just talk about how good this animation is? Look at that. It, like, crawls out. Oh, that just looks so cool. Oh, what a gif. What a gif. What a gif. Beautiful. So, super force building. Um, basically, sorry, I gotta move my Twitch chat. Where did I put it? Uh oh, I lost a window. Show pop out. Oh, there it is. Okay. So, super force building basically allows you to build landfill and the stuff on top of the landfill in one click. One click, finally. It's amazing. Because, yeah, if you were trying to build on water before, you'd have to build the landfill, and then you'd have to build the stuff. Even with what they added recently, you... In, like, a few FFFs ago from here, they had talked about being able to put ghost entities on ghost landfill. Even that would require multiple clicks. But now, control shift click, plop it there, and it will do it all in two steps for you. It's so nice. What it also does is, um, what does it also do? It builds on top of stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. So if you if you like put rails in your super force build, it'll just deconstruct whatever's in the way. And yeah, that could mess up your base, right? Deconnects power stuff, but like. It'll just be so nice to be able to not have to do a giant deconstruction planner to deconstruct a bunch of stuff, to then paste a blueprint, to then paste the old stuff back over it to see whatever actually would have fit. Now it just deconstructs what it has to. So it's a very nice uh, time saver for all sorts of stuff. Um, Super force building as a direct build shortcut. So you can even just do it for like little stuff. Belt integration. Um, now it automatically will will fix with undergrounds. Ugh, can we just talk about how beautiful this is? I forgot this existed. This is amazing. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. Yeah, exactly, Dr. Katz. Place it here now. I don't care what's there. I want it, and I want it now. It's my building, and I want it now. Uh, mining landfill can now be done, which is cool, but not old land. Uh, what else? It's so cool too, like if you've built landfill, you can finally undo that and get a water pump there. So you don't have to worry about like, oh, I should landfill, but I should leave a few spots where I can get water from. No longer is that needed. Uh, now, if you've landfilled a whole area, you can get water wherever you want, which weirdly makes late game bases that have billions of landfill kind of want to build over lakes because then you kind of have water exactly where you want it and you don't have to pipe it in from anywhere. So that's kind of an interesting, an interesting thing that like now when you're super late game, you actually want to build on water build the landfill first, obviously, but but yeah, being able to fix landfill mistakes is really nice. I'm guessing there's a quality of life mod that that's killed there. 
I don't know. None, none that I used or killed there, but certainly there had to have been something in that category. All right, here we go. Here's another big one. Quality or quality combinators 2.0. So this one's huge, 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 huge. Um, so first thing they change. Yeah, yeah, you guys are right. Sort of water fill mods are killed by that, but like kind of not. But like it will have some of the same vibes, but only for areas that you've already landfilled. So it, it'll 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 remove the need for water fill in certain scenarios. We'll, we'll say it that way. Um, anyway, so the circuit GUI has always been a little rough. And if you've ever tried to make uh, whatever they're called, circuit I, i'm not trying to say circuits though but like if you're trying to make a circuit network where like it does a bunch of things with a bunch of different types of combinators it's just a pain in the butt it really has been so they reworked the gui um such that in 2.0 all the elements present are enabled and disabled when needed so you're not gonna have stuff that you don't need showing up um Circuit slots now show the values. So when you when you click on something like steel, you'll actually see that the signal it's getting right now is for steel. So that's great. Um, the decide this this is right here is like the mind blowing change. Look at this decider combinator 2.0. We have anding and oring directly in the combinator. That alone is removing the need for sometimes dozens of combinators. Like, it's ridiculous how powerful this is. And you can also change the red and green of what you've clicked, which, yeah, I guess, is that reading and writing? Or you could have red, I don't even know. You've got two different red, green. I don't even know how this all works, but we're gonna play, we're gonna play with this a ton uh when we're in the game i probably won't even come close to touching scratching the surface of like what you can do with this but it is amazing um i mean they were turing complete before but they're for sure turing complete now <laughs> exactly uh i do like that they're still not adding a programming language into the game i find that that actually can hurt games more than it helps them um so i like that it's still all even though the depth of the complexity will not be explored by most players, the concept of what am I looking at is understandable by most players. So I think that is good, that I can look at this and understand what's going on. Now, can you look at a whole field of combinators and understand what they're doing together? No. But can I at least look at one combinator and understand what it's doing? Yes. And I think that's good. Um, so yeah, the decider combinator, now you can do way, way, way more. You can add a description to it as well, which is nice. Um, input and output on the arithmetic combinator. So now it kind of matches the view style of the decider 2.0. And now there's a new combinator type called the selector combinator. Um, Basically, it can help you index items. So output the signal at a given index. So it could it could give you the like what's the second big what's the second biggest signal I'm getting right now. It could give you that, or it could give you what's the stack size of the item that you're telling me about right now, which I assume would be the largest signal it's getting. Um, Things like that. So now it's just crazy. Um, I, I never did like a ton, a ton, a ton with combinators. I did make the auto extending uh, mining drill in Dangerous, which is basically uh, class orphobia. Or no, I played the class orphobic mod, which was a replacement for Dangerous because that mod got really laggy with the 1.1 update or something. But anyway, all that to say, I did do like a fairly advanced circuit, but it was still chump change compared to some of the stuff I've seen like Dosh Doshington do and that sort of thing. Um, but now, yeah, exactly, Glim. Being able to use and and or are actually quite intuitive for anyone that has at least a little bit of an engineering or scientific bent and 
The and and or alone in the decider combinator is going to make people use combinators a lot more. For example, we just learned in a more recent FFF that you can read the heat from a reactor. And so what you could do is you could re you could say the heat is low and maybe my steam supply is low. Then you have the inserter, you know, insert the uh, fuel cell to the reactor or something like that. So like there are lots of there are lots of places where even players who are on the more basic end of things are going to really appreciate uh, this being added up. So, oh yeah, yeah, the heat is low. Well, the heat wouldn't, well, I guess the, if the heat is low and there's no fuel in there, you wanna add fuel. If the heat is low and there's fuel in there, you don't wanna add more because you just added some. So that's a, a spot for it. Um, anyway, there are other things that the selector combinator can do that I don't really, no, understand yet how I would use it, but I'm sure, I'm sure I will ran, uh, eventually. I always said random because I read the word random here. Output a random signal. That could be interesting. So we have randomization actually like hardcore in the game now in a way that you can easily make use of it. Why would we need random signals? I'm excited to see what people do with that. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be great. Zekola, you were playing Ultra Cube in the game. Yeah, Ultra Cube is going to be so much more fun to, to play now uh, with these combinators. I feel like that's a big one. All right, moving on. 385. Uh, Asteroid Collector. So this one's pretty cool. Um, they originally talked about like doing a tractor beam style to collect asteroids, but then they were like, no, that's like too like fancy sci-fi rather than like gritty industrial sci-fi and so they were like let's get let's get some sort of harpoon and so then they got like <laughs> you know okay what about a long long ass inserter in space uh what about what about a scooper a pooper scooper to get the god i would have loved if we had had pooper scoopers in space but that is not that is not our lot in life or just like a shovel like just bring it all to me let's just make uh, just a big a V shape to get all the asteroids. But then they went with the, the thing we know they went with, which is this, the, the tentacle robot arm, which does feel a little, um, yeah, it kind of looks like a combination of a xenomorph and then the things from... <laughs> you know, like squid monsters or something, which feels a little out of Factorio place, but at the same time, it still looks industrial and the graphics are much updated since this FFF. So I do think it ended up looking really good. And they talk about the code that they use to try to get the arms to actually like grab things properly. You can <laughs> see uh, the bugginess that they had to deal with. I can't imagine the amount of logic uh, that they had to do to get these things working right all sorts of nonsense this was one of those more technical fffs where like you can explain in 30 seconds most of the details from the fff that actually kind of matter to the player and then the the other 20 minutes of reading the fff is understanding how they put it together but uh but yeah asteroid collectors are sweet i'm excited to use them i don't i don't have a ton more to say about that like they're an exciting thing but i don't know what else to say um, this FFF is mostly teaser. So with the planets, they t I'm just double checking myself on that. With the planets, they mostly did like teaser version, which is all about the aesthetics and the music and the vibes. And then they did the like content version, which is all about what's actually on the planet. What are you doing there? Why are you, why are you there? Um, so, uh, let's, should we watch one of these? Why not? Let me turn off the music here. Oh, this one doesn't have music. Yeah, you can see the tank driving through the, the ash lands. Yeah, it does talk a lot about the terrain. The terrain is a big deal on all the new planets. That's certainly worth mentioning. Um, like basically we're going to have, we're not going to have cliff explosives. 
until we get to Vulcanus. That's where we unlock them now. And that means if you don't go to Vulcanus first, you're without cliff explosives for a while. And on top of that, the different planets have different surfaces that you can or can't build on. Like obviously Vulcanus has lava, which you can't just landfill over until the very late game. Um, Fulgora has the oil, sand, oceans, and then Gleba has all sorts of swampy land that you won't be able to build on. So it is very interesting. Um, kind of how that all works, but the design of Vulcanus is really cool. I've always liked volcano planets, so I think it's pretty neat. It'll be interesting to see kind of where, where it finally ends up. I'm sure this is not what a generated map looks like now. I know the map gen has changed some, but yeah, sulfuric acid geysers give you sulfuric acid directly. That's a interesting change, uh, or not change, but just like resource. And then they give you coal. You use the lava itself to get iron, copper, and stone, and then, and then the excess, you can just chuck it back in the lava. Uh, the lava is your trash can, which is cool that they kind of basically made the world your trash can on Vulcanus. And then there's tungsten and calcite, which are the new resources. Uh, so we'll be using those. And then we know now what the enemy is on Vulcanus due to the recent FFF, but we'll move on to 387 here because here's where they show us the foundry, which is a very exciting building. We get to make hella metals with it. That's fun. Here, what is it? We're feeding it calcite and lava. Don't know what it's making with that. Where is landfill unlocked, Fulgora or Aquila? Uh, you mean the lava landfill? I'm not sure, Vatimouse. We haven't been told that yet. We've not been told that, as far as I know. Uh, sorry, one second. Okay, but anyway. Um, so yeah, Vulcanus is sweet. We get a new... What is that called? Science pack. Um, here it's making molten iron. No, it's making iron plates from molten iron. This is making iron gears. This is making copper. And that's making LDS. Um, but like from the solid pieces. So it's interesting that we can make kind of these base resources from molten. That's going to be a whole new pathway that we're gonna have. <clears throat> so like now you're like, oh, do I wanna switch all of my iron production to foundry iron production? Cause then you're gonna end up with a lot more. So it'll be interesting. It will be interesting. Oh, and then the big mining drill. I'm so excited about that as well. Like, look at this thing. Look at this thing. Look at it go. Not only does it look badass, but it also outputs items already stacked once you unlock stacking. And I don't remember when we unlock stacking. Um, it also has a much huger area. Look at that, plus four tiles from the edge of the drill. So you can fit rails in between these. Uh, so these are gonna be a prime candidate for direct mining to trains. And you won't even have empty spots in your um, ore patches with that. So the direct from Molten is interesting because you lose a productivity step. Yeah, Alor, I think that's mostly countered by the fact that the Foundry has a built-in productivity bonus. And I think, yeah, and it has four module slots. So because it gives you extra productivity, I think it'll end up being better. And in this case, is it losing a product? Is, why is this losing a productivity step? Um, I don't, how are you losing a productivity step when you're doing molten? Cause normally you go ore to plate here. You're going ore to, to molten to plate. You're adding a, a productivity step. If anything, oh, you mean for like gears, gears of are losing a step. Yes, you're right. You're right. You're right about that. Um, 
I'm guessing it will still be worth it. Because if molten is pretty easy to make in the first place, in this case, gears are actually the same as they were before because you're adding a step to make the molten and then losing a step by not coming from plates. But yeah, I, I will have to do the math on those. Maybe there will be a little bit of a trade off. The 50% the intrinsic productivity in the building, I think, will make up for that in most cases. Uh, I guess we'll just have to see. But. Yeah, and I don't know if you can if the molten itself gives you productivity. I don't I don't know how it all works. The, these will be things we'll investigate as we play. But I mean, look at these badass drills. Like almost filling a blue belt with just two of them, or at least half filling a blue belt with just two of them. Uh, that's so cool. So yeah, that's uh, that's Vulcanus. And then I think here is a good little moment for me to take a quick human break. I'm gonna pause the recording, and we'll be back in a minute here. All right, and we are back. Uh, Twitch chat reminded me that big mining drill is uh, certainly a mod that has now been murdered murdered in cold blood by space age all right so here's some smaller things i'm guessing we're gonna get some quality of life kills in this fff <laughs> 388 um what's this oh saves can now be older <laughs> apparently there was a maximum age of a save file before uh, logistic requests enable tweak relating to recovering corpses. So whenever you recover a corpse, the settings from before are reinstated. Smart number format. You can type mathematical expressions directly into text fields. So that's pretty cool. I had forgotten about this. So you can just be like, oh, 15 times 300 and then have that done. Uh, that's really cool. I had forgotten about being able to do math there. The max range indicator on belts and underground pipes. This is nice. So it turns, uh, here's the new version. It turns green when it's at the maximum range. What color is it until then? They're building it so fast I can't see. Oh, oh, the underground goes from yellow to green. That's what it is. Um, is this Is this a quality of life mod? I think there's one that does this, right? Max range visualizer. Yeah, I don't know if this, this is a, a half. This is an assist rather than a kill, I think. Um, because this is more like, it doesn't visualize the max range until you get to it. So it's a little bit of both, but I'll, I'll count it. I'll count it. Um, has someone made a summary of all the recipe changes? Not that I know of, and I don't think we know of many of the actual novice recipe changes, to be fair. Uh, chart tag improvements. You can now drag them around. You can copy them with pipette. You can put them down even when you're zoomed in. Save, you can sort by date. Manual lamp colors. Uh, that's cool. Color of robots on the map are colored. Green is personal. Smarter deconstruction planner and force building. Cliff explosives are not unlocked from the start even and even more delayed in the expansion. So now they're only marked for deconstruction once explosives are researched. So you don't have a million random cliffs with X's on them. Uh, so that's all nice. I actually don't know if any of those were QOL mods. The color one might have been a QOL mod. Um, certainly, certainly could have been. I don't know if it was. All right. Now we get to another meaty, meaty FFF here. So train interrupts. <sighs> Will this kill LTN is the question. Yes and no is my is my answer. Um, and you can insert Cybersyn, Project Cybersyn, and uh, what's the other main one? TS is it TSM Train Schedule Manager? There's like three that kind of do a similar thing. Um, I'm counting that all lumped together. I think 
this will make far fewer players go looking for LTN. That, that's what I think. I don't think it can replace LTN for things that only LTN has been able to do. However, for me, I think I will certainly avoid LTN for a while and try using this as, as much as I can and see if we really feel the need for LTN anymore. Because being able to interrupt, so let's talk about what's actually in this FFF. So basically trains can now interrupt what they're doing based on their fuel contents, based on their cargo contents, and also based on some, can you base them on circuit conditions? But trains don't have circuit conditions. Uh, interrupts are global. So you can share the same interrupt amongst a bunch of trains, which again is kind of approaching that LTN style. Um, there's, yeah, train groups are all grouped to do the same thing. I think the reason this is approaching, I mean, Alor, yes and no. The basic idea of LTN is I request a bunch of stuff at a stop and I provide a bunch of stuff at a stop and I don't really have to do anything other than that. All my stops are either requesting some combination of things or providing some combination of things. And usually you just do that and it works fine. And LT assume LTN can be hard to set up, but once you've, once you've got that going, then it works great. But now you can provide a bunch of stuff and you can then just add that stop to a scheduled train. Like I'm trying to think like, can you just use one train schedule that just goes to every single pickup stop and you just turn off pickup stops that aren't needed? I don't even know. I don't know. LTN will still be highly useful for Pi, for example. One thing that I do know LTN can do that would be very difficult to do with the, even the new vanilla system is multi-providing stations. Especially if there's an area that requests three of those items and you have an area that provides three of those items, LTN will actually put all three of those in the correct quantities on one train as the requester requested. And that sort of thing certainly can't be can't be done. Um, priorities for train stops. Yeah, all this to say, I, I do think I, I'll stick with my previous statement. I think this being able to prioritize or uh, interrupt your train schedule to say, hey, go here if you have iron, go there if you have um, copper, that sort of thing, and go go to the refueling station if your fuel is low. Being able to have those interrupts, I think will have a, a far fewer number of players looking for new rail solutions. I think this will make it so that uh, trains will give players what they want without them feeling much lack, if that makes sense. LTN, for a lot of players, they went looking for it because they were like, ah, trains just can't, they're so cumbersome. They're, it's so hard to get them to do what I want them to do. Um, and it's even tedious, even when I know how to get them to do what I want them to do, it's tedious to set it all up over and over and over again. And all, between the interrupts and train grouping, what, what did they call that? Um, well, interrupt being grouping and global and also train groups, yeah. I think having that will make it far easier to make vanilla trains do what you want them to do, and it'll make it far less tedious. And between those two things, I think far fewer players will even feel a need to go get a mod that changes train behavior. Uh, that being said, LTN is still extremely powerful, or things like it, Cybersyn, etc. And I, I don't think they'll be replaced completely. Uh, Dr. Katz, I think you actually said it really well. There's a big gap between 1.1 trains and LTN, and there's a smaller gap between 2.0 trains and LTN. There is still a gap, certainly, um, especially for certain applications. I just don't think very many players will find the need for more than what Vanilla offers now. So I am really excited to try it out. I may still end up doing LTN for Pyanodon someday, who knows, but uh, yeah, train interrupts, train control improvements, huge deal. Very excited about that. <sighs> Moving on to 390, how we doing? I've made it, what did we start at? 373, so we've made it through 28, and we're only an hour and 24 minutes in. Okay, we're, we're on a good pace, we're on a good pace. 
This is going well. Uh, Conball Machine, you like that they added an interrupt condition for when the destination is full. Yes, yes, exactly. So then you don't have trains um, basically getting clogged up in places where they can't dump resources. Okay, yeah, also we've got some kills. We got some kills to log here. So train groups. Um, I don't know about train control signals. Uh, Cause I never used that mod. So I'll put a question mark. Um, but yeah, train groups, certainly. Also, some of the mods that were killed were literally Rygard's mods and he works for Wooba, and so he was like, hey, let's get this feature in the base game. So are the mods killed or are they enshrined forever in the game itself? It, they're they're more like. Uh, um, oh, I'm only at 18, not 28. Damn it, Glim. Why you got to do me like that? Correct me with math. Um. <laughs> All right, this one, noise expressions. So I'm going to skim through this pretty fast. Basically, they changed how the map generation does noise. Pretty cool, mathy, sciencey, like, how do you do map generation stuff? Um, nothing super deep for us to talk about other than this helps make them. Oh, this was here. This was here. Um, Avert your eyes, anyone who doesn't want to hear anything about Aquilo. But uh, I'll give you five seconds. Three, two, one. But yeah, Aquilo. Um, yeah, this is basically a spoiler for what Aquilo looks like. Like this is not, this is not just a Christmas miracle. Uh, Factorio's, where's my tea? Factorio's Miss Miracle. This is this is Aquilo time. So we'll we'll get there. But yeah, I, I love that they had teasers like this um, kind of ahead of time, I think. And some people predicted that. I'm pretty sure someone literally predicted that when this wasn't like if we went to the Reddit thread, we could probably find it. I don't want to go looking for it now. Um, I do want to go looking for a previous one, though, that they had spoiled. Um, it was a April Fool's one. Where was it? Was it? No, not that one. This one. So in this one, they spoiled like legendary module just straight up right here. Um, and this is back in April of 22. So. I do, I do think it's hilarious that they spoiled spoiled that so, so far back. And some people like wondered, but I don't think anyone really caught on that because like it was a joke, like a legendary module, like it just sounds ridiculous. It fits perfectly into an April Fool's and it almost makes it even funnier that they ended up then doing it because it's like, wait, people laughed at that as a joke and now you're actually doing legendary modules. <laughs> oh, it's great. It's great. All right, moving on, moving on. Uh, okay, so 391 here, 20, oh yeah, and Epic Furnaces, you're right. They didn't have the, the quality pips on it, but it did say Epic Furnaces. So this is just a recap of 2023. They talk about how many mods were downloaded, mod creators, trying to improve the mod manager for Factorio 2.0, which is great. Installing mods kind of works a little differently. The explore tab. This is nice to not just have this is kind of like reflecting what's on the mod site right now. <clears throat> uh, yeah, yeah, the legendary it is it's it's RNG to upgrade whatever you're crafting to the next level. But you build a loop with recyclers and assemblers to keep crafting more of the same thing and recycling anything that doesn't upgrade and eventually everything gets upgraded and you can do that successively to build towards having legendary components and then if you craft a module where all of its ingredients are legendary that 
module will be legendary without having to RNG it. So you basically, you have to RNG somewhere. It all averages out in the end, so some people argue it's not RNG. It, it is technically RNG, but the numbers are large enough that it does average out. And so you have to you have to put that upgrading process somewhere along your production line. But as long as you end up having legendary things in, you will get legendary things out. And Dusk, yes, 56 times more expensive if you have all the legendary quality modules. It, it will not start out that cheap. It will be far more expensive than 56 X. Um, anyway, 2023 recap, nothing too crazy there. But let's talk about another huge feature that I'm going to put on my list of things um, that I want to try. Blueprints. I probably don't need a reminder for that, but I'm just so excited to. Uh... <coughs> Excuse me. So excited to try it out. Um, so this is oh, oh, this also kills a mod. We'll get to that in a moment. But basically it was it was inspired by making a bunch of train stations in a row and being like okay this one's for stone and i set all the filters to stone and then i set you know this combinator to stone and then i name the stop stone icon unload you know whatever like i basically you're doing the same thing five times and the only difference is which icon you're using and which resource you're you're unloading um and the same thing happens in different places so they were like, what if we could parameterize it, AKA change some of those things that are your setting and turn it into a parameter that then when you paste the blueprint, you can just change that one parameter. And this actually is a mod called blueprint variables that I was just starting to use more in my playthroughs and finally starting to appreciate the power of it. So I'm actually really excited to kind of keep getting to use it. And now it's a part of vanilla and it's even more powerful so basically now you can just set things as parameters in your blueprints. I mean, you can you can set the parameter of assembling machine recipes. You can set requests and requester chests. You can set filters and inserters, all sorts of things. And between all of that, it allows you to make blueprints that kind of can be everything blueprints. Like you could just have you know, like if you wanted a basic line of like four assemblers that are all working off of a belt, but then plugging things into, you know, a, I don't know, a chest. I guess you already can do requester chests pretty easy without parameterizing them, but I don't know. I, I'm sure we'll find uses for this as we play. It's hard to like dream all of this, but um, you can set based on item count. So, so basically the number five is used in both to be parameterized as well. Filling up the name's not necessary. Um, so you can change the count of something as a parameter, like an actual value. They, I don't think Dr. Cats that they've mentioned yet in the FFFs that you can set assembler recipes based on circuit, but you can. But yeah, here's a, I feel like this is better than my words, just watching this little gif. So yeah, this is gonna be so helpful for train stations. It's not even, not even close to like, will this be helpful? It's like, oh my God, this is gonna be so helpful. Also, you can set ingredients of a parameter so like your requester chest can be all good to go um, it's very interesting I I'm curious you can even do formulas with variables like I I don't even know if I fully understand all of this <clears throat> yet but it's gonna be great so three numbers are present but for some reason we only want the user to modify the first number of a hundred so then it can just instead modify X so really cool stuff, really cool stuff. I don't think they've mentioned circuits being able to tell assemblers what to build. I don't think so, unless it was in this one. I don't think it was in that one. 
Yeah, the recursive blueprint mod is not dead um, and it will probably have a few changes because it doesn't quite. There are a few things it does that I think vanilla does now. But yeah, combining this with recursive blueprints, who knows what will be possible. All right, on to the next page, we're on to page four. Ooh, another big feature that I just forget about half the time. Um, stacking, putting things on top of other things. Look at this, items are all stacked up. It's beautiful. The initial experiment, boss kid going ape beyond the point of no return. Um, so yeah, they called it the bulk inserter. Uh, this has been changed to be the stack inserter. Thankfully, the community threw a hissy fit, I think properly through a hissy fit. I think it would have been a big mistake to have literally a thing that stacks items on top of each other is not the stack inserter. That would have been so confusing, especially to new players who never even knew the old thing. So, <clears throat> but yeah, this is, I'm going to count it as a kill of um, deadlock stacking and other crating mods. Because there have been a lot of mods that do something of that variety. And this is basically that concept now in vanilla. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about this because it is a way to buff all of your belts without having to rebuild your belts, right? It's, it's a nice kind of throughput multiplier. If you're willing to do the stacking, it's a multiplier. And the thing I love, the thing I love about this is you don't have to unstack them. That was one of the worst parts about the deadlocks type thing is you basically had to have your belts almost feel like rails where they were like a point to point. Oh, it, I stack it and then it or crate it or whatever you want to call it. It goes along the belt nicely multiplied, but then I have to uncrate it anyway at the end. And so it kind of feels almost like a little rail, but now we can just grab items from a stack to use in a building. Do they show gifts of that somewhere? Maybe, uh, maybe not. But uh, yeah, so you can just grab items from the stack itself. You don't have to unstack them. The thing that is interesting, like Nullius actually had crated recipes. So uh, Nullius got around this issue by saying, okay, you can crate items. And then once they're crated, you'll have a separate recipe that you can do in an assembler that uses two crates of iron plates and one crate of copper wires, you know, to make a crate of circuits, essentially. So it would kind of just keep things stacked. But it clearly that was a, a more confusing thing because then you had different recipes for the same item and it, it was kind of a mess. So this this is a good system and it only could work with the engine changes, right? Like if the if the base game engine wasn't changed, this wouldn't really work right because it wouldn't be able to treat one thing on a belt like multiple items, but now it can. So pretty awesome. Um, if you split before grabbing from the stack and grab from the split, you'll never leave partial stacks on the main belt. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah, so they, they called it the bulk inserter, meaning the, the new thing that stacks items was called the bulk inserter. The old stack inserter is an item that has a stack size, inserter capacity size that's higher, but still couldn't stack items on a belt. It was very confusing. Everybody freaked out on Reddit. Um, we'll get to that in a minute, but... <clears throat> and then, yeah, they also spoiled Belt number four. So tier four belts. Um, we now know it's made out of tungsten. I don't know if we, did we know that back then? But yeah, they're fast AF boy. Um, they go 60 items a second. So yeah, that is another dead mod. Good point, good point. Um, I'll just call it 60 I sec belts, belt mods. Because there were, there were more than one mod that made this a thing. The name Stack Inserter was already confusing for you as a newbie because they don't lift entire stacks like 50 or, or 100 plates. That is, that is interesting. Um, 
Yeah. I don't know. I mean, the, it is a problem. The word stack is used in too many ways in the game. I, I think that's just a problem in general because we talk about stack size of items. And now that can mean two things. Are you talking about the stack size on the belt? Or are you talking about how many plates can fit in one slot in your inventory? So I, I think the problem is we need more words for this. Uh, also, Dr. Katz, you're right. Uh, another mod that was killed in here, I didn't even read it, but basically all inserters can do filters now. Goodbye filter inserters. Um, so all inserters filterable. I didn't know that was a mod, but it makes sense that it was a mod. Circuit and tank mean too many things too. They don't lift more than a stack though. They will only lift one satellite. Wait, really? You know, I never realized that. So a stack inserter or bulk bulk inserter will only move one satellite? Huh. The current stack inserter is now the bulk inserter. We do still have bulk and stack. It's just the, the stack inserter is now the one that does the stacking on the belts. Yeah, and Pyanodon's already had the all inserters filterable change. Exactly. <coughs> oh man, my throat's getting dry. A lot of talking. All right, hey, we're here. We were just talking about this. So 394, assembler flipping and circuit control. Uh, this is a mod, right? Or was this part of recursive blueprints? Because uh, I won't count recursive blueprints as killed. Because this... If this is in Recursive Blueprints, it's just a sub-feature. If there is a mod that did just this, I'll count that as killed. Um, but uh, yeah, so here's a thing they couldn't stop themselves from doing. I feel like that's all the great features are like this. Um, yeah, it's, it's basically as simple as it sounds. You connect an assembler to the circuit network and you can enable or disable it based on circuit network, that previously wasn't possible. You would have had to have controlled the power source before. Now you can set the recipe, you can read the ingredients, you can read the recipe when it's finished and it will send a signal. You can read that it's working and it will send a signal. And so that's really cool. Um, craft anything recipes are gonna be, e yeah, exactly, Dr. Katz. You can read the ingredients that it wants and just send those maybe through a multiplier to a requester chest, so you can actively request those. Um, really cool stuff. Really cool stuff. I don't think I need to say a lot more about it. Uh, flipping for real, blueprint flipping was introduced. What was this all about? Um, oh yeah, this is the one that, that now introduces this fluid uh oh ooh, this is another kill another confirmed kill um <clears throat> what's it called though fluid fluid output what is this mod called Oot put uh someone will remember the name for me i'm sure but yeah look at this <clears throat> petroleum on the left steam on the left this is gonna help a lot with um how, I'll use the word, how annoying um, vanilla pipes are, like not having something like advanced fluid handling, being able to have two buildings smushed together, sharing an input pipe right next to each other, it will vastly decrease the size of larger fluid builds. So I'm very excited about this change. I think it's very helpful. Um, so yeah. I'm excited to kind of build the new blueprints. I think we're gonna see a lot of people building in pairs and quads with fluid buildings now because of the uh, because of the changes here. Um, I thought, was that really the name? I thought it was called something else. Maybe there were multiple mods that did it. Yeah, fluid permutations, uh, Dave. That's the one I was thinking of, but apparently there's one called, uh, God damn it, water. So we'll put both. GDIW. So those are dead. The assembler circuit control will be very useful for mod with a lot of tier of buildings. 
Yeah, so there's another whole topic that I feel like we could talk about for hours. Like, what's Pyanodon's going to do? Or Bob's Angels. I think those are the prime examples that I have in my mind of mods that have tiers of everything. In Pyanodon's, all their modules have three or four tiers. Uh, not literally all, but like almost all. And all the buildings have four tiers. And in Bob's Angels, a lot of the buildings even have five tiers. So are they going to change to just use the quality system? The problem with that is both Pyanodons and Bob's Angels, or I should say and Bob's and Angels, because technically those are different mod suites, have used a philosophy of higher tiers of buildings are locked behind um, like much more advanced materials and they cost much, much more in terms of like total resources and effort and time and energy and, you know, ore pulled from the planet. Like a tier two Pyanodon's building is crazy expensive, far more expensive than getting an uncommon would be in the new quality system. So it, it's very interesting because the new quality system is not really one to one matching with the tiering of buildings from like Pi or Bob's or Angels or many of the other mods. So I'm just I'm very interested to see how they end up kind of working with those. <clears throat> Anyway, here's them finally admitting uh, <laughs> that calling a stack inserter a thing that doesn't stack things on belts didn't make a lot of sense, so they changed it. So stack inserters, as we know them now, are now called bulk inserters because they move a bulk of things at once. And then the new inserter can place items stacked on belts and it is called a stack inserter. Um. <clears throat> Dusk, I kind of agree, but I kind of don't because then you end up with way too much going on. Like you don't need four tiers of buildings and five tiers of quality. In most cases, you're just going to be doing, I don't know, it, it's like, it's hard to describe, but I, I think that's too much. I think what they could do is, re yeah, being able to lock to only certain qualities. So maybe, maybe. <laughs> should be called a bunch insert <laughs> a bunch of bananas um i don't know i'm just thinking about that quality thing i feel like what they could do is they could make it so that i just don't know what mods can change about the quality system or not that's the real question i i said this way back at the beginning because what i think would be cool is if yeah if you could lock quality and then you could make it so that different buildings have a different chance at an upgrade um or you could make it so that you you literally can't upgrade to let's say uncommon unless you have a tier one quality module and you literally can't upgrade to rare unless you have a tier two quality module. And then you can at least lock all of your quality tiers behind the tier of module that you have, rather than just letting people play the roulette as long as they want to get um, higher quality from the beginning. <clears throat> like, I don't know, it still doesn't add up. It still doesn't add up right though. I don't know how they could make it work one to one. And that's outside the scope of this stream. So <laughs> I'm gonna move on, but it is a very interesting topic and I'm interested to see where that goes. Uh, wait a second, what? Oh yeah, 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 okay, this is, a, this is a new FFF. So generic interrupts and train stop priority. So they showcase the new schedule and one small problem slash annoyance slash crime is needing to add an interrupt for each type of item manually. So if you want the train to handle iron gear wheels, you need to create an interrupt saying, if you have gears, go to gear drop off. It's boring and tedious. So instead they have the any item signal. So it's a wildcard signal. When used in a schedule interrupt, it'll match the first item that passes all weight conditions and replace the signal with that item. That's a little hard for me to parse without thinking about it more. But basically you can say,
Oh, it actually changes the name of the train stop that it's trying to go to, to basically that item's rich text tag. So basically, if you name all of your drop offs to be like icon drop, and then if it has some of that stuff, it'll go to that train stop until it's emptied out that cargo. Yep, that makes sense. So that's a generic interrupt. Um, no stops with this name exist. So trains will no path for stops that don't exist. Previously, it would just skip it, which created problems. Um, so that uh, is interesting. Also, con blim, I'm with you. I've never used the icons. Well, that's not true. I have used them, uh, but I generally didn't. But obviously, this might change that. Uh, does it still skip if I disable stop with the circuit network? So in 2.0, disabled train stops will act as if they have a train limit of zero. If a train is on the way and the stop is disabled, it will continue to the stop. If a train is told to go to a disabled stop, it enters the destination full state and waits until it is enabled. Interesting. So if you disable a stop, trains won't skip over it. What if you want them to skip over it though? When the trains disable when the train stops disabled. I don't know the answer to that question. Cuz like as much as I think that these changes made sense to make, what about the old functionality? Can we get that back too? Can we still do that where you disable a stop and trains will skip over that stop until you re-enable it? Uh, that might be possible based on how you do the interrupts and stuff. I'm not sure. I'm not a, I'm not a train master. Um, that's for sure. Now when a train blueprint is built, it switches to automatic mode. So that's great. So trains will just head off into the world. Fly my pretties. Um, train stop priority. Okay. So trains generally prefer stations closer to them, which was fine. <clears throat> However, with generic schedules and one big bag of trains, it can happen that all the trains are busy and moving around, advanced products, and nothing's there to just tell them to go to the mining outposts that are further away. Um, so they added train stop priority. Um, the way it works is the priority of a stop has two effects. When searching for a destination, they prefer a higher train stop. When they're trying to leave a stop, trains at stops with a higher priority will be dispatched first. Meaning, what does that even mean? Is it, but if two trains are at different stops, wouldn't it just dispatch both? Why would one get, hmm. I don't totally understand that one. I guess if they're fighting over going to the same destination, the one at the higher priority would go first. You'd actually like if priority is a full 32 bit integer, but you're a perfectionist. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Um, set the inserters to only function if the train stop limit is above zero and set the train to go on with inactivity. Uh, Kowalki, the problem with that is then you end up still going to the train stop. It doesn't skip it and do the next thing in its schedule, which could mean it goes way out of the way to get there, do nothing and then leave. Uh, so that is certainly uh, not an equivalent solution to the old thing. If two iron trains are ready to leave and a request is, but requests aren't made for iron trains, Game Boy. That's that's why I'm, I'm confused here. I think it's more like if if two iron trains have are waiting to leave and right now they have no destinations because their destination is iron unload, as soon as an iron unload station becomes available, the one with the higher priority will get to go there. I think that's what it's saying. Uh, you can set priority with circuit network, right? I think so. I mean, I presume. It would be weird if you couldn't. Yes, right here. We added the ability to set it using the circuit network. 
<laughs> if if one iron train is heading east at 70 kilometers per, per hour and another one is heading west at 50 kilometers an hour, why the hell are you doing this problem in math class? All right. Um, honestly, though, those problems are so good and I know they wreck students, but like the problem solving of how you get to the answer, depending on which things are going which way and which one's going at what speed, it actually is really useful to do a lot of them. Uh, over and over and over again until you feel like you can do any of them. I just think the problem is we actually don't give students enough of them. So we give them just enough for it to be really confusing and then they maybe get one of them right because the teacher helped, but then like you can't and then you're done and you're moving on to the next level. That's just generally, look, I'm, I'm a math teacher. I'm not active right now because I'm a content creator, but like that's what I majored in. That's what I did for years. And if the US has one big issue with how it does math, it's that we don't actually master things before we move on to the next thing. And that's why kids end up having like hatred of math. They don't they don't like it because they they don't get it because they never had to master it. And it's just a it's uh, I hate it. I won't ramble too long about that, though. All right. Sound improvements. Ooh, I love me some good sound improvements. So working sound accents. So the sound an entity makes when it's active is usually single looping sound, but now there's sound accents, which get played at a specific frame. So you could get like a clang that plays when a part of the, the thing happens. I'm listening. Yeah, oh, that sounds so cool. So here you can see the sound. You've heard about drugs letting you see sound, but here you go. This is what drugs are like, kids. Now you can see sound. I'm a math teacher? Uh, yeah, I am. Uh, I taught high school level math, pretty much all the different things that are taught in high school. So that's everything from Algebra 1 up to Calculus. I didn't do Calc 2, but I did do Calc 1. And like AB Calculus, which is the AP courses, which you know, whatever. So the car's got some new sounds. Trains have some new sounds. Oh, such it sounds like Roller Coaster Tycoon when it goes up on the rails, elevated rails. Amazing. This would be an ultra extreme roller coaster, I gotta say. The, those lateral G forces are going pretty high there. Roller coaster tycoon would not approve of that. Um, wait, did we kill any FFFs with the last one, by the way? Uh, again, not really. Like, even getting a little closer to LTN with train stop priority, but we didn't kill any. Didn't kill LTN with that for sure. All right. Um. Yeah, so the sound design, I want to I wanna talk about, again, how much they have redone this game from the ground up. Every single thing has been looked at. There are no rocks unturned. A lot of games, when they release a DLC, it's primarily new content, right? Now, I'm including lore in that, like if there's a new story, a whole new area, new weapons, new enemies, new, you know, if it's a game you can build stuff, new things you can build, like all of that is standard, right? So the planets, I would say that's standard DLC material. It is cool, like, cause it's kind of a new mechanic combined, but usually games have a new mechanic, at least. Like you think of like Civ expansions, like, oh, we added the faith mechanic. Um, so, so as far as like, new mechanics, I think that's fair game for calling normal or expected. However, Space Age is adding a ton of new mechanics. I think far more than what's normal, right? Just the idea of going of space platforms and going to other planets is already enough of a mechanic addition to count as a DLC, as like what you would expect. Anything more, you don't really need anything more. Quality? parameterized blueprints like train uh, train interrupt schedules like you didn't need it you didn't need to add any of that you could have just made the planets with all of the content on the planets all the new recipes and buildings and that right there boom done dlc people would pay for it you're good to go 
And like, we got so much more than that, right? We, we have so many actual new mechanics added to the game that will affect everything that we're doing on top of all that new content. And then, even then, right? That's already more than what we expect from a DLC in a game. But they didn't just stop there. They did things that a lot of stuff or a lot of games don't ever do, which is like, hey, let's revisit the sounds that these old machines are making and improve them. And let's revisit this other thing that we didn't really love or it wasn't quite perfect. And we're going to improve that. So basically they are OK. Uh, yes. If you guys are going to well, actually me, fine. You're right. Yes. A lot of this is 2.0 and not the deal. I'm combining that into Space Age in general as the 2.0 update combined with purchasing Space Age as the DLC. Uh, what you guys are doing is basically just saying, oh, they're giving away some of the good stuff for free, too. Like that's that's just giving my point even more credibility because <laughs> I'm just saying in a world where you have to pay for everything that's changing it still is completely worth every penny and more because they're adding so much more than what a DLC is even expected to add normally. Um, like sound improvements, like music improvements, like redoing a sprite. Um, like, like basically they looked at every game mechanic and questioned it from the ground up and they've made everything better that had any amount of friction with the player experience. They're like, ooh, that was kind of a feel bad or that was somewhere where players were getting stuck or that was a complaint that I had when I was playing through it every single time. So let's make it so that there's no friction anymore. So Wooba is just amazing. I, I think the amount of work that they've put in and because everything's changed, it's like a whole new game, right? Even the vanilla stuff like you know, on Nowvis when you're not even launching a rocket yet is going to feel so fresh because of the new sounds and the new. I mean, we haven't gotten to that FFF yet, but they redesigned the terrain generation on Nowvis. So even the way the terrain feels is going to feel different. Like they've redesigned some of the rebalance, some of the weapons. They've redone some of the recipes. Like there's just so many little things. It's crazy good. I love it. Uh, anyway, here's our big drills. Oh, also, we, we didn't mention it. Did they mention it in the stacking FFF or have we not seen it yet? Uh, big drills, they release stacked items onto the belt as they drill. So that's pretty great. Ambient sounds. This little birdie's tweeting. Water lapping at the shores. Nice. Item sounds. Oh, this is cool. I forgot this was in an FFF. I did play like 20 minutes of the of the beta just because I wanted to make sure everything was working. And this was a thing I uh, noticed from minute one it was like, oh, picking up and dropping items even have different sounds now, which is like, again, just like who there's such a basic thing you didn't have to redo that like picking up iron plates and coal i don't know it's just so even from minute one when you're just filling your burner drills you already have new sounds hitting your ears and you notice them it's really cool advanced volume control so now you can uh have some advanced volume control properties sounds great those are all soundy things uh they'll talk about music in the later ffs all right, where we're at, we're 20, 24 FFFs in two hours. All right, we're doing we're doing good, I think. Yeah, exactly. Pocket dread. The small touches or uh, deset. Yes, the small touches make big differences and sound design is so important for it to feel good to play. And I think they're just they're proving they're putting their money where their mouth is with this paragraph from the this was the first FFF after the announcement mind you so it's kind of like setting the tone for the entire development cycle because the announcement is kind of a special FFF this was like the first standard FFF and the very first paragraph in here is saying I know you're mainly looking forward to the new content and that just quality of life improvements aren't the kind of things to make people buy the game and get excited for but I strongly believe that if you want to add content mechanics and systems to a game, which already isn't simple, 
as in the game isn't simple. Vanilla Factorio is already complicated. There is a risk of it just being too much. By doing quality of life improvements, we reduce the small hassles and annoyances, which effectively creates an extra mental space to enjoy more in the game. It's like cleaning your room before getting a new toy. I just, I love that mentality. I think it's such a, a correct mentality to do game development with. I think a lot of devs skip over that and they add a bunch of crap, but they don't add ways to deal with that crap for your brain. And then the game feels like it's too much. Um, anyway, love it. Love it. Uh, FNEI, wait, have we gotten to FNEI? Oh, okay, you were talking about the next one. Yeah, so 397, another big feature that like, again, like did they need this? No, I mean, they would argue, yes, we needed it because to, to meet all the things we wanted for our game, we wanted this, but like they could have sold Space Age without this feature altogether and people would have bought it and loved it. So it's just like yet another touch that makes Wooba amazing. So yeah, this certainly counts as a kill uh, for recipe book. Um, now, another note is that Rygard was working for Wooba at this point. So like he did say though, I believe, I hope I'm not leaking information here that's not supposed to be leaked, but I think he said that Factoriopedia was developed separately from his recipe book. So even though he works for Wuba and he developed recipe book, which is even mentioned here, I don't think he was the one that created the base concept for Factoriopedia and built it in the first place. But it is obviously very similar. Uh, yeah, you said that on the podcast. That's what it was. You're right. Um, okay, so anyway, Factoriopedia is basically a recipe book. It's a place to go and look at all your items, all of your recipes, all of your st like what stats the items and recipes have, which is really cool because there are stats that they show here that like you might not see on the tooltip. Um, I'm not sure if they show a good example of that. <clears throat> you know, planets give you information on the solar power. This is interesting because it's telling us that planets are only connected to certain other planets. So you can go from Vulcanus to Nalvis or Vulcanus to Gleba, but not Vulcanus to Fulgora, right? And so that's interesting. Exclusive recipes. So I presume these are recipes that they're telling you you get by going to and doing that planet stuff. Um, if an item has alternative recipes, they're also shown. So that's a new thing for Factorio is alternative recipes. I guess cold liquefaction was technically an alternative recipe before for oil, but pretty m very few things had alternative recipes previously in Factorio. Pretty much everything was one to one. And there's a lot more now in in vanilla. Uh, and by that, I mean Space Age. I, I should say in unmodded Factorio, there's a lot more of that now. Um, oh, and here it shows you like the different quality effects. So look at this. Look at this glorious chart here. Oh, 28 by 28 substations. Ah, it's going to be amazing. Uh, I love power poles having more reach. I don't know why because it's not that hard to build power poles, but for whatever reason, having a bigger power pole area is one of my favorite things that mods do. So I'm very excited to have that. And here, this is a, a big deal. You can alt left click practically anything and it will take you to the Factoriopedia page. So kind of like um, F, not FNEI. Uh, what's the Minecraft one called? JEI or NEI? Now you can easily click from in the game to get to the Factoriopedia. So, uh, yeah, that's going to be great. And there's a browse history. So you can hit alt left arrow and alt right arrow to go back and forth to other things. So, yeah, pretty freaking excited about that. This system, um, was expanded to include Factoriopedia, Technology GUI, Blueprint Library, Train Overview, and many others. So there's just way more like unification of different systems together. It's going to be really great. Yeah, Dusk, it's, it certainly is something that will work well for mods too um, because it kind of, yeah, it's all just generated based on the prototypes in the game. 
I mean, I think I can say that pretty confidently, even though I don't know it for a fact. <laughs> so if it's not that, I think everyone would be going WTF. So I'm sure it's that. <clears throat> All right, Fulgora. On to the next. Let me drink some more tea. And by the way, someone asked me, I don't remember who you were at the beginning of the stream. So like two hours ago now. Um, what time I'm streaming on Monday? Space Age. And it will be... I, it kind of depends. I want to make sure I get good sleep. So it'll be between like 8 and 9 a.m. Eastern, which will be somewhere in the noon to 1 range UTC. The embargo drops at noon UTC, which would be exactly 8 a.m. my time. I might not quite be ready to go by then, but it'll be within that first hour. Um, and I'll be streaming for 12 hours on Monday. It's going to be a long day. I've got some snacks and food planned. And we might have to take a few, you know, small-ish breaks, but we will be doing 12 hours. I will be recording um, 40 to 60 minute segments of that to create a YouTube series, you know, like one, two, three, four, five, all the way through the playthrough. And we'll be streaming it live here on YouTube Live and on Twitch. So kind of what I'm doing now, basically I'll be doing for that. It's the same as what I did for Satisfactory. So I'll be doing 12 hours on Monday, 12 hours on Tuesday, and then I will also stream on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, but not a full 12 hours on those days. Then I have some busyness on the weekend and then I'll be back to streaming the next week. So we'll be we'll be getting some progress done pretty quick there. And I also plan to make some tips and tricks videos um, probably towards the end of that first week. I'll be looking to make like a video that'll be like, hey, what are some spoiler free things? you know, to know about your space age playthrough before you start. Cause I think, I think that sort of video is helpful. I think people are looking for that and spoiler free would be like not going into details on the mechanics of each planet, but kind of just like focusing on what's changed about now this, what's changed about this early process. What are some, some things you might not know if you've been avoiding the FFFs that you might want to know. So we'll want to be kind of collecting and collating that information in the first hours to use for a video later. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> Aylor, you look forward to get it. Yes, yes, the name in game redemption on Twitch. You can get your name in concrete. There'll be a lot of those. I think Fulgora looks the coolest, despite not being a lava plant. I, do, I think the lava looks really neat. There's something about the sandy, oil, dry, Martian, desert looking thing that I just think is really dope. And the lightning is really cool. So I think Fulgora is my favorite planet visually so far from the teasers. And just the idea of like lightning rods and absorbing, you know, lightning to get energy. I think that's really neat. The alien ruins seem like a cool touch, but it seems that they're more fluff than they are lore. Um, but yeah, um, so here's those scrap fields. This is the ore that you actually mine on Fulgora, which we get into here in the next um the next FFF, so you need lightning rods to not get wrecked. Damage and frequency boosted for demonstration purposes here. Um, so yeah, they, they highlight the protection of lightning rods and basically the ruins have some like pre-built lightning rods for you in the early game, which is neat. And then you can collect uh, energy in your own lightning rods, kind of like accumulators. It says you'll need a solid amount of accumulators to store the energy. So I assume they actually act as generators rather than accumulators. So you need the accumulators to hoover up all the energy from the lightning. Um, so that's sweet. And then you can only build on these islands. So it's very much like a freight forwarding style, small island uh, setup. You know, you're not just going to be able to build your whole base in one square on Fulgora, which I think is neat. So train networks are the norm because you can do the elevated rails over the, the ocean things. Um, and then here we go. There's the scrap mining. And this is super cool because you unlock the recycler on Fulgora, which means you won't be able to do recycling loops for quality prior to Fulgora. 
So a lot of people will probably want to go to Fulgora first to get their quality recycling loops going. You can still get quality before Fulgora. You just you only get the like roulette upgrade. You can't do the recycling loop. So like you can still hope to get uncommon green circuits by putting quality modules in your green circuit makers, but you won't be able to recycle the green circuits to try again, basically. Can you do elevated rails over lava? I don't think so, but I don't know. Uh, do you need accumulators with capacity to soak the lightning hit? I mean, I assume so. So I assume if, if there are light, oh, you mean if there was a lightning strike and you had your accumulators full, it would actually damage things? I don't think that's the case. I think you just lose the energy. I don't think it, uh, has any problems but yeah here's the scrap recipe so i mean <laughs> you just get free blue chips um one thing i've seen people call this is a is an upside down tech tree so actually like blue chips are cheap on fulgora and what's expensive are like iron plates because what you have to do is you have to recycle the gear wheels to get iron plates or recycle the advanced circuits and processing units to get green circuits so it's weird because like you're overflowing with these expensive things, but under under provided with these cheaper things, it's really cool. And yeah, Vatamouse, I agree. The way these belts look is so cool. Just filled with like random items. It looks like a sushi belt, but it's not a sushi belt because it's actually just the scrap recycling. Super neat. I'm really excited by Fulgora. I could see myself going to Fulgora before Vulcanus. Um, however, I really hate cliffs. And I hope Troopin was right on the podcast when he was saying that the new cliffs are basically like almost you don't even need to destroy them because they're so easy to work with. Uh, I hope that's how I feel, but we'll see. And then Holmium is a unique resource on Fulgora. And you use that to uh, make electrolyte superconductors and supercapacitors. And you get the electromagnetic science pack as your final pack. And then the equivalent to the foundry, which is the thing to make better metals, is the, uh, what's this called? Electromagnetic plant. And we use this to make uh, circuits more cheaply. And again, we have a built-in productivity bonus of 50%. And now we have five module slots in this bad boy. So, you know, the final productivity you can get is going to be 175% because it's 25% per module. We're, we're talking legendary prod three modules. So yeah, you're going to be able to make circuits a lot more cheaply with these bad boys. Uh, I like that. Th I like that they're four by four machines. So, you know, you, the sizes are different and, and all that. Uh, Fulgora is when you unlock quality module threes as well. So in terms of quality, I think Fulgora is kind of the main planet, right? Like, because before Ful going to Fulgora, not only do you not have recyclers, but you can't make quality module threes. So it's going to be a big upgrade to your quality systems once you've gone to Fulgora. Not to mention the electromagnetic plant itself helps you make modules more cheaply. So yeah, it's a big deal. Big deal. Yeah, 170. Did I not say 175%? I think I said 175%. Even better than Summer Sloops and Satisfactory. That's, that's very true. It's very true. Although not quite because prod, mod, prod mods in Factorio will detract speed and add power. Um, whereas in Satisfactory, they do not detract speed. They do add power, but not a ton. Um, but yeah, anyway, you make a lot of stuff on Fulgora. We'll we'll see. I I'm kind of I'm not trying to read every single detail about like every single thing. Um quality means you can make platforms smaller. So here they're talking about like space platforms basically get upgraded a lot with higher quality stuff. So Fulgora kind of helps your space platforms. So that's an interesting interesting thing. Um We'll talk about Gleba here in a bit, but I need to take another quick break and use the restroom. I'm drinking all this delicious green tea, uh, but that has a cost. <laughs> so I'll be right back. 
And we'll keep going with number 400. We've only got 30 more. 33 more, but who's counting? All right. So yeah, because basically the planets have killed maybe some content mods, right? But not quality of life mods. There's a lot of content mods that had similar ideas to some of the stuff on planets, and I'm not really counting those. So on to the next one, charts, search, and pens. Ooh, this is, I know we're gonna kill a quality of life mod here. Um, so, control F, now finds anything. So it will literally search the map for buildings that are making an item. It'll search the map for um, that thing itself. So if you're trying to find laser turret, well, actually, wait. Does it not search? Hmm. I actually don't know. OK, the production search searches for where you're producing that item. But there's other kinds of searches too. You can search map tags, you can search train stops. Does this not search the actual building? So this this may be a soft kill on, on factory search mod because factory search can also search for items in chests. It can also search for the entity itself. If I'm like, wait, I can't find where I put my, uh, where, did I build, not where am I crafting electromagnetic plants, but where actually are the electromagnetic plants? You can do that in factory search. And you can also search for where that item is in a recipe rather than just where it is being produced. So it, I'm not sure, factory search, soft kill. <laughs> I don't know if it's completely killed by this, but it certainly is in the same category and you know, some of it's now in. Um, and yeah, some of the, I'm sure, so Sviplet is mentioning that some of these may have been improved and modified because it's been a while and the devs have continued to work on these quality of life features too, especially the ones that are modifiable. Ooh, here's a, here's a new, new resource here. Look at that. I wonder what that was. But yeah, pens are now a thing. Um, so you can pen a search result. Every pen shows you its location on the screen or when off screen. So yeah, car. Uh, who was it? Yeah, car finder. It's not censored. That's just what it looks like in the game. <laughs> LOL. Um, that's funny. Also, I just realized we're like just slightly too small. Okay, so we have also murderized car finder slash where's my car. I think that was another one. I think there were multiple mods that did that. One of them even had the little boop boop, like the chirp sound that, you know, your car keys do. Um, a list of pins right under your mini map. Interesting. I don't know how I feel about that. I hope you can... I would hope you can pin something, but also not have it listed. Listed. Hmm. We have tags and pins. Is this too much? Map tags, pings, and also pins. Um, pings are more of a multiplayer thing. Oh, a new alert GUI. That's nice. So now when you click on an alert, it opens the alert overview. That's super handy, especially now that we have multiple surfaces going on to see like which alerts are in which spots and what exactly are the alerts about. You know, missing materials for construction is a very different alert than like, you know, power being off or your own custom alerts from the alarm things. So... That'll be nice. Oh, here's the one we've already, I've already, I mentioned this multiple times by now, but now this um, is changed in a lot of new ways. Uh, Arendelle improved a lot of stuff. Dunes look better. Um, he has his 14 dimensional terrain generation algorithm that he made better. Um, the cliff system, this was the old system, which we were lamenting. I was just, playing a death world and we were basically talking about how this is actually really annoying because in the game what you want to do is build a wall from here to here to block the biters right let's assume your base is in the middle so you want to wall this off 
the cliffs are not helping you with that at all, right? Because the cliffs are actually going perpendicular to the wall that you want to make. And so it's actually very frustrating to end up trying to work with the cliffs in the old generation. Often it gets in the way twice, exactly. Um, and so now instead, uh, he actually kind of goes through some stuff. So let me try to find... The main plan was to make a small number of cliff, small number of long cliffs. Um, blah blah blah. Debug visualization of cliff plateaus. Added rivers. Uh, River-like formation. Canyon-like formation. Uh, yada yada. So now there's a water slider. Um, minimum amount of Water is almost all land, but there are occasional small lakes. Um, this is max water. Oh, here's min water versus max water. A dead end. Sometimes you'd hit a dead end where water would be in between. Yeah, nov novice, novice, novice. Uh... I think I just say now, now this, now. Is that what I say? I think I say multiple things. I hear people say it lots of different ways. Here's a path through the forest, but blocked by cliffs. So basically, he fixed all this. Um, so now there's basically a path always. There's just natural pathways through forests, and you won't randomly get stopped by cliffs, and now cliffs... Here you can see like connecting this water to this water. There's a cliff that actually and forests that kind of naturally help you with that. Um, map at 25% scale makes it hard to see things. But if you zoom in, you can see that the cliffs feel much more helpful. Like right here, you can see this. This cliff is actually going to help you defend this choke point. Right. Or you can just ignore it and go straight across. But like you could use the cliff and have two smaller choke points here and here. Um, these cool canyons are a thing now. Yeah. So all this to say, I'm and forests are not just, I actually really like, I might like this change more than the cliff change because trees were really annoying before in that, you had to drive around a forest. There was never a way to drive through a forest, but now they kind of make it so that you can drive through a forest. So really excited for this one. Um, I do feel bad for the people who are not starting fresh, but they they made a base that they're gonna start out with to kind of like a pre-base for Space Age. They're not gonna get to experience this. So that that is a downside to having a pre-made base. Ooh, here's one. Here's one for sure, uh, as in a kill, quality of life mod killed. Uh, radar transmission. So now you can transmit uh, circuitry on radars. There's a single radar channel for each surface, still separated between red and green. There's no configuration to that. Um, so that's a thing. Cutting wires. Oh, oh, when you like cut paste um, combinators, now the wire connections actually stay if if you're within range, which is so cool. Um, but yeah, so what which, what's it called? Radar, is it just called radar transmission? What was it? Circuit transmission? I don't actually remember the name of the mod. It was the one that you got with uh, space exploration. Signal transmission. Thank you. Fix that. Um, yeah, well, one thing, do, do they mention it in here? Does it have a one tick delay? Like going through a combinator has a one tick delay? I'm curious. Um, did they say there's a way to transmit between surfaces? Maybe. Uh, 
Um, oh, here they're talking about fixing the productivity bug that existed forever in, in vanilla, where if your productivity bar was filling more than one time per tick, it would only consume the ingredients of one craft, but the productivity would actually loop around multiple times in one tick. So you would essentially get more productivity bar fillings than you should get, um, but that's fixed now. So that's great. Uh, but yeah, I don't... So signal transmission is not entirely dead because you guys are right. Um, this is a soft kill. Basically, there's some functionality added of it, but not the full functionality because yeah, we now we now can do on one planet, but not between planets. And there's not channels, which again, like most of the time isn't going to matter, but in certain cases it will. Uh, yeah, on to page three. All right, train stops 2.0. I don't even I'm like clicking on these. and I'm like, what is this even about? I don't we've already talked about all the train stop stuff. <laughs> Apparently not. Uh, train stop GUI showing on the way trains. OK, that's nice. Train naming and train limit. Oh, no, you named the stop before setting the train limit. Um, when I set the name of a stop, I want it to copy the limit and color from an existing stop with that name. So setting the name will copy the limit and color from an existing stop. Okay, so when you just click on that, it copies what those already are. And it will pick the existing stop with the lowest limit. Nice. Um, what if I set the limit before naming the stop? Then it will just keep that limit that you set, which is wonderful. And this, so this is a good example. I'm going to slightly digress into talking game dev stuff for a minute. This is a good example of devs actually implementing use case rather than just saying what, what I see a lot of people say when I sit. So this happens a lot when I'm streaming and I'm complaining about a game feature. And then I say like, ah, the game should handle this better. And then people in the comments will say, yeah, but what if the limit was, what if you set the limit first or something? And like, I think a lot of users forget that like games can handle things complexly com with complexity, like games can handle things differently. Like if you already set the limit, it just won't override what you set. But if you haven't set the limit, it will go with whatever the, you know, accumulator drop stop has by default. And this is a good example of like games can do things like that. And I think sometimes people forget that complex solutions can actually really help the player quality of life wise. Now, the the risk with doing this is it's kind of complex behavior. There might be players who change the name and they're like, wait, why? Why sometimes does it set the train limit and other times it doesn't? Right. And in this case, it's because, well, it's not overriding the train limit because you set the train limit already. Now, the player may not know that that's what's happening and then they get confused. And that's the risk with complex behavior. But it's really, really helpful complex behavior because it it kind of captures both use cases perfectly. A lot of the time you want it to copy the train limit from what your other stops already have. That's probably nine out of ten times or more. But once in a while, you're going to set the train limit to 10 and then you want to change it to be an accumulator drop and you want that train limit to stay at 10 or zero and it'll do that. So it's like you're getting the best of both worlds at the cost of some complexity that the player might get confused by. Um, so, yeah, all that to say, like, it's a really good system and I think it just goes to show that, like, Wuba isn't scared to be a little confusing if it means it's going to add a huge amount of quality of life to the player. I will say that uh, someone was asking earlier, who was it? It's, I don't know how far up it was. They were asking if there's a tutorial. Yeah, Kling is king. You were saying, do you know if there's a tutorial for Space Age? No and yes. The tips and tricks have been revamped extensively. So there are tips and tricks for a lot of these things in the game now. I don't know if there's I don't know which things there are tips and tricks for, but most things have tips and tricks now. So there's a lot of reading now that players might have to do. 
and they're not going to want to do it. Anyway, uh, the train stop name is shown when you're hovering over it on the map, even if you don't have all the names turned on. <clears throat> oh yeah, some of them even are playable in the, that's really cool. Uh, shows an incoming path. So if you hover over a stop, it'll show the trains that are on the way to that and their path. You can just copy paste right on the map. That's super nice. Um, you can rename all stops at the same time that share a name to a new name. That's really nice. <laughs> you can manually push a locomotive if you're stuck on elevated rails. Uh, Flintstone style. I love that. So you can also manually push a wagon. I feel like there's going to be some challenge that somebody's going to do where like you have to play the entire game with unfueled locomotives or something horrible like that. You can drive remotely, which is wonderful. Um, so now when you're in remote view, you can get your trains out of a stuck situation remotely. And Rail Planner works in, works in the map mode. Here's a good example of those half diagonals. I am curious if we will be able to set. We probably won't be able to. So here, here's an example of like, I'm not sure if I love the new half diagonals. Visually, I think I'd prefer if my trains would use right angles. I know this is technically a shorter distance, but it just looks kind of not clean. So I think in a lot of cases, it's like I want a straight line and then do a right angle turn and then a straight line and then do a right. Like I'd prefer that in most cases. Like obviously, if you're going a really long distance diagonally, I don't mind a long diagonal to save a lot of distance. But in terms of like hypotenuse savings, you're not saving very much distance here in terms of the total train path. And so I, I think in this case, type of case, I'd actually rather just have right angles, have the train go a few meters further, but it looks nice. Um, but you can always just not, yeah, you can just use the rail pl planner to build straight lines too. So it's still fine. I think it'd be nice if you could set the rail planner, kind of like the new satisfactory tool, like you could change modes to just have right angle mode. Um, yeah, the way shape as to, does there like you can like pin as you're building a line you can like hit, what was it control where you could like go straight hit control then go straight and it would plan from there to there and then from there to the next one and you can kind of pin where you're building so you can build a long path with one click that is actually really cool so also super force building for the rail planner crusading over lakes is easier than ever nice Nice, nice, nice. Uh, did did we kill anything in here? Renaming train stops. Uh, I don't know of any quality of life mods that did all of that. Remote driving of trains might have been one. Was there a remote driving? I don't know. Uh, Conblem, uh, you're probably right. I just like to call it Shapez because it's spelled with a Z and I like to pronounce it like it sounds like it has a Z. <laughs> so... That's uh, maybe a wrong choice. To be fair, I've never heard the devs pronounce it, so maybe it is shape as. Uh, anyway. Probably not DSUT as far as changing the settings of the rail planner. I'm guessing it's all just the same for everybody. All right, RTS tool. This one certainly was a mod. Uh, I forget exactly its name, though. What was it? Spidertron Remote or something like that. I used it for my freight forwarding Crastorio 2 run, and it was something in that category that now we have most of that functionality allowed with the RTS tool, and it has... I, I mean, maybe it still can't do all the things. This might be another soft kill. I I honestly don't know the mod versus what vanilla did versus what now the game does all together. I don't know the changes, but. But now you can just control them like 
they called it the RTS tool because it works like an RTS, right? You select your you select your units, you move them to a spot. Easy as pie. Um, you can save your selections on the hotbar. Uh, I don't like that they're not colored differently. They used to be colored differently. But yeah, now you don't need to have just one leader who, yeah, takes all the heat from the worms shooting them. Uh, pipette works in more places now. Recipe slots, logistic slots, inventory slots, all the slots. Placeable tiles like concrete, landfill, platform foundation can be pipetted. Water, lava, and oil can be pipetted to get the pump. Beautiful. Easier blueprint grid adjustment. Hey, Mandy Dax, thank you so much for the sub. Hello, hello. Uh, so wait, what did they change here? Oh, you can nudge. You've got nudging, like in Satisfactory now. Um, so you can quick adjust the blueprint grid offsets. Shift plus arrow keys adjust the grid position. Control plus arrow keys adjust the absolute offset. Now, does that actually save back into the blueprint? Or does it only change it for this placing of it? I'm actually not sure, but man, this is a huge... If it saves back into the blueprint, that is top notch because then you don't have to um, manually set those numbers and then see if it fits and then go back, change the numbers, see if it fit. I assume it saves back into the blueprint. Otherwise, this feature wouldn't make very much sense. It's amazing. Really is amazing. Uh, have I played the Ultra Cube overhaul? Chris, yes and no. I started a series that was like an edited series, kind of experimenting with editing. Um, didn't get very far because I had other stuff going on and I didn't have enough time for it. But I do plan to revisit Ultra Cube at some point, though I don't know what it'll look like with the expansion. Ooh, here we are, whole belt reader. Uh, we were talking about that before. <sighs> so, uh, someone said there was a mod that did this. What's the mod called? I never used it, but this will clearly kill whatever mod that is. Man, I, this is such a huge change, by the way. Being able to read a whole section of belts allows for sushi to be so much easier because um, you don't have to actually connect up every single belt segment, but you can just read the whole science loop and you can just easily read how many, I mean, look at this, and it looks nice and clean, and you can just easily read how many purple packs and how many yellow packs and just easily let your... your uh, your science stuff do sushi. I am curious, <clears throat> like you'll still want to do it in such a way that you would never be in a situation, at least I wouldn't want it to be in a situation where purple packs, there's enough purple packs on the whole belt, but like there might be a long stretch with zero purple packs and then one of my science labs ends up running out of purple packs. You know, like I wouldn't want that to happen. So I'll have to think about how to how to make that work, but Blood Belts, that is a weird name. Oop, wrong window. Uh, but we have killed the Blood Belts mod. Beautiful. All right. Yeah, Ultra Cube with new combinators, also with these new belt readings, there's gonna be way, way, way more options. I am curious, does this have a limit on like length of belt? It'll read all the belts in the same transport line as the belt being read. It survives going through undergrounds, is broken by splitters, and side loading onto another belt. But what if your belt is like 3,000 belts long? Does it, is it just legit read the whole thing? I don't think so. Yeah, seems like there's no limit. Sviplet confirms there is no limit. Wow. I wonder if they should limit it like the, like the fluid network's now limited to... Uh, 250 or whatever. I wonder if they should do the same with whole belt reading. Uh, what is this? Oh, oh, this is a new category. Sorry, I, I thought we were still in the same category and I got confused. <laughs> so faster rocket launches. This is super nice. Um, rockets, if there is a, a crafted rocket already done by the time, or no, it doesn't even need to do that. It can buffer an extra rocket so it can keep crafting 
even before you've launched one. And if the second one is already done, if there's another one ready to go, it won't close the door and then have to reopen it. So that's going to speed up, you know, uh, I keep trying to say consequential. That's not the word, though. What's the word? It's been two and a half hours. Give me a break. Uh, consecutive. Consecutive rocket launches. I beat, I beat chat. They didn't have to tell me. I assumed with delay, there's going to be five comments coming in now that are going to say consecutive. Um, anyway. Oh, you guys are saying sequential. That's not the word I was looking for. So go me, I guess. Or I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that's a success for me or fail for you or both. Uh, anyway, pump filters. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Uh, it can be annoying to get some train mixed up and they dump a whole bunch of lubricant into your crude oil inputs. So now we can filter pumps, so they only will pump that filter. So now um, sushi fluids are much more doable. Though this is, this is an FFF that's long before the FFF about the fluid rework. Uh, I haven't spent time thinking about if sushi fluids make more or less sense now with these two things combined. I think they still make, they make more sense now because it's easier to drain a whole network of pipes with the new system. So I actually think a sushi, sushi fluid network is far more possible than before. Uh, yeah, sweet, sweet, sweet. I want the game with one belt and one pipe. Uh, no thanks. What is this? Look at this ancient. Point fifteen. What's crazy is like I played back then. I don't remember it looking like this. It's crazy how how much they've improved the GUIs over time. Yeah, this is another one that like every time I use the logistic network display, it really was underwhelming. And as much as the GUI looks better than this, the system itself isn't any better than this. So not being able to show, here's their different iterations. What did they finally settle on? Now you can select your different networks, see the different items and the members. It shows you where the network or the robo ports are for that network. So much nicer now. Ooh, good idea, Dave. Thank you. Put, uh, put sushi fluids on my trying stuff list. Sushi fluids. Let's put let's, this list is is sad. Let's make it happier. Recycling loop for rare stuff ASAP. We want we want to bog down our entire playthrough in trying to get rare wooden power poles. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Probably other things too. All right, sweet. So yeah, new logistics GUI is nice. Um, there may be a mod that this killed, though I'm not sure. You can rename your logistics networks now. Nice. Sweet, sweet. Okay. 406. Ooh, 406 and 7 are very different and yet very exciting. So there, I don't have a ton to say in these, so we'll just look through the pictures, other than like they've redone the music, and it is really cool that they've redone the music and, and not just redone, but added music for each planet. So... That's really cool. Um, there's space music, there's Vulcanist music. We can listen to a little bit of it here. Let me turn this up a little bit. Yes, this is when Aquilo was spoiled. This one sounds Lord of the Ringsy to me. They add in some of those sci-fi sounds, but it feels a little Lord of the Ringsy. This one feels very Lord of the Ringsy, I remember. Frodo in space. Yeah. 
Fulgora is very techno. I like it. Yeah, it is a little funky. The other two planets. I assume this is Gleba. So cool. Hey, Marinza, thanks for the follow. Um, yeah, that might have been the, the Aquilo one. Yeah, so the Aquilo, for those uh, not knowing what we're talking about, it's in this picture. Uh, can I zoom in? Maybe if I open it in a new tab. Yeah, so right here, we can see right there, Aquilo. So, yeah, every surface has an hour of soundtrack, and, and there are these new, ba 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 automating soundtrack. There are these new interlude variable music tracks that now they add in between the actual recorded, like, real songs there are now kind of like robo dj songs uh super cool and super scary uh, some people raised a concern about this that i echoed and i have yet to experience it in game so this is something to kind of keep my ear out for but there's this question of familiarity right music is familiar when you when you have when you have your music, I've played plenty of games with dynamic music, first of all, where like, oh, you get in combat and it kind of shifts the the music from like the ambient music to combat music, uh, you know, like Total Annihilation style. That's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is they actually are combining different like samples, basically, you know, where like, oh, this bass riff with this horn riff or whatever and this drum riff and it's combining those into like one thing that lasts 40 seconds and then it like remixes it slightly for the next 40 seconds and then it does a couple other things and you end up with like three minutes of a track that was really never made by anybody right it was mixed together like robo dj style which is really cool right like i'm not against the idea at all but the, the fear or concern is that it's never familiar. It's always just, it's sort of familiar, but it's sort of different. And it's always a little bit uncomfortable because you can never settle in to the fear, like, like oh, I know this track, right? Like, because right now with the soundtrack that's in the game, it's just a sequence of tracks and you know each one of them after you've played hundreds of hours of the game and each one feels at home in your ears. So it's it's really interesting to think about what are these tracks going to do to kind of the feeling that you get when you're playing the game and listening. Because there will be the tracks that you memorize and know, the ones that are recorded, you know, the hour or so on each planet. And then there's going to be these tracks. And I'm just curious what it's going to feel like. I don't know yet. I, I can't really predict it. Um, but I certainly will have music on in the game to experience it. And eventually I did get to the point with Vanilla Factorio where I turned off the music and I would play something with more variety because... For me, I actually really liked the Factorio music. It just wasn't a long enough track. I needed more. Like, if you're going to play a game for that many hours, it needs to have a longer track than, like, what is it? An hour and a half right now? I don't even know. It's not a very long total amount of music, and it just it loops too much in the sense that there's not enough variety in those hour and a half for a game that you play this much. So... Having a five more hours of music, so now we have over six hours of actual tracks for the game, mixed with this new Robo DJ thing. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Let's listen. This one's also very big. I don't know if I like how big it sounds. I'm 
guessing this is Vulcanus, by the way. I'm not sure. Yeah, you can hear as they go through, they add different pieces in or they change one piece out. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I agree, Sviplet. I, I think it's certainly cool I, as to whether it ends up working out. For me, I'm not sure. I think it will. I'm leaning towards I think I'll like it. Uh, whether it works out for everybody, I definitely think there will be people who don't like it. Um, also, yes, that was a work in progress, so I'm sure it's gotten better in various ways. But yeah, I, I'm interested to see kind of both how I feel about it and I'm interested to see what the community kind of tends to feel about it, where the where the hive mind ends up going up or going to. So, yeah, the music stuff is super interesting to me. Excited to see how that develops. <sighs> All right, let me take a breath. How's everybody doing? You guys having a good day? I'm certainly having a good day. We're, what, 36 hours and change away from space age? That's pretty exciting. All right, now to water. All right, so here they talk about production graphs. I was literally complaining about production graphs. Um on my death world, I are in the electric network graph. I am fearful that my concerns have not been addressed. One problem is they don't give you the total. You, there's no button you can press on the graph to get total. They don't mention that anywhere in this FFF. Um, basically, they've added per surface production and per quality production. Um, so that's nice. You can check to global statistics, but that's meaning like all the planets added together, not totals. You don't need totals for production, but you do need totals for power. And so on the power graph, there's no way to just see the graph of my total power production or usage. And the other thing I was complaining about is there's no way to see your production minus what's been uh, charging your accumulators. Because accumulator charge, in a way, is not really production, right? Like if you're producing an extra 10 megawatts from your solar panels right now, that's going into charging the accumulators, that's really just gonna end up discharging later. So that 10, at least right now, it looks like your base is consuming 10 more megawatts than it really is. So you can't accurately see what your base's usage is yeah, it's production. You're producing that power, but you're not using that power for anything. It's net neutral on usage. And so if you're just wanting to know like, oh, how much how much power is my base using right now? You can't actually see that while your accumulators are charging. You, can, you can't be like, oh, uh, because what you would have to do is you'd have to look at your accumulator rate and subtract that from whatever this number is to actually get your base's usage. And that's made even more difficult if you have modded accumulators or different things that are doing an accumulator type thing or different qualities of accumulators. It's all just kind of like annoying to not be able to see what your base usage is. And there's no way to do that with the current system. And as far as I can tell, this FFF doesn't address that. And the other thing you can't do is just see your total. If I just want to look at 10 minutes and see my average power consumption over the last 10 minutes, I cannot do that. It's ridiculous. If I hit 10 minutes, I can see all of the buildings and each of their individual average usages over the last 10 minutes, but there's no total for that. And what's weird is the graphs up here are always live. They're never referring to the timestamped time. The timestamps only affect the stuff down here. So I've always felt like it's a little weird. Like I wanna know how much power I'm using on average over 10 minutes, not like this millisecond. Um, so that's always felt a little weird to me too that we can't see average power usage totals. I don't know. That feels like a pretty pretty standard functionality that you might want to know about your base, especially and again, you know, modded playthroughs, they didn't make the game for modded playthroughs, but I've certainly needed that more in mods, especially mods where power is a whole different animal like Nullius. 
and I don't know. Doesn't seem like they're adding it. They do add a science, uh, final science production, which is cool. Um, This track science pack consumption, and I guess it does factor in productivity. I don't actually still, I don't quite understand. So it's saying the pack consumption does not account for things like productivity modules and the new research. So is this tracking like your actual effective science researched, I guess? So if you have 10% productivity and you're consuming 100 packs a minute, it'll actually give you the 110 that you're actually like producing towards the tech tree, I guess. Uh, but yeah, per surface production is very nice, obviously. Uh, stuff about Linux. Uh, if you care about Linux, go read this. I, I don't know anything about Linux. Um, nor do I really understand what most of this is. So we're going to skip on past that. Asynchronous saving. That is one sad thing. You are blessed. If you play Linux, you get to have non-blocking saving, which is so cool. You have to go into the secret settings. It's control alt and then you click control. You hold control and alt. You click the settings button and you get um, the rest. And there you get secret settings, which most of them are not that useful for people who aren't on Windows or Linux or Mac. Uh, you get the asynchronous saving if you're on Linux or Mac. If you're on Windows, the, the most useful one that I've found in this list of settings is the number of auto saves rather than just the default, which is I don't even know what the default is. I pumped it up to 40. So my game keeps 40 auto saves, and that means I'm never going to accidentally lose auto saves of something uh, that I really care about. Yeah, three is the default. That is not enough for me. 40 sounds nice. Um, obviously if my saves get very large, that could be a problem, but yeah, there you go. There's 408, 409. Ooh, this is a big one. So beacons, beacons and vanilla. What a contentious, uh, topic for factorians versus beacons in space exploration. So those who don't know beacons in space exploration essentially are mutually exclusive with each other. You can only have one beacon affecting a building. If two beacons uh, are in range of one building, that building turns off and it won't work until you separate the beacons so that only one beacon is affecting things. <clears throat> and there were many people on both ends of this argument, which is probably still not over to this day. It's kind of like a, you know, which camp are you in question? Because the nice thing about it was it meant you have to build less beacons. You're mostly building assemblers, but it's kind of like this picture here, but inverted, right? Now you just have one beacon and then you put your buildings around that beacon and it ends up feeling at the end of the day, functionally pretty similar to, um, to vanilla, it's just that you have fewer beacons. You're still building some grid of assemblers and beacons. You just have fewer beacons in there. So at the end of the day, a lot of people were really hoping that they would change to the space exploration style where you could only have one beacon affecting buildings. I'm personally glad they didn't because I don't think that it ended up changing that much. You just would you would still grid things in lines. You would just have one beacon every so often. In fact, someone just posted uh, a save uh, on Reddit the other day of their space exploration base. It was like an ultra mega base, like 10,000 SPM or something. Or no, no, it was their vanilla base, but they used the SE style beacons mod. And it looked cool, but it was still just lines of assemblers and they just had a beacon every so often so that all the buildings had the one beacon affecting them. So it's like at the end of the day, you're, do you're doing lines of buildings either way. It's just fewer beacons. Um, which I admit, if you prefer that, that's totally fine. You can prefer that. I just didn't find it to be a functionally like gameplay different vibe. But what they did here is very interesting. So let's actually talk about the FFF. What they did is rather than saying you can only have one beacon affecting a building, they added diminishing returns. They talk about like 
what are the different ways people actually build in vanilla. There's the 12 beacon way and there's the eight beacon way. Um, they talk about the beacon overload from Arendelle's mod space exploration. They say it feels fresh at first. Um, the problem is there's not much flexibility in the beacon arrangements. So you basically just put them in a grid anyway, and it's not that much more interesting than the base game. So they basically say kind of, I, I basically was just saying what they summarized here, which is it doesn't end up changing that much. So instead, and they talk about some other options, but what they went with was diminishing returns. So now this was what we had before. Uh, no, wait, where's the, I guess they're not really telling us basically Oh, this is the original. So this graph here on the left is saying if you had one beacon, it had the effect of one beacon. If you had two beacons, it had the effect of two beacons. What they've done now is they've pumped up the starting point to three, but then you get square root diminishing returns after that. So you need four buildings to have double the effect because the square root of four is two. You need nine buildings or nine buildings, nine beacons to have triple the effect because that's the square root of nine. So essentially, what this has done is it's massively boosted the effectiveness of small beacon builds and it's massively nerfed, but not really the effect of large amounts of beacons because, because they tripled the effect of one, even though we're square rooting things, the final effect of 16 beacons is still 12 instead of 16. And that would be for uh, like an oil cracking machine where you can actually fit 16 around it or uh, not an oil cracking. What are they called? Oil refinery uh, for like an assembler where you can only fit 12. Now the final effect is 10.4, which is a nerf, but like less than 10% of a nerf. And that's a nerf only for normal quality beacons, right? Now you can make legendary beacons and you can see here this orange line is representing that graph and that just wins out over everything. No questions asked. And you can see here is the ratio of like the beacon boost compared to what it was in the old Factorio with that number of beacons. So for example, one beacon is now 300% more effective than it was in vanilla. Two beacons are still in total 200% more effective. And those are the numbers you end up getting in your mid game base when you're like, oh, I'm sprinkling beacons into my spaghetti mess you often are only getting one to three beacons. So I, with my style of play, this is actually a buff across the board to me because I often am not getting the, you know, eight plus beacons to affect a building, but just one to four. And so this is super nice because now your one beacon with speed modules in it is actually having a large effect. Whereas before, one beacon didn't do that much, but like now one beacon is doing a lot. It's doing what three beacons did before. So I, I really like this change. It does make the late game numbers a little annoying because now they're they're not whole numbers anymore, but quality was already throwing perfect. Yeah, Dr. Katz, you mentioned perfect ratios. Perfect ratios went out the window a long time ago with quality. Between quality affecting beacons, quality affecting assemblers, quality affecting modules, and, and all of that, like, you know, combining into crazy decimals like at this point, perfect ratios are, are out the window pretty heavily. Um, you know, you can always like. You can get very close with especially with stuff like Helmod, where it's like, OK, I, I need ninety seven point nine buildings, so I'll build ninety eight of them. You can get very close, but the actual like picture perfect is not going to happen anymore unless you use exactly um, like nine beacons or 16 beacons. <laughs> That's where you get your whole numbers at. Otherwise, you ain't you ain't at a whole number. Um, yeah, and exactly, Dave, people who are min maxing are going to use their 12 beacon setups either way. And those are slightly nerfed if you're using normal quality and buffed quite heavily if you're using legendary quality. So it all works out pretty well. Um, I think people who aren't quite making room for beacons will f will feel much better about researching them and it won't feel like, oh, I have to build, I have to rebuild my entire base now so that I can fit in full rows of beacons. 
now it'll feel like, oh, yay, I can just throw, I can sprinkle some beacons in to where they fit, and that will actually make a considerable boost to my production. I really like that. So, uh, oh, and it makes them much more effective on space platforms. Look at that, that effectivity, uncommon, or no, is that rare? Yeah, those are blue. Uh, I can't actually tell. I think those are uncommon efficiency modules there. Um, Conblem, it weakens the incentive to have beacon heavy setups. Yes and no. Um, it it weakens the the difference, but you still get a lot more out of using a lot of beacons. So it's kind of like b buffing the the lower numbers of beacons still isn't weakening the higher numbers. And again, because of the the boost that they give to one beacon, you're not actually weaker until you get to nine nine is where the trade happens or no sorry wait uh is that right yeah yeah once you have more than nine beacons it's finally weaker than it used to be but that's only if you're not using higher quality beacons in the first place so essentially it's a buff all around i mean the only time it's not a buff is when you have more than nine beacons around one assembler which you don't do until ultra late game anyway at least I I don't I don't know who's doing an actual square of beacons around an assembler in the early to mid game. That's for sure. A shadow result is that a single beacon is actually stronger modules than if they're in the machine itself. Yes, that is also interesting. Oh my gosh. And here's the here's the stuff we're gonna be gonna be having fun with in a few weeks here. Hey, look at look at this. Not so fast blue blue chip making. And these are stack inserters. Those are stacked blue circuits. That they're pooping out there. That's awesome. All right, another thing. Um, the, oh, I didn't mean to open a new tab for that. But basically, they're mentioning that you can mod the uh, profile table in Lua. Basically, this is how many beacons are affecting the same building. What's the ratio of effectivity that they will have? So, you know, here you can see at the fourth entry, four beacons, they're half as effective. And that's, you know, what we saw in the table above. But it goes to a lot. Um, so mod makers can revert the change completely by making this one, 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 one. That'll just be what old vanilla was. You can make it so that if you have more than two beacons, it goes to zeros for the rest of the time. Or, yeah, exactly, Aloy. You can have zero, 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 one, zero, 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 so that you have to have exactly five beacons affecting a building, otherwise it won't work at all. Um, although I guess if you had zeros here, it wouldn't disable the assembling machine, it would just make the beacons have zero effect, which is slightly different. I'm guessing you can still do the space exploration style too with mods if you want, where you disable the assembler, uh, but that's a separate, that wouldn't be with this table. Make it negative? Ooh, I wonder if you it can handle negative values. Hmm, I'm sure modders will discover, discover that soon enough. <sighs> All right, we're on to 410, we only have 10 to 20, 20 to 30. We only have about 23 more. And we're three hours in. Okay, I'm going a little too slow. I need to pick up the pace here. Um, rocket turrets are very exciting, though. Um, I don't think I have to say too much about them. They're just cool AF. We now have rocket turrets. They look very much to me... I know they're looking like spider tron -y, but for whatever reason, in this case, they really heavily remind me of the uh, the bad things from the Matrix. Um, they can shoot any type of rocket, including atomic bombs. They have a max range of 36, improved 10% per quality level, which is huge. That makes quality turrets a big deal. Having extra range is a is a big deal. Uh, they're great for space platforms and blowing up asteroids. And then we have target priorities, which is amazing. So you can prioritize the behemoth biters above other things, which is super nice. <laughs> the pace must grow. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, being able to prioritize the, the highest health enemies with rocket turrets is super cool. Um, you know, you can have gun turrets, prioritize small biters, things like that. 
Um, yeah, sending laser turrets to prioritize spitters helped reduce the amount of damage our defenses would take. Um, you can also, this is a big deal. This is just another example of Wuba going above and beyond. So a lot of games would give you target priorities and they'd leave it at that. But then that's annoying because then you have to prioritize every single enemy in a row or you end up having enemies that don't get shot. But here you can be like, ignore the unlisted targets, meaning shoot these enemies in this order and only shoot them. Or you can not check the box and it will be shoot these enemies in this order and then everything else at willy nilly. Right. And, and so it's really nice to be able to do one or the other. Sentinels are the robot monsters from the Matrix. Thank you. Yeah, it really reminds me of Sentinels because of all the red eyes kind of in seemingly random places. And that's very much the Matrix Sentinels. Uh, so, yeah, the they do mention you can also connect turrets to circuits. You can set their priority list based on circuits, which is crazy. Um, you can also read what ammunition is in them. And then finally, the what else can you do? Uh, they mentioned artillery doesn't have target priorities, I think. I can't remember. They mentioned that somewhere. Was it here? Uh... The artillery turret also has a circuit connection, but it only has enable, disable, and ammo read. There it is. Can you read what enemies are nearby? No, you cannot. In Warp Torio, this would be really useful. Yeah, yellow ammo on the small biters, only use piercing on the large ones. Yeah, being able to use, you can disable, like you could alternate your turrets and alternate the ammo you're putting in those turrets and then have the turrets with the more expensive ammo only shoot the higher armor enemies, etc. Um, this one is an interesting read. It's very cool. It's all about how they made the asteroids look dope. Um, but at the end of the day, there's not too much to talk about other than if we were to read through the entire thing bit by bit. But it's very neat. Uh, the asteroids look very cool. I'm excited to kind of watch our space platforms float through, float through space and destroy a bunch of asteroids and collect all the little bits and bobs. So that is not, yeah. If we need to pick up the pace, that's a good one to read through quickly. <laughs> um, okay, undo and redo improvements. So redo has been requested ever since we added undo and strange pan. It was one of their first projects at Wuba. And now you can use the redo shortcut in the shortcut bar. It also lights up when there is something to redo. This one is huge. Undo information. One thing that is often super annoying and destructive is undoing actions, sometimes by accident, and something far away from a long time ago is undone. I can't tell you how many times I've done that, where I've, I, I've re I hear the sound, bloop, and I'm like, oh, crap. What what did I do last? Like, what was the last thing I did? Because I've been, you know, in the tank in hell mod for four hours trying to plan my factory and I don't remember the last thing I did. And now it's undone. Some belt just got rotated, idiot, and is now dumping coal onto a steel belt or something. So, yeah, it telling you what is undone when you undo is so nice. And then on top of that, there's a dialogue pop up if it's more than a few minutes old. Are you sure you want to undo an action? And that is just clutch. And it even shows you where it was and what you did. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, and if you hold your mouse over the undo shortcut button, it will show you what it would undo if you click it. You don't even have to click it to find out what you would undo. Oh, it's so beautiful. Yeah, really great quality of life there. Um, when you do undo, uh, it didn't actually undo everything. Yeah, Aloy, you were basically talking about this right here. So if you set blueprints with a recipe paste click, but it didn't actually build anything, it just pasted the recipes over the blueprint, 
that you couldn't undo that you couldn't undo wire creation and removal um you couldn't undo rotations you couldn't undo filters and requests and now those are all fixed so that's what that's all about then this is a multiplayer related thing but apparently i wouldn't know because i never really play multiplayer driving cars was an absolute train wreck literally at least a car wreck um in multiplayer a 500 millisecond latency that's so bad uh so they've basically fixed that uh, so multiplayer vehicles are going to be much much better but it kind of uses this weird predictive like algorithm that doesn't cause desyncs in multiplayer you know yada yada great multiplayer stuff just know that driving vehicles will feel better that's that's the big point Undid the only power pull to your oil. Exactly, Sultans. Exactly. Yeah, mystery undoing stuff in Pyanodons was rough times. All right, on to Gleba. Or Gle Gleba? Is it Gleba or Gleba? I feel like when I've heard uh, Trupin, who natively speaks the language that this word is from, he kind of says both, depending on how fast he's saying it. So, a little bit of both. No, it is not, B. Jonas. It is Gleba. Anyway, uh, so uh, Gleba, it's the planet that everybody kind of hated at the land party, which is future knowledge from this point in the FFFs. But at the same time, it is easily the most, um, well, I don't, maybe that's not true. I was about to say it's the most unique of the three. But it kind of is just the Dagobah, like, swampy planet vibes, too. Is that that unique? I don't know. I think the way that it ended up looking feels, to me, the most unique. Like, when I look at the three planets, and I'm ignoring Aquilo for now, but even with Aquilo, actually, I'd say this one feels the most, like, unique to Factorio planet. There are lots of swampy planets and biomes in other games and fantasy worlds and sci-fi worlds. But this one, I don't know what they did, but they did it in a way that feels more fresh. Which is a perfect word to use. Uh, that's pretty on point. Uh, but it, it feels like the way that the Wuba team took the art direction is it kind of a swampy planet in a way that doesn't look like every other swampy planet i've seen like this doesn't look like dagobah right it doesn't look like the classic swampy like the swampy area in in satisfactory this doesn't look like that like it, it looks somehow different and i don't know if it's the bright colors i don't know if it's the fact that things kind of look like coral and underwater stuff even though it's swampy stuff i don't know exactly what it is but it certainly feels to me like the most unique to Factorio look. The Vulcanist stuff, as much as I love the way it looks, looks very much like, yeah, that's ash and rock and lava. That doesn't, right? That That's just kind of like everything looks the same. That's ash and rock and lava. And then you've got uh, Fulgora, which looks cool. I think it might still be my favorite. It just doesn't have a lot of uniqueness to it because it's mostly sandy oil. Like there's there's not a lot to it. The ruins look cool, but nowhere near as diverse as this. This yeah, the hue diversity is certainly certainly a thing. So yeah, Gleba looks cool. They they talk about stomp, stomp, stomp. Um again, the the way they tease the planets, you know, this is just kind of a teaser for the way it looks. They kind of read you through a story. It's pretty neat. You should go read it if you haven't. But uh, what do you actually do on Gleba? So it is a biological planet full of life. So basically, they start you out with an agricultural tower and you can harvest these uh, trees, which have these like bio resources. Uh, do they tell us what they are? Not necessarily some sort of fruits. Yeah, fruit being processed in an assembling machine results in seeds and mash. And uh, basically, the, the, the cranes will replant the trees and then keep harvesting them. So it's a renewable resource, right? It's kind of like this will get you so many plants per 
minute or second on average and you won't need to do anything else other than provide it with this but you will need an area that it can plant within and i'm curious to see how much area do we need to get the max you know rate per second like right here it probably has more than enough area to keep things moving but i'm wondering like when we're actually playing who knows if this is quality or not i don't know it'll be interesting and then there's a bio chamber and you can use this stuff um the the fruits into industrial products like carbon fiber or a mysterious material we call bioflux um, i'm also going to fast forward an fff they've worked on gleba a lot this was the least favorite planet of most people who were in the land party not everybody but most people um and so they've reworked a lot of the recipes we already know one of the reworks from a current fff so some of this stuff is out of date i'm just saying that now but what isn't out of date ironically <laughs> man killing it with the accidental puns today uh what isn't out of date is spoilage spoilage is still very much a feature and essentially yeah to dave's pun they spoiled this yep so spoilage is an entirely new mechanic that to my knowledge is pretty much new to factory games and as much as i love vulcanus and fulgora what they don't do is add an entirely new mechanic to the game uh, to like the fundamental factory game where the time that an item takes to get from point A to point B is relevant to its production process. That has not been a thing with any any other items in Factorio yet. So now with all this bio stuff, you're caring about oh, a blue belt is actually better than a red belt, even if I'm only using two items per second because it'll get there faster, right? And so that is a really neat change. It has the danger of being unfun if it's too punishing and whatnot, but as far as like a new idea for a mechanic, it's really sweet. I'm excited to play with spoilage um, and see how it feels because basically the organic chain all the way to the science packs stuff can be spoiled and if you're mixing together spoiled items i think it takes the more spoiled for the output product and so you're trying to keep everything like similarly spoiled and not spoiled to get the packs least spoiled as possible so that you can then get the packs to wherever they're going probably now this which is far away and hopefully they still have a decent amount left i believe the packs is just a ratio so if it's 75 percent spoiled you'll only get to research 25% of a pack's worth of research with that. So that also means your science ratios are going to be all off because if you're making 100 science a minute, you might need to make 200 science a minute of the Gleba packs because they're going to be 50% spoiled by the time you research with them. I'm also uncertain, like if it's spoiling even while it's in the lab, it's it's just so interesting because you, you almost have to treat it like satisfactory where it's like this continuous loop where like, well... All my other packs can just sit and wait to be researched. But Gleba needs to constantly be flowing packs out. It And even just the idea, it feels biological. It's like breathing, right? Like you have to keep producing the packs and sending them to Nalvis even if you're not using them because they're alive. I don't know. It's really cool. Really cool. And yeah, uh, you guys are talking about... Uh, so Rygard made a GIF and put it on Reddit of like... A little anime character that looks like it's dancing as it goes along the belt and that's because he what you can do is you can make it so that an item spoils into another item and then that item spoils into another one but then eventually the last item spoils into the first one so and it all happens in one tick per spoilage so now you basically have an animated gif because there's a, a spoilage loop of items spoiling into each other so pretty cool pretty cool uh, yeah, Vatamouse, that's what you just said is exactly how he made the GIF, actually. So it is a cycle of spoilage. And, and yeah, mods are going to have a heyday with this mechanic, right? Like, the, just the number of things you can do with this is through the roof. So not only is it a sweet mechanic, but it's going to be a sweet mechanic for modding. And I'm scared of what Pyanodons might do with it because it can be a punishing mechanic, <laughs> but we'll see. Um, you can get rid of spoilage by just uh, recycling loop it. You can also turn a large amount of it back into basic nutrients um, that start half spoiled, but at least it's something. So there you go. There's Gleba, the basics. Um, 
but we'll get to how they've changed that in a sooner Friday Facts. On to 415. That was a slow Friday Facts. Let's see if we can read this one fast. Um, here's just more small technical stuff. They made multi-threading better? No, they're just saying it's hard. Faster construction robot tasks. That's a big one. So when you paste down huge blueprints, it works better. In the end, the check went from O in on 37,000 to O in on 900 and then further to O log in on 900. So no longer will the game lag like crazy when you paste a blueprint and have thousands of construction robots trying to find jobs. So that's great. Um, they fixed some desyncs, you know, nothing. Uh, there was a binary code in these numbers. I can't remember what the number was, but there was something in there. Uh, it's too long for my brain to remember what that was all about. Now we've got another big one. Right after talking about Gleba and a new mechanic, they changed fluids completely. It's a whole new system. And I have mixed thoughts on it. Unlike the fluids, which cannot be mixed, I have mixed thoughts. Um, overall, I think it's a good change. People who have played with it say it's a good change. They like the change mostly. But I miss that fluids actually flow from one pipe to the next. There's actually something that you can identify as flowing and the new system, not so much. The new system, essentially the way it works, because I'm summarizing, we're not going to spend 20 minutes reading every word in here. This was the old system, right? You can actually see the pipes filling up and things kind of flow. There were lots of weirdnesses to it. Don't get me wrong. There were bad things about it, like splitting was weird and the split it uh, like pre if you didn't have enough fluids or if you were trying to maximize, like literally get 100% throughput, the build order of pipes would matter. So there were some weirdnesses. Those weirdnesses mostly only showed up for mega basing though. Um, the main weirdnesses for the average player was just lack of clarity. They didn't know how much fluid they could have flowing through one pipe and it told you nowhere. The, the end result, if you look at the, the chart on the wiki, is that you could get roughly a thousand fluid through a pipe, uh, a little bit more if you put regular pumps, a little bit less if you had a really, really long pipe system. But more or less, you could count on a thousand per second through a pipe, and it flowed, and that was that. The new system, if they'll show it to us, is this the new system? Uh, I can't tell. Oh, they're showing both side by side. The new system is basically the entire network has one level and it fills and empties together. And here they talk about fun over realism and I get that. Um, but the new system is pretty boring in how it works. It's just like, OK, yep, I, I did skip it. You're right. It's up here somewhere. It's this one. Here they'll show, I think. Once the GIF restarts, maybe here we go. No? Yes? Show me. Show me the money. There we go. Yeah, you can see the whole thing just fills up. And then as it empties, the whole thing is emptying together as one segment. So it's way more basic. You just, you your pipe network has X percent and that's it. The more pipes you have in the network, the more it's kind of buffering to get to that percent. But yeah, exactly. It's kind of like your whole network is one big tank. And that's basically it. Um, oh, it's weird. I just looked at my video. I'm basically responding to YouTube before YouTube says the words because it's showing up in YouTube chat before it's showing up in the the bot. That's really weird that there's a delay there. I just noticed that. Anyway, all that to say, I the, I don't like the new system, like the feel of it. As far as the gameplay of it, it's just better, right? Not needing to worry about the flow rates is 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 better. Overall, there is a limit on the flow rates. I don't know if they mentioned that in this FFF, but in the new FFF where they kind of revisit fluids, basically it is a ratio of how full it is 
in terms of input and output. So if you're inputting into an almost full pipe, let's say the pipe is 90% full, you'll only input at 10% speed. And I think that base speed is 6,000 a second. So if your building, which is full of petroleum, can only dump petroleum into a pipe at 600 a second if, um, if it's 90% full, the pipe's network. And if it's 90% full, it will dump out into buildings that need petroleum or a pump that's asking for petroleum or whatever. It'll dump out at a rate of 5,400 a second because that's 90% of 6,000. So, so the input and output are a ratio of the fullness. So it's kind of like the total in plus out is always going to equal 1,000 at any given uh, range. And so pipe networks will kind of find a default equilibrium where the input and output is going to be equal, equal rates. Um, so yeah, all that to say, basically new, new pipe network system, much simpler. Um, there's another FFF on it we'll get to, but yeah, I kind of like it. I kind of don't, I'm excited to play with it. That's for sure. Uh, and 417, 417 was kind of, I don't know why my internet died. What's going on here? Click, go. We killed it. All right. Um, basically, this is a whole review of like the development process. So it's just a peek behind the curtains on like in February 2021, when they announced the plan to do the expansion pack, kind of what happened in the first year, the first playable prototype, uh, fun stuff to read, but not like, you know, anything too crazy we have to talk about here. Here's like bare bones Gleba back when they, uh, we didn't talk about this with the rocket cargo landing pads. Cause I just forgot. There's so many things. There's only one landing pad per planet. So you can't just land things wherever you want them to go. You have one landing pad and everything lands there and that becomes your hub for distributing everything that comes in on space platforms to the rest of the planet, um, which is a really interesting decision. I like parts of it. I personally am on the boat that you should be able to build maybe one or two more with later technologies on each planet rather than just having one forever. Uh, but I do like it overall for sure because it back then they almost worked like logistics chest you could just put each one wherever it was needed and it kind of removed the need for any interesting logistics around space delivery so i like that they reduced it down to one i am curious if two or three at some point could be good i'm sure there'll be mods that add the ability for that for those of us that want it um <laughs> the first playthrough was 370 hours even considering teething problems it was way too repetitive. Um, like Fulgora had 12 plants originally. And I just think that's absurd. Like 12 different resources, bio resources. I mean, that's so many. Yeah, it's just crazy. And now they only have two different types of trees. And then obviously all the intermediates that you produce with very variety of things. But but yeah. I just think it's crazy that they had 12 at first. So they, they undid with a lot of the TDM. They took out a lot of the extra stuff. Um, they're just showing some pictures of cool stuff here. Look at that big interchange with elevated rails looking good. Look at all this coal, coal mining. Just oh, those are all green belts. Oh, I can't wait to play this game. Look at this possible scale at the game at the very end. These bulk inserters, which used to be stack inserters, are being mass transported to another planet as an ingredient to create legendary stack inserters. <laughs> yeah, it, no, Dave, you're right. Pyanodon certainly has that issue, but it's supposed to. I'm thinking for, for vanilla, 12 would be a lot. Or vanilla space age. Unmodded factorial. That interchange copy pasted twice. Well, no, they improved the UPS of pasting blueprints. So we're good to go now. All right. And then 418 here was the Space Age release date, which was such exciting news because it wasn't that long into the future. This was on July 5th. So we're, we're not that far backwards now. On July 5th, we got the wonderful news that it would be October 21st, which is only three and a half months from that day. 
Um, the price is $35. Uh, a point of some contention. Um, even Trupin had an interesting take on the podcast this last weekend saying, you know, he thinks that's too much. He thinks it should be 25 um, or so. It is interesting to have a, a DLC that's the same price as the base game. I, I do agree that that's non-standard. But as I was talking about earlier in this podcast, when you look at everything they've done to the game, they've gone above and beyond what any DLC does. I, I mean, the, the amount of reworking of the base game they've done on top of actually creating new content, far more new content, nonetheless, than most DLCs add. It's absurd. I think I think Space Age is honestly worth more than the base game. I I actually I, I legitimately believe that. Like I think if they charge fifty dollars from a financial standpoint, what you're getting for that fifty dollars is equivalent to or more than what you're getting for the thirty five you spent on vanilla. Now that won't maybe quite be true since a lot of what they're adding is even included in the original $35, but that's them giving the, the base game purchasers stuff for free, which they don't even have to do, right? So that's just them being good guy devs. They could lock all of the new stuff behind the Space Age purchase, and that would still be fair, and it would be fair even if it was more than $35. However, however, I realize that like, it would feel really weird to make a DLC and price it at $50 when the base game's only 35. Especially since it wasn't like the base game used to be 50 and now it's cheaper because it's older, because they don't do sales. It's like it was 30 and then they bumped it up to 35, which can I just say for a minute, I know that I probably shouldn't ramble, but man, people complaining about the price hike to 35 from 30 like, what is your problem? First of all, I completely agree with Alor saying we should be paying more for games right now. I was making the same point in the Discord. Games are cheap today. They're so cheap. Compare, like, if you compare minimum wage or even, like, in the U.S., minimum wage is weird because minimum wage is actually still really low. But, like, there are tons of, like, you can work at, you know, McDonald's and get paid $15 an hour in a lot of places. So, like... In a lot of ways, minimum wage is 15, even though technically it's like seven or whatever. Now, I don't know about other countries. I cannot comment on stuff about other countries. I realize that wage versus video game price might not be as equitable in other countries. I'm not speaking to that. So if if your counterpoint has to do with other countries, like I don't really know. And I'm not really talking about that right now. Um, but at least for like first world countries like, you know, Germany or America, like I know the prices are at least relatively similar. Like I, I know the median wage in Germany is going to be different than the U.S., but it's still like thirty five dollars is not that much in terms of hourly wages uh, or thirty five euros in, in Germany, you know. And, and so like it's just crazy how cheap the game is already at thirty the game's been supported for five years after its development with free updates being added the whole time and people throw a fit that it goes up by five dollars like what are you serious and i understand that some of their point is like games are supposed to get cheaper over time not more expensive but that's really only true if the game is not being developed anymore when the studio is actively updating the game fixing bugs and continuing to develop a dlc it's got a vibrant modding community it doesn't really make sense that the game needs to get cheaper. And when you bring in inflation, the game getting expensive by only five more dollars. Like, I can't believe people threw a fit over that. All that to say, the uh, the the DLC being valued at 35 is more than um, reasonable. And um Basically, I, I just think that like they could have made it into two DLCs and charged thirty five dollars for both. And that still would have been worth it. I don't know how they would have split it up into two because that's obviously not how they designed it. But like if they had over the years instead done one DLC about two years ago and charged thirty five for that. And then they did another DLC now and charged thirty five for that. And in total, it provided us with the experience we're about to have. That would have been worth it too. 
like Space Age is is that good. So it just isn't. It isn't reasonable to hate on the price. I, now, if you just can't afford it, look that there's a total there's a there's a very big conversation over like should you be able to afford it uh, should you pirate it there's all sorts of interesting questions in those in those categories like if you can't afford it like that does suck for you and and maybe there are good reasons you can't afford it and that's that's hard but like it is a luxury item you don't we don't we don't deserve to have everything just because we exist and like things so like if you can't afford it then maybe figuring out how to get the money for it. and again maybe in some countries like it's really hard to get that much money together i don't know but like I just think overall, like this is an extremely cheap price for what you're getting. And so it feels really, I don't know if short sighted is the right word, but it just feels really messed up to complain about this number when that's like, what is two and a half doll, two and a half hours of working at McDonald's in the US. Like, it, again, in some countries that might be really different. And I understand that. I'm not talking to that portion. Um, cause that's more of a regional pricing issue and that gets into a whole can of worms that has nothing to do with even the, the Wuba devs, um, that gets into like regional pricing and should games be different prices in different regions, but then people take advantage of that. And there's all sorts of nonsense there that I don't have any sort of authority to speak to, but at least in the U S you could go to an odd job for, for, you know, neighbor Tim and get paid 35 bucks for it. So like. Come on, don't don't complain. Don't be one of the complainers. This is cheap. And if you think this is expensive, I think you need to do a look at what things cost <laughs> to develop and stuff. This is this is not expensive. Um, they, they've more than earned that thirty five dollar price tag for what they're giving you. You are purchasing something, right? Like those dollars are buying you something and it's the amount of effort they put into this mod and it is cert or mod DLC. And it is certainly um, you know, they've put a lot into that $35, so, but, yeah, there, there are lots of interesting things on money, but I'll probably stop rambling about that now, because I could talk about that for three more hours, and we don't have three more hours, we need to keep going with FFFs. Uh, to the actual point of the FFF, the release date, I was hyped. I thought it was going to be more like uh, December. I was kind of thinking it would be closer to like a Christmas release. So the fact that we're getting it before Halloween, A plus, A plus, love it, love it. Um, yeah. Last, uh, just kind of a couple of last thoughts re regarding y'all's comments on the pricing stuff. Like dollars per hour isn't a great metric. I actually agree. With that. I think dollars per hour is kind of more for people who are really constrained on the dollars. Like, I, I think when I was younger and had both more gaming time, though, as a content creator, I kind of have gaming time now, but it's kind of like work time. It's different. Anyway, like as a kid, when you have more gaming time and less dollars, you actually want games that can give you a lot of play time for that dollar. As I've gotten older, I've transitioned to feeling more like if I spend $40 on a game and it gave me 10 hours of the best gaming experience ever, that's amazing. I don't really care that it was only 10 hours. It was an amazing gaming experience, right? Like Outer Wilds. They could have charged me a hundred bucks for Outer Wilds and it would have been worth the dollar per hour conversion. I may not have purchased it because that would be really expensive, but like the value of my dollar would have been there for a game that was that incredibly unique and good. So, so yeah, like, you know, there are games like Path of Exile or, you know, free to play games that you can play for hundreds of hours your your dollar per hour is great but like that doesn't make it a more valuable game if that makes sense it's really just like finding games that you get the most life energy from like are you not just having game time but are you actually enjoying that game time like is do you feel like your heart is in a better place when you close the game or is it like Dota and you just feel mad cuz your team sucks and everything's the worst like Dota was so bad for me even though it was a free game it was not good for my emotional state and so like games can be good in your time for money but i think finding games that you actually enjoy in a way that make you a happier person it's a good thing to do um yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you don't find a game fun, you stop. 
So all the playing time is good playing time. Yeah, and that takes some self-control, uh, Dave, that I think some people don't some people don't know how to stop playing a game that they're not having fun with and or they don't actually know how to know that they're not having fun. I think people will play a game even when they're not having fun because it's addicting for certain reasons or a variety. I don't know. I'm getting I'm getting way off into the weeds here. I'm sorry, everybody. Uh, let's get back to the FFFs. <laughs> um, anyway, so display panels. This one was a weird one for me. So essentially they were looking at adding signs into the game, which can we just talk about how funny this little wooden sign looks? I think they just took the art from the side of a crate. That's kind of what it looks like. But uh, then they kind of went with like, what about like a plate that like points up? They went with a little computery monitor thing, which I <sighs> now I haven't played with it. So like all of my opinions and I hope you guys know this based on the date that I was recording this or I'm streaming it if you're here live. I hope you realize like I haven't played this game yet, even though I have access to the beta. I haven't really touched it. So I don't know if I like this feature yet or not. To me, they look way too small. They look so small. They're even smaller than the one by one tile that they fit inside of to the point where they feel useless. Um, like I feel like this icon that's the alt mode visibility on the chest is more visible than the display plate itself. Now, it doesn't have an icon on it right now. I like that you can put text I'll, as an aside, like the text is nice. Being able to put text on a display plate, even a lot of text that expands when you mouse over it. I feel like that could be good for multiplayer. But as far as like a display plate that you actually want to see something in, they feel way too small to me. Like in this in this GIF, can you find the display plate? Took me a while. Like it's tiny and it doesn't have any sort of contrast. It doesn't stick out in any way. Um, again, I actually feel like an alt mode item in a chest is more visible than these little computer monitors. So that complaint aside, I think these are of limited use for single player. Um, it's more for like right here, they were showing like displaying a signal like you could use a decider combinator to decide to like show the greatest signal so you can easily get some visual feedback. Like I think they're useful for that sort of thing in single player. Um, I think they're more useful in multiplayer or for people that just like to decorate, like they like to have a little display icon in front of every smelting stack to show what's being smelted. Like that sort of thing is fine. Um, you know, I'm not big on that sort of decorating in Factorio, but like some people are and that I think it's fun that you can do that now. Um, you can let's see. What's this? You can use any signal as a wild card for setting the icon. Um, oh, inserters are better at picking up things. That's kind of a separate topic, but now they they no longer miss on fast stuff. So that's nice. Um, Yeah, exactly. Aylor, having some status panels can be useful. Um, Dues Mint, I think I either said the exact same thing or I saw someone else say the exact same thing in my memory. can't remember if I thought of it or someone else thought of it. But having having a two by two version of it that would auto like merge together into a bigger one would be amazing. Um, shouldn't be collidable. I kind of agree with that, Edmonton. Um, because then it kind of makes it a factory obstacle, which is a downside of it. Show on chart can be useful for displaying. Yes, sorry, I didn't mention this part. Showing it on the map view is also nice. So it kind of get, but what I'm confused about is, isn't that the same as just having a map view icon or a pin? I guess the difference is that it can be dynamic. So you can have a circuit signal that then shows up as a map icon. But like, again, how often is that really what you need? Most of the time your map icons are just keeping track of what's where and you can do that with static icons. I don't know. Um, I'm sure there are lots of use cases for them that I'm not thinking of. My main complaint is not that they exist. I like that they exist. I like what they can do. I just think they're way too small visibility wise. And I think this GIF just really I literally was like, where is it? I'm playing Where's Waldo here. I can't find this stupid thing. Um, 
the fact that it fits in visually is actually a problem in my in my mind like it shouldn't blend in it blends in too well you want it to be visible not to just blend in with the the kind of gritty like you know the look of combinators but it should almost just be something that almost that whole one by one tile should be the screen i think the screen should be about twice as big and the icon displayed on it should be about twice as big and maybe even have some sort of highlighting like around the edge of the icon so that it like kind of pops out a little bit like you know like these oh i think i'm actually spotting maybe some of what i'm noticing so so there's no you know there's like a black shadow on the alt mode icon it feels like there's not quite the same thing on the tv screen so it's almost like a lower contrast on the tv screen than the actual alt mode icons are interesting yeah through yeah i again they'll be they'll be useful there are lots of useful places i'm not thinking of um i'm more just complaining about how small they are than saying that like i do actually think they should exist i'm glad they exist i hope there are mods that make them a bit more visible all right now for an exciting one 420 let's blaze it with some fusion reactors um yeah look at that bad boy so Nuclear is good, but you know what's better than nuclear? Or well, you know what's better than nuclear fission? Nuclear fusion. So I do like that they gave a new power option. Um, Fulgora has more ice from asteroids and less solar energy. Later, when you head to the fourth new planet, nuclear becomes a much better option because the solar is so low and ice is more abundant. At that point, you've had nuclear as an option for all five planets. So it's time to unlock a new and exciting energy system. So one thing that's cool about the fusion reactors is the the neighbor bonus is in two different places on each side and so as long as you're connecting these little pipe doohickeys and that's just the graphics of how they connect um basically you can do neighbor bonuses like this you know where you're offset so it's a really cool a really cool system to unlock more than just having a neighbor bonus of three. And I also think, um, I don't know, what was I about to say? More than a neighbor bonus of three. Yeah, because reactors are just in that in that grid. I think it's just cool because it makes you not make a grid. A grid is not the most efficient shape. So you end up making stuff like this. And I just think that's really cool because now that a grid isn't the most efficient shape, you're having to connect these things. And these you can't connect pipes with the plasma so you have to saw exactly vatamouse it's like a puzzle because these have to all be connected to each other with no pipes in between so you're having to puzzle together the little turbines such that they all fit properly but you can also get the out the coolant out the warm coolant which you then go recycle through an assembler or whatever to cool it back off and then you've got your cool coolant to pump back into the uh refineries which feed coolant to each other uh i guess what's not clear is is there pass through for yeah it seems like there's pass through on the coolant and on the few on the fusion -y, uh whatever plasma so pretty sweet um i'm excited yeah lockless it's like that would be how nuclear could work if the corners would actually, well, I guess they're too. No, wait. Because the nuclear plants have the connections on the corners. Um, yeah, Dave, I don't think they've spoiled the cooler. I actually don't even remember what all was in the Aquilo one. It, it's probably Aquilo because I think fusion reactors on Aquilo. I think they even say that when you head to the fourth new planet. So they basically say it unlocks on Aquilo right here. They just hadn't had the name of Aquilo yet. All right, I'm going to take another quick break. I uh, got to use the restroom, get some more ice water here. You guys should stretch yourself, and I will be back in a minute. Okay, so we did 420. So now we're moving on to 421. Optimizations 2.0. So Roboport optimization, 
is what they're talking about here. Typical factory with lots of robo ports. Um, the time spent on robo ports in our recent playtesting save file spent dropped from an average of one milliseconds to 0 0.025 milliseconds. So basically sleeping robo ports that aren't doing anything. Um, radar logic is upgraded so it will reveal things better. So when you have a lot of radars, it works a lot more efficiently. And robo ports, because radars are so efficient now, Roboports have a built-in radar of two chunks. Oh, thank God. So now Roboports by themselves will reveal your base. When basically if you have a Robo network, you have a revealed network and you don't have to have radars as part of every single blueprint you ever build. Basically now you'll just want radars around the edges of your base, you know, to explore things, but you don't need radars in your base because now you have Roboports. So that's super nice. Um, Lamps can be always on. Certainly there's a quality of life mod that this kills. I, I Again, it's just not one that I was using, so I don't really know. Um, but yeah, so being able to just tick the box, they're on. That just keeps them nice and bright. That's great. Belt reading and multi-threading control behaviors. Um... Yeah, okay, the problem with the belt reader is that it's so easy to use. During our playtesting, it was used quite a lot. Not only on space platforms, which was the intended use case, but also in other places. Um, I could say that Harusa was the primary saboteur of our playtesting. He was responsible for some of the belt reader usages that could be solved without them. <laughs> I, I like the subtle, like, passive-aggressive, like, you, you could have solved this without them kind of thing. Um, that's probably what I'll do, to be honest. There are also active provider chest placed on Fulgora that turned it into a logistics robot hell with more than 10,000 logistics bots being in the air at all times. He makes it sound like that's a lot. That doesn't feel like that much. Maybe I'm thinking modded, but I feel like 10k is not that many. I cannot punish him for playing the game, so it was time to optimize. I think that's one of my favorite sentences in all, uh, all of the FFFs in the entire 60 that we're dealing with. I think this is one of my favorite sentences. <laughs> I cannot punish him for playing the game. Uh, so optimizing the code for logistics bots was for someone else. Belt reader and control behaviors are for me to handle. Anyway, um, optimized belt reading. Failed attempt at multi-threading the electric network. This one was interesting. They ended up like trying some things that actually ended up making it worse, sadly. Even though like certain things were more optimal, the final thing was worse. Um, smarter update of worker robots. So this is back to Frusa's problem. Uh, I don't remember exactly what it does. Basically it only updates robots once every 20 ticks. What I was curious about when I was reading this is how does it work? if the robot's so fast, it like runs, if it would make a complete trip in only like two ticks, you know, maybe you have some like 10 billion kilometer per second modded robot or some sort of instant transport janky hack robot or whatever that would normally do things in two ticks. Is this gonna mess with that or is this not gonna mess? With it? I, I couldn't totally tell. I guess it says maximum 20 ticks of movement without update. So the minimum would still be one tick, I presume, if it finds something important to do within that tick, maybe? I don't know. Regardless, overall performance gain is usually around 10 to 25%. So just more improvements that they're doing, as always. Um, nothing else too crazy in this FFF. We're getting there. We're almost on page one now. All right, Tesla turrets. Why did I, we don't start at the bottom. I don't know why I scrolled to the bottom. So this one is a cool one. I, as far as the new buildings, is this my favorite? This might be my favorite. Um, just in terms of the visuals and the way it looks and sounds. 
It does sound a little wimpy. It feels it. I wish it sounded a little more punchy. I like the the like uh, almost like static kind of sound and the higher pitch sound. But it also feels a little, I don't know, it needs a little more bass to it to convey the damage it's doing. Uh, but anyway, Tesla turrets are dope. They have chain lightning, chain lightning that does 100% damage on the chains. So it just massacres biters. And it can also fork a new chain and that has an even higher chance to happen with legendary Tesla turrets. So pretty sweet. And the range is also very high. Uh, like the base range is 30, which is a full six more than a laser turret uh, on top of, you know, continuing to increase with quality. Um, it must be made on Fulgora. So this is one of those buildings that you can't just make anywhere, but you can ship it those other places. Uh, you also unlock a handheld Tesla gun, which requires ammo, but otherwise functions in a similar way. Um, Oh, another thing that they do is when the lightning hits enemies and doesn't kill them, it kind of pushes them back a tiny bit and like slows them. So it's a little bit like a crowd control stun. Not not actually a stun, but it like slows down the group that's chasing you, as you can see here. So that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah. And then they go through some art, the design of it. I do think it looks looks a little bit too much like a beacon to me. Even the new version feels a little bit too much like a beacon, but I still think it looks really sweet. And then this is a long segment about how they did the little lightning beams. And it just, I mean, again, like it just goes to show how much freaking work they put into this DLC. They have poured their heart and souls into this game. You know, something, Something as simple as a Tesla coil, Tesla turret. And I say simple just in the sense that like about a million mods have added some sort of lightning turret. And the amount of work that those mods had to do versus the amount of work they did on actually making it in the base. It's like they didn't just mod in a, a lightning turret beam. Like they made freaking custom crazy, you know, graphics that they had to perfect just just for this visual that most people won't even appreciate. I mean, I think people will appreciate it without realizing they are appreciating it, right? But that's but that's the kind of dev studio that Wuba is, is they're putting the time and effort into these uh, diminishing returns of like, yeah, you could just ship it with a basic lightning -y graphic. But when you do all this extra stuff, everybody appreciates it a little bit more some people not even noticing such, but it makes their experience just a little bit better. And all of those little things start to add up until you get what is the goat, right? What is basically a perfect game. Uh, what's up, a shot? And it is not a perfect game. I, I shouldn't say that. No game is perfect. And <laughs> heck, even playing through my death world, there were a lot of things I like remembered or rediscovered about Factorio that are less than perfect. But I mean, come on, it's an amazing game. And it, I don't think anyone could read through these FFFs and think that like, this isn't one of the greatest games of our current time. Now, there are a lot of people that don't like it just because it's not their genre, right? Like a factory genre is not for everybody. Probably in the gaming community, it's in a smaller, you know, I don't know what percentage of gamers have factory games in their games they like to play category, but it's probably not most you know and that's fine but for those of us that that have it in their genre this is probably one of the best yeah lockless that is the problem with some of this awesome graphics stuff that they've done for space age is i'm guessing some of it's not exposed to modding i don't know what is and isn't though i'm guessing some of it is all right we're on the last page the final stretch uh we've only got what 10 more 11 more <sighs> getting there folks four hours and eight minutes in we got this all right research info tooltip and online players GUI this is a pretty short one basically the tooltip shows uh like if you hover it it shows you science production over the last 10 minutes science per minute a time estimate that they have um 
nothing nothing too crazy about that it's just a great feature um and then the pin and alert cameras oh there was a qol that did this uh i wouldn't know what it was called i don't think i had that one so the pin and alert cameras is interesting basically you can pin an area and then it stays over here and then you can like hover it to get a little camera to that area and you can configure the zoom which is super cool there's probably a quality of life mod that did something like this but even then it wouldn't have been able to do the same thing because these are like new features so uh, and then for people who play multiplayer you can just see who's online and you can go see their location and see a little camera of them super useful for multiplayer uh not something i will need for my playthrough but Oh yeah, Ultra Cube had a cube cam. So yeah, it's kind of kind of like that. Um All right, so Gleba Pentapod enemies. So we'll watch we'll watch this. Pause the music. Whoa, why is this so much louder than the other ones? Yeah, you got the little little floppy tentacle starfish. And you got the big things that throw them at you, but they have wings. They look more like wasps to me when they're flying, but then they turn into those little freaky starfish, so that feels a little weird to me. But yeah, that uh those things are nuts. And then the big boy comes in. The Stomper. They definitely need an arachnophobia mode. Yeah, maybe. I don't think they're anywhere near as bad as Satisfactories, and not being in first person helps a lot too, I think. Oh, that one, I didn't realize until just now, that one spit out more enemies when it died too. Yeah, the music did sound a little weird in that one, I agree. Um, but yeah, so the enemies on Gleba are all Pinta related, they're all five-legged creatures of doom, and the pollution is different. It's now, uh, what do they call it? I already forgot the name. It's spores and pollen. Basically, they get hungry. They want your food. As Catherine of Sky said, they want your snacks. Uh, you have good smelling cookies and they want to come eat them. And so basically, they will only attack your buildings that produce bio stuff. So they'll ignore the rest of your factory. You can smelt all day and they won't give a crap. But as soon as you start making things that smell good, they want it. So you're only going to have to protect certain parts of your factory, which is interesting. Um, yeah, I don't know. So yeah, they've got Wrigglers, which we already saw. They're little, kind of like small biters, but they fly at you when they're thrown by the Strafers or Striders. I kind of want to call these Striders more than Strafers. They're called Strafers because they strafe. They, they talk about the mechanic here. Basically, they will stay at their max range and kind of go around sideways. And that's true of turrets too. So I think that's pretty cool. And then the Stompers are just massive health and do a lot of damage with their short range spit attack and stomping prey with their feet. So that's, that's the Stomper. And then when they're killed, the young wrigglers it protects are released as new opponents. And they can both walk over walls and cliffs. So walls are kind of pointless. I guess walls will keep the wrigglers out, but that's about it. So there's not much of a point to walls, which I think is kind of cool. Because again, it's like even with that little change, they've now created a context where you don't need a wall in your entire base just because it's what you do in Factorio. So on on Fulgora, or Fulgora, uh, what's this planet called? Gleba, you won't need a wall in your entire base. Even if you want to defend the whole perimeter with turrets, you won't need walls, because they don't really do much. Um, 
I, they do a tiny bit against regulars, but even the, I don't really know, it, it certainly won't be worth it. So yeah, I think it's pretty cool. And they go over, you know, the design of them and the art and stuff. Pretty cool. Uh, they do have three tiers, you know, small, medium, big. So they've got green, gold, and red tint to them as they grow. So there you go, 424. Yeah, B. Jonas, I do think we'll be able to finish all 60. We're getting there. What's been helpful has been a few of them have been basically things I don't really need to talk about because they're just not they're not that interesting to talk about. They're kind of self-explanatory. And if people want to dive deep on it, they can go read the whole FFF. But a lot of the like more technical stuff we've just been able to skim over, which has been nice. You know, rather than reading exactly how they optimize things, I've been able to say, oh, they optimized it. <laughs> yeah, Aloy, I was thinking about surrounding turrets with walls, but even then I was curious if the strafers can chuck uh, a little wriggler like into like if you had a turret, let's just say a gun turret and you put the walls around the two by two gun turret. Can they throw a strafer at the gun turret and the strafers then inside the walls with the gun turret or will it like pop outside the walls? I think that might change kind of whether that is helpful or not. So with pentapods, they had to make the Spidertron walking logic better because it uses the same logic. So rather than I mean, basically, they made it search in a spiral and it has to conduct a lot of collision checks. So instead, it does a smarter search. So it kind of does some sort of. <clears throat> uh, what do you call it? Like, basically, it's only searching the possible places that it would need to search to see if a tile is land or not. And then once it does that, it finds a place. Um, so there's only about 70 collision checks. It also has a search exclusion zone, so it won't try to search a spot that it just searched for a different leg so the legs talk to each other it's like it has a brain um beautiful yeah breadth first search and yeah and then there's also leg groups which modders can use um but like this guy will move one leg at a time in order but like the spider trons now move four legs you know four 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 kind of like an ant walks with two at a time this will walk with four at a time. Um, and it also had to do some logic for different things to be able to walk over different gaps of like water or walls. You have to exclude walls from that search. So pretty cool stuff. Um, pollution works differently on Gleba. Some machines that produce high pollution emits no pollution on Gleba. And things that produce high pollution on Gleba should emit no pollution on Novus. So they prioritize those buildings as long as they are not provoked. If you provoke them, they kill whatever they want to kill. Um, this video is actually wrong. Uh, I can't remember if it's in the next FFF. This was the old one. This is the new one. And it has a bit of a jitter that they fixed. And they either show that in the next FFF or it was in the Reddit post. I can't remember. But the new the new walking animation is decidedly more spidery than the old one, which is a little creepy. Um, and then this is now an entire wall of text on how Arendell made the video that we just watched. That's why I wanted to play out the whole thing is because <laughs> Arendell had to pour his heart and soul into making the video like making those little those little videos is not easy because getting the same things to happen every time was actually really difficult. Apparently I myself am like, man, would it have just been faster to just try doing a few takes in a row rather than scripting the whole thing? Uh, but I, I don't know. It's interesting to watch. OK, does this one have the leg fix in it? No, it doesn't. It might have been in the Reddit post. I won't go looking for it. All right, 426, resource search. Ooh, here's where we can kill a mod. Kill a mod, kill a mod. So this, I I will count this as Yarm. Again, this is a soft kill because Yarm still has some functionality, but for most people, this is going to do what they need it to do. Um, basically monitoring their resource patches with amounts 
and knowing where they are and being able to see them on a pen. So now you can search for resources on the map. This is also going to be game changing for like Pyanodons. When you have 40 different ores, some of them are almost the same color. Some of them are kind of hard to see contrast wise on the map, depending on what type of terrain they're on. So being able to just search for the resource you want is a plus. I love that. And then when you pin them, you can then kind of hover over it and see that patch. Um, resource map label marker is also killed. I agree. I think it soft kills Yarm too, though. But yeah, I forgot about that one. Oh, it's so cool. So when you resource search, it just like highlights them and makes them so easy to find. It's beautiful. Oh, and this is a huge change change. Um, some people really don't like this. Some people really do like it. And there's everything in between. So leave your comments. Uh, so now a crafting machine will tell you its rates. Um, input and output per second. That's after all the math of productivity and speed are uh, accounted for and beacons. So I I like it. I'll just, just the, the baseline is I like it. Um, I do. When we when we had Galdock on the podcast last, he had some some things he didn't. I think it was Galdock. I hope I'm not remembering the wrong person. Um, he he didn't love it, um, and I understood his complaints. I think at the end of the day, I like that they at least give you the basic numbers. Because some people make the argument of, well, you're going to have to do math anyway. Because the complaint, or, the, I mean, let's read what they say. They say they preferred to leave more for players to calculate. Personally, I quite like the process of looking at a recipe, doing a bit of analysis to work out how I want to build things, what types of belts and modules... But in Space Age, it becomes a mess accounting for machine quality affecting speed, module quality affecting speed in prod, built-in prod of specialized machines, technologies that change prod, beacons have modules of differing qualities, and beacon count and quality affecting the transmission power. Now, at the end of the day, I think they actually made that sound more complicated than it is because you can still mouse over the building and it will show you the prod number and the crafting speed. And all you have to do is multiply those two. Right. Well, multiply one plus the productivity times the crafting speed, and that gets you the overall output speed. But then you have to multiply that by the amount you get in the output. And then you have to divide that by how many crafting seconds the recipe takes. And so, like, it really is a lot. And the fact that they're doing all of that for you now is nice. The downsides. I think one of the ones Galdoc listed that I'm in full agreement with is it will now reinforce the idea of how players should play, which is proper ratios, right? So now that these numbers are so blatantly in your face, like it's telling me it makes three circuits per second. So now even in vanilla with no rate calculator mods, I now know my three assemblers are making nine circuits per second. And then when I build my things that use circuits, I now know I'm using 15 circuits per second without really doing much work. And all of a sudden, now I see I don't have enough circuits. Without this being in the game, I wouldn't have noticed that before. And I might not have cared before, but now I'm intrinsically caused to care more about that because of it telling me the numbers without me really asking for it or going and calculating it. However, <coughs> excuse me, however, this is also a godsend because you don't need to do that math every single time for every single building and the math does get really complicated and a lot of people do at least want to have a ballpark ratio that's at least close, right? If I'm making 50 here and using 48 there, fine. But if I'm making 50 here and I'm using 150 over here, that is kind of a problem and most people don't really want that in their base. So I like it because of that. And I think it's doing a lot of multiplication and division all in one step. And from there, you still have to add up all the buildings. There's no rate calc where you can drag it. So still certainly I, this doesn't even count as a soft kill because 
I mean, it's doing one of the steps of math for you, but it's not doing anything more than that. Um, but this saves you having to to ballpark calculations and then ballpark adding all those together. It it will help a lot. So I agree. It's a godsend. I do think there are some downsides for newer players. I actually think this is more of a of a downside for newer players. More experienced players are going to use it however they would have used something like rate calc before, or they're just going to have some mental arithmetic that they now no longer have to do. But newer players, I think it actually changes their focus potentially to some places that are unhelpful. I, the One reason that I actually think that that's true, doubly so, is because of how freaking much satisfactory players are obsessed with perfect ratios. It's like a disease. Now, <laughs> I'm, I'm being facetious. It's not a disease. If you like perfect ratios, there's nothing wrong with you. But the community as a whole is obsessed with perfect ratios. And it's just like, who cares? Your base works fine even without perfect ratios. But that message doesn't seem to get through, especially to newer players. So, so there is something about showing these numbers that causes players to care more about them that may or may not be good for the player. Um, so there's a lot of interesting conversations to have there. It's what they went with. I like it. I think there are, could be some downsides, um, but at the end of the day, I still think it's very much worth it. But uh, anyway, so what else? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I like this one a lot, too. So they changed it so that when you highlight. Uh, what am I trying to say? Basically, the old this was the old version. So the old version is that when you hover the output, it shows you the recipe. But now they added a new like line at the top here that is the recipe. Now, when you hover the output, it just shows you the item. And if you want to see the Factoriopedia entry for the recipe, you can alt click the recipe. If you want to see the Factoriopedia entry for the item, you can hover the item. I really like this change because the recipe and the item are not the same thing. And sometimes the, the recipe has byproducts. And now that we can alt click things, what would we have alt clicked to get the item or the recipe if it did the other way? So I really think them splitting this into having like a title to the recipe almost. This is just like the title bar. I think that's a great idea. I think for mods, it's a great idea. So all in all, I think it's great. Not to mention, this is mostly wasted space anyway. In most cases, an assembler has lots of empty, like the GUI has a lot of empty space here. So adding a title bar doesn't really feel like a problem. It's not like it's sending helpful information off the bottom of the screen that we have to scroll to see or something. So I really like that change. Um, all right, so we did 426. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, only six left. Whoo. All right. Combat balancing. This one's actually a pretty big deal for people that play with biters and pretty ignorable for people that don't. Um, <laughs> so as with every major update, there's a few tweaks and balancing changes they've made, new enemies and changes to existing enemies. They took a look at the current balancing. So first big change they made is now spawners get beefier just in terms of health. I mean, they don't like make more biters or anything uh or get more armor oh, do they get more armor uh they don't say that they get more armor basically they just they go to 10 times the health at 100 percent evolution and it's not a linear change but basically as evolution goes up spawner health goes up which means you can't just steamroll through nests uh once you know you're a little bit later in the game now, with all the high quality stuff and all the new, um, what's it called? All the new weapons that you get, you probably still will be able to steamroll. Uh, there's a little bit of dissension in the community about this one from what I've seen. Some people don't like it because you want to feel like a god. There's something in, like, I talked about this on the podcast. Enemy scaling is one of the worst things that ever happened to RPGs. All the old RPGs didn't have it. All the old RPGs, a skeleton is a skeleton. Math is math, right? It's it's level 10. It does 50 damage when it hits you and it has 100 health and that's all there is to it. And every skeleton in the game is like that. 
I, I'm simplifying, but you get the idea of what I'm saying. Whereas now it's like, ooh, there's a skeleton, but I'm level 12, so it's level 12. And therefore its damage is scaled to the level 12 damage that a regular enemy does. And it just makes everything feel the same. Well, when I get to level 20, the skeleton is still level 20. I don't feel any better because I'm not just smashing a skeleton like a freaking god that I want to feel like. It's still just a skeleton that takes me four hits to kill. I want to kill it in one hit, damn it, because I'm better. And, and so games really need, like level scaling has its purposes, but they need to be very careful. And most games are not careful with their level scaling and it feels terrible to play. So back to this. This is level scaling, right? This is a form of level scaling. And is that going to be problematic? I think in this case, it's fine um, because of the one reason is that. Well, two thoughts, I think it's fine because it's kind of echoing what biters are already doing, right? The biters are scaling as pollution go as evolution goes up. So it makes sense that the spawners would scale, too. Personally, I wish that rather than just magically scaling their health up, I wish they actually did what biters did and leveled up so that when you get to a certain amount of pollution, it would slowly start changing the spawners. They would like merge into big spawners like we have big biters, you know, and, and then it would feel more like the same type of thing. And it would have the same effect on the end game where nests are a little harder to kill, but you can still kill them. Anyway, um, yeah, Aylor, that's another interesting topic is like scaling enemies as long as they're not scaling with your level. Like, what are they scaling with? That's also a different conversation. Um, but all that to say, I think at the end of the day, this is helpful because it, with legendary armor and legendary weapons like Spawners would just be a joke. They just melt instantly before anything. And the behemoth things, it feels weird for a behemoth biter that just came from a spawner to have like a million times more health than the spawner itself. So that's a thing too. Um, now, Waskily, that's a good point. They haven't gotten to capturing yet, but we now know you can capture biter spawners later in the game. And it could be so that you don't accidentally murderize them in two seconds or two milliseconds even with your automatic lasers. So that's all an interesting topic. Um, I don't have a ton more to say about it. I think I like the change overall, but it certainly has a hint of that like, eh, I don't know if I love that it scales over time. But uh, here are some of the other changes. Spawners removed explosion resistance, worms increased health and laser resistance. That's important. Artillery damage has been doubled. Oh, love it. Uh, love that artillery is better. Distractors doubled the health, increased the lifetime. Love it. Damage and range up for destroyers. This one's big. Personal lasers, one third of the damage now. You need three lasers to do what one laser did before. But remember, you're going to have quality armor. Even if it's just uncommon, you're going to be able to get uncommon power armor pretty easily. And you're going to be able to get uncommon personal lasers, which will also do more damage and have more range, I think. I'm not, I guess we don't know for sure if you get more range on personal weapons, but both of those things alone is already going to make your lasers go that much further. So I, I think this change was mostly due to quality for armor and lasers, just scaling way too fast multiplicatively with each other. So I think they needed, I think they needed to nerf that. Um, damage and range better on cannon shells. So tanks, Kind of get a little bit of a buff there. Shotgun shells, huge buff, 60% more damage. And with the way bullet armor works, that's way more than 60% more damage, right? So like now shotguns are, are a much bigger deal. Um, there's no mention of flamethrowers, Vatamouse. They are going to remain OP in the same ways, uh, unfortunately. Rockets accelerating two times faster is also huge. Rockets were really slow time to target, like w between when you shoot it and when it actually blows up was quite large. So doubling that time or having that time is quite big. Um, there are players who don't play with modules, which means no quality. It will be harder for them. Yeah, but that's true about everything, right? Like there are players who don't do the military science researches to give their bullets damage and it will be harder for them. I mean, 
it's really hard to say should the game be balanced around players who play without quality or players with quality and i think the answer is kind of obvious like most people are going to play with quality on the game should be balanced around that. Um, it's hard though, because quality affects things at such a fundamental level that you almost can't have the same balance, right? Cause you're right. If players play without quality at all forever as like a decision point, then the end game combat is actually probably going to be harder. Now, you know, you've got your bots buffed, but like your personal lasers are certainly worse. And now spawners have more health and you're not doing anything extra. So. Yeah, for people who are choosing to play without quality, it certainly is a is a harder experience, but like I don't think many people are going to play without quality and those that do. I, I don't know, maybe maybe you can make a mod to rebalance these things. This is easy to mod back the way it was. Um, when an explosive rocket shot at target from safe distance, killing the target, chasing the player down. Yeah, yeah, that the rockets are going to be much better now. <laughs> Biter fast rocket week. Yeah, rockets are better now that they go twice as fast for sure. Uh, and then one other thing they added in this FFF is the stone poops. I'm summarizing, but basically when you blow up rocks, they would leave behind these little stones, which was what you'd get if you would mine it. But when you were blowing them up with artillery, they would end up sitting around the map and then eventually could accidentally end up on belts and that could corrupt entire uh, bases. So they did away with when you destroy a rock, doesn't drop anything. When you deconstruct a rock, it still gives you the rocks as normal. So I like that change. That's a good change. Um, I just like these little little bits. Sometimes they make me laugh. Did the little stone poops make the game fun? Is rock droppings a core part of the game design? Does removing them betray the vision of what we want the game to become? These are the questions that keep me up at night. It's good. And then the announcement that they had of the land party. So this was the first that the land party was made public. Um, or, or was, no, sorry. Did they announce it in this one? No, no, they didn't. Okay. Yeah. That was the first time they made it public. So the land party was really sweet. I, I wish I'd been able to go. I, I was invited, but I just didn't go because going to Prague for a week was a lot of money that I didn't have for travel. Um, <laughs> And there was a part of me, I, I, I probably would have gone if I had had, you know, if finances hadn't been a factor at all, I probably would have gone. But there was a part of me that was like, I kind of want to stay unspoiled. I kind of don't want to play the game before I get to play the game. And so as much as I probably would have gone if I had had the funding for it, I, I, I was a little bit thankful that I was able to remain unspoiled. So I will have a fresh perspective on Monday here in a couple days because I haven't played the game at all. But it looked sweet. I, I would have had a lot of fun getting to meet the devs and meet all the other content creators and modders and everybody. So that was a sweet thing. Um, yeah, we're almost there. Reactor and logistics circuit control. So this one, we mentioned it in an earlier one, but now you can connect a reactor to the circuit system. Galdock and I had a long conversation about this as well. Um, game design wise this is a very interesting change because a lot of people previously i don't know if gatekeeping is the right word but this was kind of a gatekeeping thing where it's like oh like if you want to automate your nuclear you just need to do an sr latch and i mean technically you could do it without an sr latch in a slightly simpler way where you would just have a lot of steam um storage and if the steam storage was low you would insert um uh, fuel cells and that's all you would do but then that would insert too many fuel cells so you would have to make it so that you had enough steam storage for like five fuel cells worth of burn which is way more so like to do an effective solution you did need an sr latch and galdock and i both felt like that's not a fair ask of the average player sr latches are not simple for the average player for you who are watching a video about factorio you are probably not the average player the mere fact that you are participating with content makes you uh, 
I don't want to say above average because that makes you sound better, but like you're more you're you're more um not uh, it's been five hours. I can't use words anymore. You're more you're more um there's a word that I'm looking for. You guys can help me. Power user. Yeah, kind of a power user. Uh it's not the word I'm looking for though. Entrenched, invested, yeah, it's more like that, more that sort of, more that. Uh, you're more, you're certainly more a more invested player. But all that to say, um, a lot of people who are going to engage with factorial content are going to be the first ones to say, usually, that an SR latch isn't that bad to do. But the truth is, most people who play factorial have no idea how to do one. They're probably not interested in learning how to do one. And all that to say it was an unfair ask for nuclear. So, but here they kind of address that. And I just wanted to kind of set the tone with that. So they say here, in some ways it feels a little bit too easy. The previous solution of people reading the amount of steam in storage tanks felt like it needed a bit more brain power and engineering and therefore was interesting, but it's hard to justify missing capabilities with this reasoning. I think that right there is very important. And I think game design wise, that's very important. The reasoning of it needed more brain power and engineering does not mean, therefore, you should have missing features in your game. And I think in this case, and they also mention here, reading the heat and contents also proves to be useful in the final planet. So I think it was a combination of the two. I think if the final planet hadn't needed uh, you to think a little bit more about nuclear fuel consumption, they might not have done this change. But I personally think that, like, it's just give the players the features, right? It's not going to make them dumber. And use emergent gameplay to come up with the actual challenges. Don't use missing features to come up with your challenges for you, right? Your players shouldn't feel like they're fighting against the missing features. They should feel like they're fighting against the hardness of a game. That's what makes it fun. So, yeah, exactly, Vatamouse. That's why a priority merger, I don't think, would make satisfactory a significantly different or easier game even, and maybe it could add some new challenges that are slightly different that priority merger would make easy, but I don't think that's a good reason to lack a priority merger. It's like, well, that just makes the game too easy. It's like, well, then make it actually hard, not fake hard. A missing feature isn't real difficulty. It's artificial difficulty. It's only difficult because you're not giving the player a tool to deal with it. So... And like, the, obviously there's a spectrum, right? Because then it's like, well, what if you got a tool that just magically puts every item exactly where it has to go with you doing zero work? Like that could be a tool and you're not giving the player that tool. So like, obviously this is a spectrum and, uh, you know, everybody's going to land in a different spot on that spectrum. But I think when it comes to nuclear, this is a good change. Um Also, peps, that is what a lot of people did. That's what I did. I would often just feed my fuel into the reactor and let it run 100% of the time. And I would just build fewer reactors to try to keep it closer to, you know, using all of that power. Um, and that's a perfectly valid way to do it too. But wasting fuel feels kind of bad sometimes, even if it is kind of cheap uranium wise, it's kind of a feel bad to waste fuel when you feel like there would be a way to not waste the fuel. So anyway, uh, RoboPorts. So RoboPorts, you can now do more stuff. You can read the robot statistics and send that to a network. So you could, I think this is uh, primarily useful in my head to be like, hey, we need more robots on, you know, Fulgora. So like put that in the request to the space platform because that's going to be a big deal. And then also being able to see what on Fulgora is being requested in requester chests. So you can actually now read the number of robo ports. Sorry, you could read bots before. That's not new. Now you can read robo ports and now you can read um, all the missing items, basically. So like if we need 400 fish, and only four are here, we can see that we're lacking 396 fish. And then I could send that request to, you know, uh, the space platform and whatnot. You can also enable and disable logistics chests. This is a big one. This is going to save a lot of buffering problems 
Previously, the easiest way to do priority with um, logistics chests was just to disable the inserter until you had enough in the system, and that way you could prioritize one over another. But that would mean all of your requester chests still had to be filled with varying priority until the inserter priority would start taking effect. But now you don't even have to fill the requester chest. It can stay disabled until you have enough of X, Y, or Z in your network. So basically I could say, hey, request 10,000, 10,000, that's a lot. Request 1,000 green circuits, but only turn on if I have 2,000 or more green circuits in my robo network. So that's kind of a, a different a different way to do priority and it will result in less buffering and less buffering is generally a good thing. Um, so yeah, land party result over 900 feedback reports. Um, sounds like a lot of things went well. Troopin shared some on the podcast last week, by the way, I've mentioned the podcast a few times. If you guys are interested and you don't know about it, I do a podcast called the factory must grow Technically about factory games, it's ended up being mostly Factorio related just uh, due to FFFs and the people I've had as guests, but that's over on Podcast Places and on my second channel, um, which is called Crydax Extra, you can watch the VODs of the podcast as well if you're interested. Uh, the ability to request including buffer chests. What? Sorry, where is that? I don't know much about buffer chests, so that's probably good for me to, to read. Yeah, I didn't cover satisfactory very much, it's true. I'm I'm low-key, uh, you guys are hearing me process it a little bit, but I'm low-key wondering if I need to switch it to a actual factorial podcast rather than just being a general factory must grow. Uh, I'm not sure yet, I'm thinking through those types of things. Yeah, the requester chest, you that's already in the game. Are you talking about this request from buffer chests? Because that's already in the game and it prioritizes above other items. Yeah, according to the Michael Hendricks video, which I watched today. I didn't know that was true, but it's already true. This button is already in the game and it already prioritizes above other logistics chests. But that's only one layer of priority, to be fair. That's not the ability to set priority based on items in the network. So that is still different. Um, but anywho. All right, moving on. We're getting there. Only four more Vulcanist Demolisher enemies. All right, we got to watch this whole video. Beautiful. I just love how it doesn't even slow down when it goes through all those buildings. It's so cool. They are more like millipede. They do look very millipede-y rather than, than worm-y. Um, but uh, it's, it's the enemy. It's the enemy on Vulcanus, and they are hard to kill. Um, so loud. What they do... I don't know, why is this one not attacking? Oh, there it goes. Um, they create these little explosions. They said this was a work in progress graphic. Um, so that'll slow you down. And since it slows you down, it kind of keeps the race more fair. Even if you have a lot of, uh, what are they called? Uh, exoskeletons. And I think that's good because then it's, otherwise they'd have to make the worms either like too fast or too slow to catch you and either way then it's either I die or I can make it out safely so they kind of cap your speed and they restrict it to a lower range so like exoskeletons still help but they don't let you just just run away in half a second um, 
And the main idea of the enemy is that I love this prototype. It looks so funny to me. Uh, the main idea is that it just it has a crap ton of health and it has a crap ton of regeneration, so much regeneration that it's actually the hard thing to do is not to deal the damage equal to its health, but it's to deal the DPS greater than its regen. And obviously, then you still have to deal quite a bit of damage to kill it past that. But it has a lot of regen. And so you have to either have a ton of turrets at once. You have to have a ton of, you know, mines and rockets at once, usually using some combination of resources. Here they kind of talk about, you know, the different design choices they had as they made it and all sorts of stuff. And then the other interesting thing is the territories. So again, you don't need to wall your entire base off because the demolishers are territorial. They keep to their spaces. If you go in their spaces, they get mad and they might follow you. But like you don't have to worry about demolishers that are in these zones until you decide, hey, I want that tungsten over there. And then you go over there and you have to fight that worm. But then you have that whole area. So I think it's a really cool mechanic. Um, it's kind of like biters with expansion off and kind of like peaceful mode, you know, where it's like they're still there. And I like I've done that where I turn them on peaceful, but I turn them up like the size and frequency. So they're kind of everywhere and I have to kill a lot of them to expand to a new area. But like they're not going to come looking for me. So I actually think it's a cool design um again different than the other planets so pretty neat the whole creature spawns directly on the map if you kill one the territory is yours permanently there's no pollution there's no evolution they are um yeah <laughs> at least 60 percent of players survived their first encounter just by panicking and immediately running away <laughs> uh that was at the land party uh, combat clarity. The biggest problem is the combat stats themselves, not with the combat stats, but the transparency to the player. At the moment, if you alt click a segment, then Factoriopedia shows you the body resistances, but then to see the head resistances, you need to click on the head. Ideally, all body parts link to the same page. So yeah, there are like body parts to the worm as well as the head. We need to clarify the segments take damage individually, but all damage is transferred to the creature as a whole. So... I don't even know, then what's the point of segments taking damage individually? What does that even mean? Because it's all just dealt to the creature. So it doesn't really matter if your damage is spread out or all in one spot, right? That's how I'm taking that. Anyway, there are small adjustments that they'll make to that. But... Well, yeah, but fire, if it's dealing damage to multiple... <clears throat> parts of the body those should all add up to the total so how's that different than just all damage being dealt to one pool it's like they're taking damage individually and they're being transferred to the creature i guess i'm not understanding the why do they need to take damage individually then can individual parts of the worm die if so we didn't see that happen Oh, you're saying a big AOE, like a nuke, could deal damage to five segments, which then would basically be dealing 5x the damage to the worm? Ah, now I understand. That makes sense. Yes, yes, yes. All right, so moving on from that, which is an exciting one. I think that's, for most people, the most exciting enemy, um, <clears throat> which is cool. So back in June... When they revealed the Fluids 2.0, they were doing an in-office LAN party, and the new system was a little bit too easy. So the problem is our novice base had ridiculously huge pipelines that just went across the entire base. And so they decided we can't just have one pipeline for the entire base. That's too good. So they changed it so that now pipes are constrained to a 250 by 250 tile area. And basically what this means is if you exceed that limit, boom, your pipes break. Now um, the pipeline is basically broken. The whole the whole thing is broken until you remove that new pipe. So the, the essence of why I like this change, I mean, they kind of talk about their reasoning and stuff, but I think the reason it's a good change is now pipes are connected to other pipe networks, and the only way you can do that is with a pump, 
right? And so now it's directional. We can't just have three sections and they all get, you know, light oil equally. I'll have three sections and I have to decide is section A pumping into B or is B pumping into A? Or are they both potentially pumping into each other but with some circuit conditions on some tanks? And I think that's actually really cool because then you now have a need again for doing regular pumps and regular thinking about your pipe network directions. That was one thing the new fluid system got rid of that I didn't love. And now we're kind of getting it back a little bit. And so I do think that's cool. I also agree 256 would make more sense. So it matches up with chunks. A lot of people have already recommended that it might actually be changed already. I don't know. And another mod bites the dust or at least again, close enough to bites the dust. Yeah, you could loop it easily, but depending on the rates, you might end up not getting any. I don't know. Uh, where's my button? So pipe visualizer is no longer needed, as you can see. Um, you can toggle to see pipelines on the map, and now you've got this visualization going on in the game. So basically, pipe visualizer's vanilla now, or well unmodded so sweet i love it you can see it on the map too i think being able to see it from the map view is even a better i mean they're both good but being able to see it from the map view is super nice and it helps you debug more easily like where the break is so fluid must flow is rip too uh which one was fluid must flow um well yeah how do we determine is it killed or is it is it unnecessary because fluid must flow was the one that added ducts and huge flow rate pipes to the game but it's not like the mod was killed by quality of life features it's that the whole system works differently now so the mod is not needed Oh uh, yeah, okay, we'll count that as we'll count that as killed. We'll count it. Rack it up. Alright, balance tweaks. Uh they nerfed pumps to twelve hundred a second, which sounds really low, but in most cases you'll still only need one anyway. The biggest difference is that it'll take more than 0.7 seconds to load a wagon. Uh so that's kind of nice actually. I like that change. Um Hey, thanks for the follow, Tantric. Uh, they changed water to steam. That's a big deal. Now water makes 10 steam per water. So that's a pretty big deal. So now you only need one tenth of the water input to supply, you know, your boilers and your your nuclear. What are they called? Heat exchangers. Couldn't remember the name of them. Um, and here they talk about the algorithm tweak, which I already kind of mentioned about the like 6,000. So there is the limit of 6,000 per second. And that limit is multiplied with the fullness ratio of the source and the sink. So basically the output rate used to be unlimited, but now it's inversely proportional to the fullness ratio. And the input rate is applied to every fluid flow operation with the exception of fluid wagons. So basically now you get a total of 6,000 to play with. So if you have 2,000 in at any given point, you could have up to 4,000 out at any given point because then you would end up being 33% full. Or sorry, you'd be 66% full in that case. Um, so it's a little weird because it's kind of looking at like, what's my max in at any given point and my max out at any given point, And those need to total less than 6,000. Then you should be good to go which sounds like a lot, but with new quality and modules and beacons and whatnot, we might get there easier than you think. We'll find out. Uh, yeah, two more. And these are both exciting ones. So buckle up. So we talked about Gleba being a problem for a while, right? And players complained about it. So this was their first kind of response to some Gleba changes. So. Here they talked about, there's always been a fundamental problem with a biological oriented planet. Other things you produce in the game tend not to be organic. So it doesn't fit quite as easily because it doesn't just fit into like the tech tree to help you make circuits or metals. It's like, well, wait, what is, what is 
Glaba helping you make, you know? And so that was difficult. During the LAN party, these problems were only confirmed. Plus, we've realized many more issues. And seeing people interact with Glaba put a lot more urgency on finding solutions, a.k.a. Hearing all of the streamers say it was their least favorite planet <laughs> uh, probably was a little bit of a wake-up call of like, oh god, we got to do something. And I commend them for actually doing something this late in the development cycle because that is a little bit risky. These things are not going to be balanced as well as some of the changes that happened a year ago, right? So there is a good chance, and this is maybe something I'll talk about in another couple minutes once we're done with the 60th FFF, but there's a good chance the balance at launch of Space Age will be slightly compromised by some of the risks that they've taken like this. However, the longevity of the game is greatly increased because these are the types of changes you can't make once the game's out. Not without a lot of fuss and a lot of hassle and a lot of mad people because you broke their base. Like these are not changes you can make lightly once the game's out, but they're changes you can make quite easily now. And yeah, the balance timing might not have enough time to get the balance perfect but like those are changes you can much more easily make after launch and so i'm really happy they're not going with the like ah we're scared of our players not thinking it's perfect instead they're saying you know what we're gonna do what we can to make it perfect of course but like we're still gonna make some of these changes now so that we have the kind of the meat of the foundation perfect and then maybe if the balance isn't perfect we can tweak a couple of those things afterwards and heck They've done a great job, you know, before. They've never released a DLC before either, though. So, like, the balance might be a little bit off. I don't know. We'll see. Maybe it won't be. I don't know. All that to say, here they're showing the metals crafting tree was kind of separated from the bio tree. And what they've done to change that is we now collect stromatolites, which are like these rock bacteria. And they kind of work as the the bio stuff but we also get a small chance for copper and iron ore and so then we can essentially be doing uh killing two birds with one stone like when we collect these stromatolites we're getting the nutrients we want but we're also getting copper and iron so now we don't have to go separately mine copper and iron um also dr katz i missed your comment saying that you liked the steam change i agree i think it's more realistic and it makes a lot of sense and some mods had already done it too. The 10, uh, one water makes 10 steam just because, you know, water expands a lot into steam. Just makes sense. Uh, anyway. So, yeah, basically this copper and iron thing is a big help. And then also they wanted to make the rewards better for like, if I go to Glaba first, what am I getting for it? What What's the, what's the actual reason I would do that? And... Currently, people have been like, well, you get some stuff, but it's mostly going to be Fulgora or Vulcanus first. Why go to Glaba first? And now they give you the Biter Captivity thingy, or whatever this is called. Um, Bioflux, what is this called? Capture Robot. That's the word I'm looking for. So the capture, you basically load a rocket launcher or your rocket doodad with a capture ammo and you can now capture a biter nest and then you feed it bioflux and we get biter eggs <gasps> it's a story of love couldn't have written it better um and these biter eggs have spoilage so they are little biter friends if you let them spoil um they won't act very friendly though so if you let them spoil uh you are gonna need some turrets so very interesting and also if you stop feeding this thing bioflux i think it goes rogue too yeah, returns back to its natural form, spawning hostile biters again. So it, it's it's a really cool mechanic. And the biter eggs, what's the point? Well, they can be used immediately for improvements to agriculture, crafting prod three. Or because we felt like the Gleba unlocks weren't motivating en us enough. A new laboratory, the bio lab. So the bio lab is a research lab. Uh, it's bigger, as you can tell, that's a five by five. And it is, where does it say? I guess it doesn't say here, but it, where is it? Oh yeah, and it only consumes half the amount of science packs. So it's basically like 100% productivity, but even better than 100% productivity because it will multiply with productivity. It uses half as much. And then if you have 50% productivity on top of that, you'll end up with three times the overall amount of science. 
Um, so yeah, pretty sweet. And it also has four slots for modules, so you can get up to 100%. Um, you're interested if the wonky labs have to be placed on the binder nest. I don't think they do, but yeah, actually, I don't know that. Maybe they do. It does say can only be used on Navis as the organism inside would die on other planets, but it also might... Oh, here. Combined with some other items, the egg can be grown and hatched into a mutated laboratory. So I think you can do that wherever you want. Yeah, Peps, I mentioned the same thing uh, when I was talking about this uh, on the Discord. I was like, oh, this is so cool because now we can kind of, even if we just want to test our defenses, or maybe you like the look of your, of your um, Tesla turrets and you want to see them fire more often, so you just let some biter eggs spoil on a regular schedule right outside your base so you have a steady stream of Tesla targets. Like, that's completely fine. So pretty cool with that. Um, I'm excited about the idea that we can kind of make our own biters now. That's very cool. So yeah, they talk a little bit more about the design and stuff behind that, but <sighs> here they mention the, the embargo ending on the 14th of October. Ah, oh, it's two days from now. All right, let's do it. The last FFF, then we'll have some final thoughts, final Factorio Friday fact thoughts, and then we'll be done with the stream for today. Oh, Disco Science. Um, I don't think Disco Science is dead, though. It wasn't quite the full party that, that Car Carmel Danson is. Renai Transportation is going to be great. So, yeah. Um, you know, if you want to keep the last planet unspoiled, now would be the time to leave. Um, and I will have some final thoughts, but I've said most of my thoughts at this point. So you're pretty safe to leave if you don't want any spoilers on the final planet. Um, I will say I've already looked through these. They're not crazy as far as spoilers go, so I don't... If you're on the fence, I'd say just look at it because it's all just kind of similar to the other planets. And I think there are still things they've left unspoiled. So, that being said, um, it is an icy planet, which I think most people already knew. But not just an icy planet, but an ocean-covered iceberg covered planet and the only way you can get things running is if you heat them very cool so there you can see the heaters firing up Yes, yeah, very cool. Yeah, Aylor, that's a good way to put it. I mean, they're all big spoilers, but like, yeah, it's stuff that you'll see within minutes of getting there. So it's not like a... It's exciting, but it's not exciting. I don't, yeah, I, I don't feel like there's a, a good word to it. All right, so it is a liquid planet. It does not have any land. There are icebergs, but building space is restricted. So all your buildings will freeze over. And if they freeze, they won't work. I presume that, I mean, they show frozen pipes. I'm not, I assume liquids won't move in a frozen pipe. I don't actually know how that works. Um, but yeah, so they, they have heating towers and you can burn fuel in them and use heat pipes. You can obviously use nuclear reactors to produce heat for your heat pipes. And the entities have to be up to 30 degrees Celsius to thaw. And so that's kind of the minimum temperature you need to get to. Heat sources are only able to warm adjacent things that touch them and that's limiting. So you use heat pipes to move the heat around and those work diagonally. And every entity that needs heat consumes heat, which is just another way of saying as it runs, it's cooling off. So you have to keep heating it because I feel like that phrasing is weird because in my head, entities that are running are producing heat. Um, but it's basically just saying like, well, yeah, but it's continuing to cool off in the environment. So you need to keep adding heat. The heat that it, the building makes is not enough to actually heat the building. 
Um, heat pipes and heated buildings would melt the ice. So protect to protect the ice, you can place concrete or refined concrete as an insulator. And heat pipes cannot go underground, as we already know. So yeah, it'll be interesting to to see how this all feels. Basically, heat pipes are going to be everywhere. It's complete spaghetti. Um, yeah, belts may not need heat pipes. Um, I mean, I'm not looking super close, but I mean, heat pipes are kind of going everywhere. So I feel like this planet is going to be spaghetti, spaghetti mess. Total spaghetti mess. Um, which I'm kind of excited about and kind of dreading. So, yeah. Because with needing to, to have heat pipes going everywhere, you're just going to have to spaghetti all over the place. It's going to take... I also like that it's going to take all the builds you thought you understood and you're not going to be able to use them. You're going to have to, you know, like figure out a new build that incorporates heat pipes. Yeah, practice speedrun three hours, new bond pack overhaul 300 hours. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. Um, <laughs> oh, Peps, is that your complaint? If it's only a few meters thick, where does the rocket silo go? Well, you know, it just, uh, yeah, I don't know. That's a good point. Ooh, legendary heat pipes. Okay, so anyway, what are the resources? Solar, only at 1% effectivity, very far away from the sun. The ammoniacal solution from the ocean, crude oil from resource nodes, lithium comes from resource nodes, and fluorine gas. So lithium and fluorine are the new resources. Um... And you need the cryogenic plant, which makes stuff like coolant and the cryogenic science pack. Um, among other things, they mention fusion power cells, quantum processors, and some other late game items. So that's the, the Aqualo building. This was spoiled in the original... Um, uh, oh, you're right. The ammonia solution is also a new resource. Uh, this was spoiled in the original Christmas. Let me find it. This one. That's what this is right here. We finally learned what this building was. We learned about the foundry and the electromagnetic plant so early, and it took until yesterday to finally learn what this thing was. Uh, so that was exciting. We've been waiting for that one for a while. Okay, so anyway, back to uh, what we're doing here. So yeah, cryogenics plants are dope. You, you need to heat your buildings, but you also need coolant. Yeah, it is interesting. It is interesting. Uh, and then this is the other very exciting spoiler, is the railgun turret. So we finally get just something to absolutely demolish the biters and demolishers maybe <sighs> sounds so cool i love it i love it uh, but it's pepsi's complaint but yeah this is uh you, oh, the other important note is you can build them diagonally, which is not most buildings, right? But their firing range or firing cone is less than 90 degrees. So that way they have to let you build them diagonally. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to get full coverage. So this is full coverage on a space platform. What do you need the turret for? I'll let you speculate, they say. It is a railgun. Why does it have cartridges ejected to the side? Um, I mean, as far as railguns go, the cartridge could just be the casing holding the thing. It most railguns can be built in different ways. Why does it go out the side? It could go any direction. I would just wear out whatever the ejection direction is, is feels a bit irrelevant to me. Um, yeah, there's no propellant, but there still can be a, like a wadding or a casing or even just like in this. Uh, what I don't know what you call that the the magazine feed thing that's holding the the bullets the hunks of metal even that it could be yeeting off that piece to the side 
there's there's lots of ways you could explain it away if you want to get all explain away -y about it and it looks cool is the obvious answer that b jonas is correct about um i think it's it's one of those things that if you'd like to come up with an explanation you can so you don't you don't have to be mad about it <laughs> but i do i do agree that sometimes these things make a little bit less sense than they could and that can be funny but all that to say um i i like the idea of the aquilo power being harder uh back to the aquilo challenge itself because they talk about like it's quite easy to accidentally underpower your base which leads to a lack of heat and then half your base freezes and then like you're into that kind of like the brown the power brownouts you experience as a new player it's kind of like experiencing that again as an experienced player i i really like that between the heat pipes and the power being tougher they kind of made aquilo feel like it it makes you feel like a kid again you know like it, it takes an experienced factorial player and makes them feel like kind of like a new player again and so i think that's pretty fun um as far as the brain bug, it has been confirmed as canceled. That was in one of the FFFs. I, I've skipped over most of the actual words in these FFFs, but they mentioned at some point that little brain thing that they had teased is no longer in the game. Um, so we do know that for sure. But, but yeah, we did it. All 60 FFFs covered. Whew, that was a lot. Five hours and 15 minutes. Okay, at least it was less than... Ugh, six minutes per FFF. Um, super fun. This was really fun to do. It it went by fast. It went by really fast. So many cool things to talk about. Oh, yeah. And a handheld rare gun was mentioned, too. Good point. I'm excited about that. Um, but yeah, basically just absolutely incredible work by Wuba. Like I was talking about it when I was talking about the pricing they could have done half as much as they've done and charged $35 for it. And it would have been worth it. And it would have been reasonable. Like the amount of, I feel like they've gone above and beyond what you expect from a DLC or expansion. I feel like is maybe even a more appropriate word. Um, DLC these days tends to be a little bit smaller, but you know, people expansion and DLC is fairly interchangeable in broader culture these days so i'm not gonna get all it's one or the other but i think in my head expansion makes me feel like the games of old you know back when you'd buy starcraft brood war right that was an expansion but if you compare what brood war adds to like what this is adding it's ridiculous you know this is like a whole new game added into the game we already have on top of adding a whole nother game after the game we already have it's nuts. It's not just adding one more quest or one more class or one more. Even just adding one more planet would be double the planets. Now, of course, you'd have to add a lot of content to that second planet to really call it doubling. But it's just crazy. I love it. We've gotten so much. I feel like the amount of gameplay we're getting is ridiculous. I, I think the number of things that players are going to get stuck on is increased tenfold right we already see tons of players getting stuck not being able to make it to the end of factorio but i think more players will launch a rocket than ever before because now they have incentive previously launching a rocket was victory and there wasn't really an incentive to that victory right like it was like well you can launch a rocket but then you've launched a rocket so what right and it's it's kind of like anticlimactic i think factorio felt a bit like an anticlimactic victory and so people would get stuck on oil or they would get stuck on you know the complexity of like the oil cracking when you're going for like yellow science or something and i think people won't get stuck as often now because they'll be like yeah but i want to like build a space platform i want to go to to vulcanus and see the lava planet so i think what we're going to see now is a big push where players are going to push themselves to to like work harder at the game which is really cool you know it's kind of that dark souls vibe where like yeah the game is hard but it's worth it it's worth pushing through the hardness to to have the fun and so i think i think people are going to really enjoy the challenges that space age offers and i think we're 
you know, it's it's a perfect time for us as the more um, in in franchised. That's the word I was trying to think of earlier. We people who consume content are the more enfranchised players. And I think it's a good time for us to put on our helpful hats and and make sure we're not judging or gatekeeping people for what they are or aren't capable of in Factorio. And it's going to be a good time in the Factorio community to be as helpful as possible because there are going to be a lot of people that are like, I want to go to Vulcanist, but I can't even, you know, launch a rocket. And so it's like there's going to be a lot of... Uh, a big range of players, I think. And so it's a good time for us to be as helpful as we can to those who are newer to the game. There's going to be a lot of people who have never played Factorio that are going to buy the game and Space Age together, and they're going to dive straight in, and they're not going to read the tips and tricks. That's the first tip we should all give to people is read the tips, because the game itself has a lot of great tips and tricks um, in Space Age. Uh, that's one thing I do know by looking around on the beta Discord, and I, I don't feel like I'm <laughs> breaking NDA by saying the game has tips and tricks. It already has them, but it's just they're a lot better. So so definitely uh, recommending people do that. But also, Glim, you're welcome for the rundown. It's been a lot of fun uh, running through these FFFs. The the one week delay for mortal people. Yeah, I yeah, I won't necessarily ramble for a while. I have some thoughts on the, the one week thing. I, I think it I think there are pros and cons to it for sure. Um, obviously as a content creator, like I'm, I'm certainly not against it. Um, but I also, I think there are some cons, which is like, you're giving some people access to the game and not other people. And that can be a little tricky for other people. It's good. Cause it builds up hype for other people. It's good. Cause then they get to watch their creators play their favorite creators play, but then they get to play themselves. And those two things aren't conflicting on the same day. So that's nice for some people. So like it is one of those situations where kind of no matter what happens, somebody's going to lose. And that's always, you know, a thing. So I don't know. It's hard to uh, it's hard to argue one way or the other. Oh, B. Jonas, you're, you're making me write it down. OK, well, I'll count it as redeemed and I'm going to write it down on a sheet of paper right here. We'll, we'll get you. You'll be the first one in the Space Age base. B Jonas. All right. You're on a sheet of paper in front of my face. That should last it there till Monday. Um, <laughs> it's a valid enough media strategy. You're fine with it for single player, but wouldn't be for. Yeah. If it was a multiplayer game, obviously it would feel very different because um, then you're just actually getting a competitive advantage. Whereas this is a single player game. There's no competition to it. Um, if you're not the people who play Biter Wars or whatever, which is a whole thing that I don't even understand about, but that's that's a different topic. <sighs> but yeah, so the plan Monday, Monday um, around eight or nine a.m. U.S. Eastern, which is noon to one p.m. UTC. That's when I'll start my stream. We'll be playing Space Age as a fresh start um, and speedrunners. You're right. I guess people who have access to the yeah speed running is hard enough that i think that benefit kind of good like everyone will be on equal footing in a week uh, so whoever gets the speed runs in the first few weeks for sure the advantage goes to people that had access but after that the the advantage becomes smaller and smaller over time and speed running is far more about like i feel like the speed run strategies have so much improvement to be made that the advantage that the people have who have been playing more now is lessened. Not to mention the people who have been playing have the game changing underneath their feet. So like there, they might have had a speed run thought that is already changing, especially if like 2.1, uh, I do want to mention someone had talked about 2.1, 2.2, 2.3. .2 I do think there's a lot of longevity that Wuba will have to this. I think they're not done with Space Age. My 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 guess, and this is just a guess, I don't know for sure, but my guess is that there are some things that they wanted to get done that couldn't get done in time. And so we'll be seeing actual additions to Space Age rather than just tiny tweaks. So I do think we'll see some bigger changes in 2.1 and then we'll maybe see some more tweaks in 2.2 and then maybe finally like kind of like a putting the cap on the game 
like we we did it we're done things from now on will just be tiny bug fixes and tiny qol i think we might see a 2.3 um who knows maybe they'll just keep going maybe they'll take the route of like we want to keep adding things but i think given what we've seen from wuba they'll probably just add the things they really wanted to add to make it perfect and then kind of like seal it off um rather than like this games as a service thing that just keeps going but who knows i don't know we'll see we'll see so anyway yeah i'll i'll stream on monday hope to see you guys there and uh, yeah other than that thanks for hanging out this has been a fun stream thanks for all your comments um it's certainly made the processing of these things a lot easier if i if i was reading these without the comments i think i would have gone insane um <laughs> so thank you guys for participating uh mods will not work except for the mods that are made by the people who already have access because they've already been able to make their mods work with 2.0 so there will be a smattering of mods that will work on day one probably but none of the mods you have now will work if that makes sense um but some of the mods will be able to update for the 2.0 version a lore second dlc or second game I think they're going to be done with Factorio after this. I think this is I think this is like the goat game Space Age, and I don't think it's going to get another DLC. And at least with where my brain's at now, I'm going to say I don't think it should. But that's very vague thought. Um, yeah, thanks, Tantric. See you on Monday. Yeah, they could totally add more planets, but should they, right? That's the real question. Should they? Um, I don't know. It's hard to imagine with how much they put into Space Age, them having a whole nother set of plans that would count as a DLC. I could see a micro, yeah, like mini micro DLC. Like we just, we had a little bit more content we wanted to add. We couldn't quite fit it into Space Age it really is just a smaller content edition. It's only going to be 10 bucks, that sort of thing. I could see that happening. I don't see another full expansion to match Space Age happening ever. I see the game being complete before that. <laughs> yeah, we always say the factory must grow. Maybe the game must grow too. Exactly. All right, now we did get that list going pretty long. What does come after Z? It's double A. There you go. Now you know those who were asking earlier. <laughs> we only killed 25 quality of life mods with the ones we could think of. I'm sure there were more that we didn't think of. Rockets per hour. Lock less. I think it's going to go to rockets per minute. We're going to have we're going to have quite a few rockets per minute in bases moving forward. Yeah, definitely missed many, Waskily. And there's a lot that are kind of like half killed, half not killed. Um, there's a lot more of those, too, that I certainly missed. You're leaning towards wanting a new game from them with their institutional knowledge after 12 years on Factorio. Glim, I think I'm with you. I think I think there's there's other games in the sphere that these devs work with, though. At the same time, they've been working on Factorio for so long. How will they do anything else? That's such an interesting like thing as a dev if you've been working on a game for like 10 years and then it's finally time to move on i can't imagine how that feels crazy stuff all right i'm gonna head out uh yeah vadamouse there's a lot of stuff we still don't know about space age which is exciting um yep mods will die many mods will die because they don't get updated i think we have such a vibrant modding community we'll be good to go and yeah, for those of you who aren't going to be watching the Space Age content, I totally understand you. I have no hard feelings. I will see you when you resurface from your Space Age Factorio hole. Um, I hope hope to see you then. And yeah, I'll be I'll be seeing you all here in a couple days. You're welcome, Vatamouse. See you later, Charleston. See you, Waskily. See you, Lockless. See you, Aylor.